Good evening. I am Trudice Riggs, the chair of the school board of the city of Virginia Beach, Virginia, and I hereby call this meeting to order at 6.02 p.m. on this ninth day of May, 2023. Thank you to all of those who have joined us in person and online. Madam Clerk, will you please announce those school board members in attendance? Thank you, Madam Chair. Present in the Holland Road Annex School Board Room is Chair Riggs, Vice Chair Weems, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Ms. Brown, Mr. Cowan, Mr. Culpepper, Ms. Franklin, Ms. Manning, Ms. Martin, Ms. Melnick, and Ms. Owens. Thank you. Please join me in observing a moment of silence. Please stand as you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance. This evening, the school board has the pleasure of recognizing division students and staff for their achievements. It's actually one of our very favorite things that we do every month. Because of a conflict, the Virginia DECA State Leadership Conference winner from Kempsville High School will be recognized at a later date. But we have many other achievements to share this evening, so please enjoy. Ms. Martin. So our first recognition this evening is for the first place winner in a national art contest. Please welcome Mafi Chupas. <laughs> Mafi won first place in the National Nangajo Art Contest sponsored by the American Association of Teachers of Japanese. She is an eighth grade student of Japanese teacher Kamiko Gale at Brandon Middle School. Mafi's New Year's card won first place in the artistic category. Nangajo is an important part of Japanese New Year's festivities. Mafi's card featured the Zodiac Year's animal, which is the tw in 2023 is a rabbit. Her artwork was chosen from 119 entries from middle schoolers from across the United States. Congratulations, we're so proud of you. Our next recognitions are for the winners of the 2023 Virginia School Board Association Tidewater Regional Art Contest. Please welcome Mara Dillenberg, Kayla Spruill, and Grace Miller. The Virginia School Board Association Regional Art Contest was started in 1989 to promote the artistic talents of Virginia's public school students. For each of the nine VSBA regions, a winner is chosen for the elementary, middle, and high schools. The winning art is framed and displayed in the offices of the VSBA in Charlottesville. Mara is a fourth grader at Woodstock Elementary School. Her art teacher said, Mara is an exceptional artist whose passion and skill has grown tremendously this year, along with her attention to detail and out-of-the-box creative way of tackling projects. Your woodwork, your woodchuck family is very proud of you, Mara. Kayla is a sixth grader who is part of the gifted visual arts program at Virginia Beach Middle School. Her art teacher said, Kayla is such a creative artist always going above and beyond her art assignments and isn't afraid to take artistic risks. She is fearless as she experiments with different medias and is such a positive role model in the art room. We are all lucky to be able to teach her art. Grace is a junior at Kellum High School. Her art teacher said, Grace is not only intelligent, but has a true talent beyond her years. I have seen her grow as an amazing artist and young lady the past three years. She challenges and pushes herself to the extreme and always comes out successful. Congratulations, students. We are proud of you.
Our next recognitions this evening are first place winners in the Virginia Pro Start Invitational Competition. Please welcome Hayden Bryce, Christopher Hodge, and Morgan Sutton. <laughs> Student culinary teams from Kempsville High School won first and second place in the management competition at the 2023 Virginia Pro Start Invitational Competition last month at Old Dominion University. The Pro Start program connects food service professionals with high school students to help them learn culinary skills and restaurant management principles. In the management competition, team members developed a proposal for the next hot restaurant concept and presented it to a panel of industry judges. Thanks to the students' teachers, Ms. Jennifer Riley Edwards, for preparing these students to achieve this great success. And congratulations to the first place winners, Hayden, Christopher, and Morgan. We are very proud of you. Our next recognition is for a student who earned the title Outstanding Performer at the 2023 VHSL Theater Festival. Please welcome Maggie Southall Bartz. <laughs> Maggie is a junior on the Salem High School one act play team that won the Class 5 championship in March. As you may remember for our last school board recognitions, the team performed a musical called Unmuted that pokes fun at what we had to do to survive the 2020-21 school year. Maggie earned an Outstanding Performer Award due in part to her incredible solo number, Love by Autocorrect. In it, she sings the text messages sent from the boyfriend of a classmate's sister. Maggie's character delivery was passionate and sincere. Even though the texts were nearly incoherent as a result of the misguided autocorrect on the iPad being used for Zoom class, Maggie worked tirelessly to bring her performance level to excellence, and the judges recognized her for her hard work and skill. Congratulations, Maggie. We are proud of you. Next, we'd like to recognize the 2022-23 VBCPS Outstanding Gifted Teachers of the Year. Please welcome Laura Purvis and Terry Darnell. <laughs> These recipients of the Virginia Gifted Teacher of the Year Award show outstanding qualities in the areas of teaching, curriculum development, and adaptation. They demonstrate a strong commitment to gifted education through professional experiences and organizations. Laura Purvis has spent nine of her 10 years in education working with gifted students and advocating for gifted education. Her principal at Plaza Middle School shared Ms. that Mrs. Purvis's collaborative planning with colleagues is supported by her strong knowledge of the learner and gifted pedagogy. Maximum use of instructional time, brisk pacing, a mutual respect between teachers and students, and a laser-like focus on the outcomes of student success. Terry Darnell has spent 25 of her 29 years in education working with gifted students and advocating for gifted education. Mrs. Darnell is a leader at Thoroughgood Elementary School and in the school division. Her principal says, Mrs. Darnell holds herself to high standards and does the same for all she impacts. Her expertise and love for learning are contagious as she celebrates, promotes the gifted learner, and, de and develops the capacity of so many teachers. Congratulations, Mrs. Purvis and Mrs. Darnell. We're proud of you. Next, we'd like to recognize Great Neck and Salem Middle Schools as National AVID Demonstration Schools. Will representatives of these schools please come forward? Great Neck and Salem Middle Schools have once again received distinction as AVID National Demonstration Schools. This elite designation has been awarded to only 200 of 8,000 AVID schools in the United States and around the world. AVID National Demonstration Schools exhibit a college and career readiness culture through rigor and high expectations for all students throughout the school. AVID, which stands for Advancement Via Individual Determination, is a college and career readiness system designed to close the opportunity gap for all students by providing access, equity, and support. 
as national demonstration sites, Salem and Great Neck Middle School, host administrators and teachers from other school divisions around the country, serving as centers of teaching and learning to model systems for AVID implementation. Congratulations to all the students and staff, in including these school's principals, Mr. Tom Quinn and Dr. Tamika Singleton Johnson. We're proud of you all. Excuse me. Next, we'd like to recognize first place winners in the VHSL State Debate Competition. Please welcome Princess Anne High School students, Jessica Wu and Nate Campion. <laughs> Public forum debate is a competitive form of debate that centers on current events and relies on both logic and evidence to construct arguments. They research and prepare for both pro and con arguments on a specific topic. This year's topic was the United States federal government should ban the collection of personal data through biometric recognition te technology. Jessica and Nate are both juniors at the IB program at Princess Anne High School. On top of their academic successes, they are SCA officers, debate captains, are in the National Honor Society, and both play the cello. Jessica is a published author who has her own cake business. Nate studied medical microbiology at the University of Lynchburg at Summer Residential Governor's School last summer. He was also a project manager of the Small Satellite Space Coast Scholars Summer Program with NASA. Their debate coach, Devin Curtis, says they are highly intelligent students, but also respectful, down to earth, and fun kids. They placed second last year and worked very hard this year to win while working with the other debate captain and leaders to build a strong debate team. Congratulations, Jessica and Nate. We are all proud of you. Next, we'd like to recognize the Virginia High School League Division V State Debate Champions. Please welcome the debate team of First Colonial High School. <clears throat> The first Colonial debate team traveled to JMU in April to complete, excuse me, to compete in the VHSL state tournament. 17 students competed over two days in more than 32 matches to come away with 12 students taking individual placements and the team as a whole winning the Division V VHSL state championships. Students placed in the Lincoln Douglas category, the Congress division, the public forum category, and the public policy category. Now, I will say as an aside, there are a number of these names that I recognize, and I can't understand why that's so, but <laughs> I'll keep reading. Team members are Rachel Yurko, Ari Serja, Alexander Elstrad, Emily Labar, Jacob Cruz, Savannah Newell, Adriana Grimes, Andrew Hargrove, Geneva Weirin, Nikolai Perry, Renee Winbush, Ali Faison, Coulter Hatfield, Hope Panuski, Jada Collins, Madison Taylor Austria, Madison Velasco, and Samaya Smith. Congratulations also to Coach Rachel Yurko for this amazing achievement. We are very proud of you. Okay. And finally, we'd like to recognize the NJROTC Area 5 Drill Athletic and Academic Champions Please welcome the cadets from Green Run High School. <laughs> Green Run's Navy Junior Reserve Officers Training Corp participated in the Area 5 Drill, Athletic, Unit Personal Personnel Inspection, and Academic Championship Competition in Norfolk. Area 5 includes Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, and the District of Columbia. Green Run's cadets took 
first place in team curl-ups, team push-ups, armed and unarmed basic drill, unarmed exhibition, and unit personnel inspection. They also placed first in team academics and placed second in armed exhibition drill and in the 16 by 100 relay. The cadets took first place overall in drill and athletics and they took first place overall for the 10th year in a row. Mm -hmm. The team members are Evan Abad, Tatiana Anderson, Tucker Aspress, Leonce Banton, Sherwin Buquid, uh, Colin Campbell, Chrissy Council, Bryce Danaher, Lean May Danden, Alexander Ernest, Emma Farnsworth, Jaden Gerber, Giovanni Griffiths, uh, Tasnim Hyder, Caleb Holland, Ellis Johnson, Harvey Labania, Ahmad McDaniels, Braden Messick, Jasmine Peebles, Carl Pulgar, Julia, Julia Ravino, Franklin Resurrection, Abigail Reynolds, Kaiser Robinson, Jacob Cisneros, Kylie Tarkington, Natalie Tarkington, Evelyn Tate, Denasia Underdue, Ryan Visage, Isaiah White. Congratulations also, also to the cadets and Commander Curtis Brown and First Sergeant Felix Robles for this amazing accomplishment. We are proud of all of you. This concludes our school board recognitions for this evening. She doesn't. Okay. Are there any, this is the adoption of the agenda, are there any modifications to the agenda as presented? Madam Chair, um, I move that we move um, 12D to the end of our meeting so that we have the opportunity to hear the 111 um, public comments that we have before we have the discussion. Do I have a second? I'm second. Okay. So the motion is made by Ms. Brown and seconded by my, Mr. Culpepper. Is there any discussion? Ms. Melnick. Um, Madam Chair, I think that um, given the way this was rolled out to the community, that this community deserves the opportunity to hear the school board members have a discussion about um, this resolution and the actual meaning behind this resolution and they deserve to hear that from this school board as I do not think that the way it was initially presented to this community um, was fair or quite frankly the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth thank you okay thank you Miss Owens 
Thank you. I would ask that the agenda remain as it is and that we follow our bylaws on our scheduling and that we not change our regular procedures just because it's a different topic. People signed up knowing our procedures and I think they have a right to have us stick to that. And so I would request that this topic and this agenda not be treated any different than any other. Thank you. I, I'm gonna ask people, please hold your applause. Remember, um, you can just kind of silently, but please do not applause. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so, um, oh, Miss Anderson. So, <clears throat> our staff will be waiting here. They started work this morning at seven o'clock. If we listen to five and a half hours of people who came to speak, and I, I, I realize that people really want to speak and they want us to hear them, but the way we have put out to the public is that we will listen to speakers until eight o'clock and then we will go about the business of the school board and then we will come back to listen to the, speak the rest of the speakers um, before we actually do the, the voting for action. So we would have, and, and the main topic that a lot of people are here for tonight is not something that we're gonna vote on tonight, but it is something, there is something that people need to understand and that is Many of you are here tonight, many of the, uh, the people are here tonight because of some misleading statements that were put out on social media. And th those misleading statements are basically false. We are not going to be talking uh, and voting on whether or not transgender students are going to be allowed to be- Point of order, Madam Chair. We're having a conversation excuse about whether me. or not we should move excuse an item. Excuse me, point of order. We are not going to be voting order, Madam Chair. on, excuse me. Excuse Point me, I'm going to let her finish, I'm going to let her finish saying it and then you may speak afterwards. We are not going to be voting on whether or not boys can be on girls' teams. That is not part of our agenda tonight. And because there was false, misleading statements put out to the public, that's what a lot of people are here for tonight. And I'm sorry if you were misled and given false information. But I feel that we need to go on. We need to, we need to go ahead and stick with our agenda. We will, we will listen to comments until 8 o'clock. At 8 o'clock, then we will do some business of the board, and then we'll come Thank back you. before we, uh, we do action. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. I think they, they have it. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Manning. Okay, are we discussing, I just want to clarify, are we discussing moving an item, or are we actually discussing that item? That's all, we're just discussing moving the moving item. that item. That was what Thank my you. point of order was for. Um, and I just wanna clarify, we're still keeping information items A through C so that our staff will be able to um, not have to stay here um, into all hour, hours of the night. Is that correct? I just, yes, that, that, okay. that is correct. Yeah. Thank you. So we're only um, talking about moving item D to the end so that we can hear from all of the speakers here and um, that way we can hear what they have to say prior to our having our conversations. So I fully support that change. Okay, thank you. So is there anybody else that would like to speak? Okay, so hearing none. Sorry, Jennifer, I didn't okay. see Ms. Ms. Franklin did not That's see okay. your hand. No worries. Um, I, I just wanna say that I, I do understand uh, that we want to hear all the speakers but since this is not a item that we're voting on tonight and it's just information i don't know that we should be moving the um, agenda item just because of that so I, I think that we maintain the agenda as it is and um, and just continue okay thank you any other discussion okay all right so um i call for a vote for the amendment to the agenda. You wanna say your amendment one more time, please, Ms. Brown? Sure, um, I motion that we move item 12D to after public comment is completed. Okay, Can clarify you. where on the agenda would that would be? After, act, before, after action, 15, after 15? 
and before your committee organization so, reports? I'm sorry. It would, be moved. it would be moved to before actions, but after public comment is done. So that would be, you would just move up no public comment. Instead of 13, you would just have it essentially between 12 and 14. I just want to make clear. At the end of the meeting, I want to make clear what you're talking about. Yes. So before consent agenda, you would take the you would take all the speakers, and then you would go to consent agenda, or you would do consent agenda first. Um, no, we would do it before consent agenda. So after the public comment, we then have the information and the discussion. I personally would like to hear what the public has to say before we have our discussion. So that's why I've made this motion. Madam Chair, I think it clarified. So instead of 13 being returned to public comment, you would take all public comment and 13 would then become information item D. Basically just what she wants to do is when you look at the information, you have um, A, B, C, D. She wants to stop at after B. After C. After C and have D moved to after everyone speaks, okay? And then we'd come back, it would still be information, and it would come before consent agenda. Okay. So it'd be, My concern it with the use of the term end of the meeting, I want to make it clear, the end of the meeting doesn't mean after closed session towards the end, it means, you know, right. Does everybody understand that? No, could you clarify, please? Okay, so if you look at the agenda, you have information. You have A, B, C, D, okay? After the information, the, the speakers will, instead of waiting, instead of closing at eight, we let those speak. We we will con we will do those things on information, okay? Because we have administrators here to to um, present that. After they present A, B, C, then we would come back to the speakers and let the remainder of the speakers speak until they're finished. When they are finished. We will come back to information item D, and it will sti still be 12D above 14. So return to public comments would be moved up, and it, it would split the information, basically, between C and D. Now, does everyone understand? Okay. Okay. So that is the vote that we have. All of those who want to move to that recommendation of the agenda item by Ms. Brown and seconded by Mr. Culpepper, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have four ayes. Okay, all that are against moving this item, please raise your hand. And we have seven nays, the motion did fail. Okay, so we're going to go back to the approval of the agenda as it is, the adoption of the agenda. So, do I have a motion to adopt the agenda as is presented. So moved. Moved by Ms. Melnick. Do I have a second? Seconded by Mrs. Anderson. Is there any conversation or any comments on that? Seeing none, I call for a vote. All those that are for the agenda as presented, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have seven ayes. <coughs> All those 
that are against the agenda as presented, please raise your hand. And we have four nays. The motion did pass. Thank you. So the agenda is adopted. So now we will come to the superintendent's report. Our, this is our second, no, this is our first monthly uh, meeting, but he does have a recognition tonight. So Dr. Spence. I do, thank you, Madam Chair. If I could ask Mr. Michael Tunney to please stand up. So you all will recognize Mr. Tunney. He served as a teacher at Kempsville Middle School, most recently has been serving as a teacher at the Advanced Technology Center. We're very pleased that at your last meeting, you accepted our recommendation for Mr. Tunney to serve as the next coordinator for engineering and technology education in the Office of Career and Technology Education. Congratulations, sir. <laughs> so you have some very excited guests with you. Would you like to introduce them? <laughs> Congratulations again. And Madam Chair, that's all. Thank you, Dr. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Spence. Dr. Spence. Um, the approval of the meeting minutes for April 25th, 2023, the regular school board meeting. Are there any modifications to the April 25th, 2023 special school board meeting minutes as presented? Hearing none, I call for a motion to approve the April 25th, 2023 minutes as presented. Yes, Ms. Brown, and seconded by Mr. Uh, Callan. All in favor, or is there any um, discussion? Okay. Um, all in favor of the approval of the minutes for April 25th, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes. Okay. Um, any abstentions? I'll abstain. I had to leave the um, meeting early last time due to illness. Thank you. So, Madam Chair, the motion did pass <clears throat> with 10 ayes and one abstention. Thank you. Now, all, the moment we've all been waiting for, public comments. We will have com public comments until 8 o'clock tonight, and then if we do not finish, we will come back to the co uh, public comments after the information of A, B, C, and D. The school board will now hear public comments on matters relevant <clears throat> to pre-K, <clears throat> excuse me, public education in Virginia Beach and the business of the school board and the school division from citizens and delegations who signed up with the school board clerk prior to noon today. Speakers are responsible for being in the school board room, auditorium, or online when they are called to speak. And if a speaker is not present when called to speak, or is not online or unable to unmute when called to speak, the school board at its sole discretion may allow the speaker to speak at the end of the public comment se session. The school board also invites the public to submit comments through our group email account, which can be found on our website. Madam Clerk, please introduce the first speaker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Our first speaker is Emily Labar, Jana Saltesiak, and then Adrian Brubaker. Welcome. Good afternoon, my name is Emily Labar and I'm the president of First Colonial High School's Gender Sexuality Alliance. Since September, I, along with many other students, parents, and teachers have been speaking out against the 2022 model policies. Last meeting, I asked the board to do something to reassure their students, something to prove that equity is more than a trigger word to gain public support. It's a promise. Ms. Owens has done so by drafting the resolution concerning non-discrimination against LGBTQ plus youth in education. This is a common sense resolution. All it asks is that the board continues to follow the law, state and federal, and to make a promise to not discriminate against its own students. Every day, a message is being sent to transgender students by discriminatory proposed policy, like the 2022 model policies, or by continued inaction. The message is this, you aren't welcome here. You aren't equal to your peers. You don't deserve to be protected. This resolution is an opportunity to reverse that message, to turn it into one of love and tolerance instead. 
This resolution upholds the virtues of VBCPS by continuing to, quote, foster and build positive relationships between staff, parents, and students, end quote, as well as, quote, create a welcoming, safe, and inclusive learning environment providing protections for all students, regardless of sex, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, gender expression, or any other characteristic protected by state or federal law, end quote. These two things never had to be mutually exclusive. There are a lot of people here today. There are a lot of people here because they hate us. But for the past seven months, they haven't been here. For us, this isn't a passing issue. This is our lives, our friends, and our family. To us, this isn't an issue on social media we want to get enraged about. This is an issue of respect, of equity, of belonging. Vote yes to this resolution. Vote yes because your students are your responsibility. Vote yes because when the votes are counted, 30 seconds. we will still be here. We will be here until you do what is right. Thank you. Our next speaker. I want to remind everyone, we are asking you to abstain from clapping, from the applause, because it is disruptive, and we're asking you to do that. That's the last time I'm going to mention that, so please do not applaud. Our next speaker is Jana Salcidiak, then Adrian Brubreka Salcido, and then Alana Spencer. Welcome. Hello, everyone. My name is Jana Salcidiak and I am a junior at Kellum High School. Many of you might recognize me. Tonight, there's going to be a vote on a new resolution that will protect LGBT plus youth, such as myself, from hateful discriminatory policies. I have to assume everyone here cares about the kids. To quote an article from the National Library of Medicine, multiple studies at state, national, and international levels find that enumerated policies are associated with improved education environments for LGBTQ in all students. Specifically, in the presence of enumerated policies, LGBT students feel safer at school, hear less homophobic language, experience less identity-based victimization, report less absenteeism from, at school, and are less at risk for suicide and substance use. For those of you who might not have understood, that's saying that when LGBTQIA plus students have a more supportive school environment, they face less hate, and their risk of both suicide and substance abuse decrease. Doesn't that sound wonderful? Less kids feeling unwanted, feeling suicidal, or taking part in substance abuse. The benefits of having an environment where kids like me know that they will be safe are astounding. We don't want to be victimized by a system that is supposed to help us. LGBT plus students are more likely to be homeless and are more likely to drop out of high school. We are more likely to face bullying from other students. The Trevor Project found that less than one in three transgender and non-binary youth have a home where they will be fully accepted for who they are. We face all these challenges. Please, don't give us more. And if you are on the fence about this policy, look around you. Look back at all the previous meetings where topics involving LGBT plus youth and students were discussed. How many of us did you see? We have come to every meeting and we have been watching. So listen to what your future voters have to say. We will remember how you treat us. I have a promise for all of you. I will remember how you act, reacted. And if this resolution does not pass, when you are up for re-election, I will be out there working against those of you who fought against this. And I hope you will be able to go to every voter and give them your excuses for why you should be allowed to discriminate against us. Because I will be telling them all exactly what you did. Tonight, voting against this resolution is voting for hate. And I will tell all your voters exactly that. Don't ignore us. We matter just as much as every other student. Thank you. Our next speaker is Adriana Brubaker Salcido, then Alana Spencer, then Natalie Gonzalez. Welcome. Hi, my name is Adriana Brubaker Salcido, and I am a sixth grader at Old Donation School, Brickell Academy, a gifted educational school. I am here today to show all my support and raise awareness for the unalienable rights of all people, including LGBTQIA students. As a student, education creates a pathway to your future. 
and by feeling comfortable and safe in your environment of learning, you can achieve more with less worry about whether or not your gender, sexuality, or color is supposedly wrong. At school, talking to a school counselor or teacher has been ingrained in us as an option when you are feeling unsafe, scared, or uneasy. The topic can range from your curricular path to your gender identity. The idea that the teacher or counselor would then be required by law to notify the guardians takes away from school of the feeling like a safe place. And for some students, school is the only place they can feel safe within themselves. Different people have different experiences from their home life and school, making their gender identity unacceptable in their household or could change the family's view in a negative way only because the school staff notifies the parents. This creates barriers emotionally which will ultimately impact the student's grades, emotions, and overall mental health and well-being. Both adults and children feel safer sharing personal information when the conversation is understood to be confidential. I urge you to support the resolution prov to provide a welcoming, safe, and inclusive school environment for me and my peers. Please, for some students, their life depends on it. Our next speaker is Alana Spencer, then Natalie Gonzalez, then Willow Bobowitz. Welcome. Good evening, board members. My name is Alana Spencer, and alongside many parents, teachers, and friends, for several months, we've asked you to deny the 2022 model policies. And today will be no different. From our very first school board meeting, we've spoken to you about now, about an acknowledgement, a sign that you all are listening and that you understand. And we've received it in a resolution drafted by Ms. Owens pertaining to non-discrimination against LGBTQ plus youth in education. And just saying these words feel like a fever dream. A resolution that upholds the law, the very purpose of VBCPS, and most importantly, ensures the safety and rights of every single student. Though this is huge in our eyes, it should be huge in yours. Just a continuation of the current policies, a remaining promise to your students that you will continue to stand with us, protect us, and give us an environment that we can all thrive in. So we can be the leaders in our community, and so we can make change not only in our lives, but others, just like you taught us to. You taught us to persevere through all our challenges and we have, through all the hate and backlash, which is only a fraction of hate trans students will go through if the 2022 models are passed. We are still here. And while I hope this is the home stretch, you know we will be here until what's right is done. And what's right is to vote yes. Vote yes for your students. We know that this is a problem that you didn't create. But just like the 2022 model seats were tossed into your lap, now the, re now the resolution has been. Now is your time to show your students that you care. To vote yes is your duty. It's time for you to put the same amount of effort, time, care, and passion we have into informing you into your vote. I cannot express the importance of right now. Right now we are hoping, no, we are urging you to right the VOD is wrong. That is it for today. Between September and now, we've said all that can be said. So today I don't have a question for you, but an expectation. Thank you. Our next speaker is Natalie Gonzalez, then Willow Boberitz, then Charlie Levine. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Natalie Gonzalez, and after spending the past few months arguing against the 2022 model policies, I'm overjoyed to be given the chance to argue in favor of Ms. Owens' resolution instead. I'm sure that some might see Owens' resolution as a radical extremist move, but there is nothing controversial or extreme about the resolution at all. The resolution seeks only to ensure that each and every student in Virginia Beach City Public Schools is afforded a safe and supportive learning environment that allows them to thrive. It is non-discriminatory and it is everything that we stand for. 
Owens' resolution states, the school board of the city of Virginia Beach affirms, supports, and values each of our students and will continue to further our efforts to create a welcoming, safe, and inclusive learning environment providing protections for all students, and further states, the school board of the city of Virginia Beach will adopt no policies in violation of state or federal law that would impede our ability to provide these guaranteed protections to our students. The resolution does not ask to favor the rights of LGBTQ students over their peers, and it does not ask to exclude parents from their children's education. In fact, the resolution acknowledges the importance of, fo of fostering positive relationships between students and their parents almost immediately, mentioning so in its second line. The resolution is merely asking to protect equality within our schools and to ensure the overall health and well-being of all students, irrespective of their sex, sexual orientation, gender, or gender identity. It cannot be denied that LGBTQ youth consider or attempt suicide at disproportionately higher rates than their peers, and it cannot be denied that accepting communities and affirming schools directly contribute to lower rates of suicide amongst LGBTQ youth. Our schools have an important role to play in improving these grim statistics, and Owens' resolution acknowledges this. We cannot afford to move backwards and allow our most vulnerable students to struggle when we know we can take steps to help them succeed. This resolution is not attempting to dismiss or disrespect the wishes of parents, and it's not attempting to accomplish anything outlandish or extraordinary. It is simply a reaffirmation to trans students that they are equal and have a place in the classroom. Ms. Owens' resolution is a modest and respectful dismissal of a policy that will target and harm trans students, and though passing this resolution may not completely eliminate their struggles, it will bring us one step closer to keeping our students safe and protected. It will send a message that our voices matter, and it will uphold the values of inclusivity and equality seconds. that Virginia Beach City Public Schools holds dear. Thank you. Our next speaker is Willow Boberitz, then Charlie Levine, then Hope Paninsky. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Willow Boberitz, and I'm a senior at Kellum High School. During Teacher Appreciation Week, we pay special attention to the work that a teacher does inside and outside of the classroom. On paper, a teacher's responsibility is to inform and educate their students on anything pertaining to their subject. But it being accurate to say that all that is all we cherish our teachers for. Teachers are our role models, our mentors, and our friends, and so much more. We confide our hopes, dreams, and even fears to our teachers, who in turn wish for their students' safety, success, and happiness. Threats to the rights of trans students weaken this important bond between teachers and their students rather than strengthening it. The teaching environment would alienate transgender students who struggle to comfortably express their gender identity to the teachers who, as the policy states, must disregard it unless explicitly asked for by their parents. With so many trans students already uncomfortable in schools, we need to make efforts to build trust with them, not undermine it. Under the model policy, transgender students must be careful to never be too revealing, never to open up, because one wrong move could alert a teacher and could change their life forever. Tense circumstances like these would become a reality for transgender students across the Commonwealth of Virginia. These students would be limited, to the, limited in their ability to, ability to express themselves fully, and teachers would remain lost in how to effectively connect with them. It is crucial that we create an environment in which students feel safe to be themselves and are able to build trust with their teachers. And calling students by their preferred name and pronouns is the first step to accomplishing this. Our students must know and feel that Virginia schools accept them wholeheartedly. It is easy to say that school is just a place to do co coursework when you aren't spending eight hours a day in its walls. Schools are not just academic workplaces. They are large communities which students will either live will either thrive in or suffer in. If we surround trans students with staff they can trust, then they will see, we will see them thrive and contrib contribute to the community like never before. If we remove these pillars of trust and close its wall in on them, we can only expect them to spiral down even further. Trust between teachers and its students is absolutely necessary. It must be um, preserved if we are truly dedicated to helping students succeed in inside and outside the classroom. And it is the caring and compassionate nature of teachers that allows them to be such effective educators. It is important that we continue to support and appreciate their efforts while also recognizing the critical role they play in 
creating a safe and inclusive environment for all students, regardless of their gender identity. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charlie Levine, then Hope Thininsky, then Eden Amato. Welcome. Good evening, board. Over the last few months, you've had the opportunity to hear firsthand the experiences of transgender students in our school system. You've heard their stories of how life improved for them post-transition. You've heard our many arguments about the dangers posed by these model policies. Looking back on our country over the previous months, it is impossible to say that there is no danger posed to the transgender community. Hate crimes and violent acts are all too common in occurrence. It is impossible to say that there is no chance at similar hatred occurring here, that it couldn't happen to the students in our schools. Enacting these policies and forcefully outing transgender students would be turning a blind eye to the existence of child abuse. James Madison once wrote that if men were angels, no government would be necessary. In an ideal world, all people would be virtuous and fair, but that is not the reality we face. We face a reality of a country full of homeless transgender teenagers, abandoned by their family, while others face physical, emotional, and mental abuse. We cannot pretend or hope that these model policies would be for the better, or that they won't lead to domestic violence, depression, and the suffering of transgender teens. Enacting the proposed policies means sending endangered adolescents into hateful, abusive homes. Enacting the policies means forcing transgender students into hiding their identity and denying their happiness. Enacting these policies means teaching transgender kids that they are not equal in our school system or our community, and that they are not worthy of our love or respect. Enacting these policies means turning your backs on students in our school system. A student cannot engage in a learning environment that is hostile to them. When surrounded by fear of being outed or being forced into an identity that doesn't represent their true selves, it stunts their ability to learn. Students need a nurturing environment that protects and cares for them. They need an opportunity to develop in a safe community as they mature and find their role in the world. These policies, however, would shut trans transgender students out of those opportunities. If you want to protect the kids in our school system, listen to them. Listen to their experiences, their arguments, and their pleas for a chance at safety and equality. Please, vote in favor of Ms. Owen's resolution. The students that you are on this board to serve are begging you to protect us and our friends. Thank you for your time and consideration. Our next speaker is Hope Pininsky, Eden Amato, and then Ella Stanton. Welcome. Good evening, school board members. My name is Hope Panuski. As you can tell from the little recognition they had, I do debate. The thing is, I have performed so many speeches on so many sides on so many topics just this year. However, I don't think I'm anywhere near as passionate about any of those topics as I am about this one. In Congress, we debate on bills, and then we vote on them to be laws. But these imaginary laws don't affect people. Being here speaking to you on a policy that could really affect kids is not only more exciting, but more nerve wracking. Knowing that I could hurt or help these kids affected by this policy is quite a lot of pressure. But then I look at that audience. I look at those people. What do I see? You might say you see some young kids that I'm kind of tuning out at this moment, but I guess what? They're the future. These people are the future lawyers, doctors, scientists, and even the future you. They could make or break our world. One of them could even solve world hunger for all we know. But that one person could be someone affected by this policy. This could deteriorate their mental health, causing them to take their own lives. This is not only taking their lives, but millions of others that could have been saved if they were just embraced. This policy encourages things like bullying, social exclusion, and social norms. These are things that are dangerous to not only youth, but also just to the average citizen. Now, I would like you to look back at that audience. Think of another thing they are or will be. They are your voters. Whether you are, they are current or future, they are people who vote to keep you on that stage and in this position. When they cast their ballots, they're going to think back on all you did as a school board member. Who do you think they're going to vote for? Someone who was spaced out while they were trying to express the effects this would have on youth? Or someone that was listening to them 
and acting on what they expressed. Politics is a trial and error run. They place people in positions, see what they do to actually help the people, and then decide from there. Voting to take away expression for a group of people that don't even affect you is like using the term because I say so. The policy has no other reason than to, quote, protect parent rights, unquote, or your own religion. These, policy, these reasons should never be grounds to make such drastic decisions like this that affect so many young people. Thank you. Our next speaker is Eden Amato, then Alice Stanton, then A.J. Quartero. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Eden Amato, and I'm a freshman at Lansdowne High School. It's been a very long journey. We've spoken since September about what's wrong with these policies and how they're harmful to transgender students. We've all pushed for you not to adopt these policies. We're all here to protect ourselves and our classmates. Ms. Owens has proposed an excellent resolution to reject the model policies because they can harm transgender students. Virginia Beach Public Schools is supposed to protect every student, regardless of race, gender identity, or sexuality. That's why I urge you all to pass Ms. Owens' resolution. You've heard story after story, and statistic after statistic about what's wrong with these policies. With this proposed resolution, I feel that we're seen and heard. I feel that the time we've taken out of our busy schedules for the past several months has proven to be worth it. I imagine you've all heard the phrase, or used it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If this situation doesn't define it, what does? The current policies work very well, so why should they be changed? Ms. Owens' resolution isn't trying to change anything. It's just going to maintain the policies VBCPS has now and reject the ones that can cause harm. The current policies protect transgender students and give them the privacy they're entitled to. Every student deserves privacy regardless of their gender identity. Throughout the process of speaking at these meetings, I haven't been able to understand why people believe that every student is entitled to respect unless they're part of the LGBTQ community. Every student matters, no matter what. I'd like to thank Ms. Owens for hearing our pleas and creating a proposal. As a young, upcoming generation, we feel it's important for our voices to be heard. I often hear, you are the future, so now is the time. Now is the time to show that you've been hearing us. Now is the time to vote affirmatively on a resolution that'll keep policies that are safe for transgender students. We've all worked very hard and taken a lot of time for this to happen, and this resolution is the light at the end of the tunnel. I urge you all to vote in favor of this proposed resolution to protect the lives of trans transgender and non-binary students. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Alice Stanton, then A.J. Quartero, and then Charlie Bodenstein. Welcome. Thank you. In Texas, a plethora of transphobic bills are being passed throughout the House and the Senate, from bills that bar transgender youth from receiving care from doctors to requiring schools to notify parents of any services provided or monitoring of their students' mental, emotional, or physical health and well-being. Each day, the world becomes a little less safe for transgender individuals. However, Texas isn't the only state we see this happening. In Florida, doctors are banned from allowing, allowing Floridians to receive gender-affirming health care under 18. Bans are also being put in place for adults to receive, for adults to receive transgender health care. Senate Bill 254 grants a pathway for a parent who doesn't support medical care for their child's transition to challenge a custody agreement with a parent who does. House Bill 1069 would require schools to teach that reproductive roles are binary, stable, and unchangeable. House Bills 1223, 1320 prohibit employees of the school system from referring to students by their preferred name and pronouns and ban critical race theory and gender studies. If one of these bills that I have repeated in, this, in both states sounds familiar, it should, as it is almost an exact copy of the model policy we are here arguing against today. The policy which will ban transgender students from going by a preferred name and pronoun and out them to their parents. Texas and Florida are living proof proof that by passing just one piece of harmful transphobic legislations, it will open the doors to pass even more. We must stop it now at the root before the weed grows too wild to tame. 
A survey, survey showed that in the South, 44% of LGBTQ youth seriously considered committing suicide. This is compared to a 14% consideration from other states. Virginia Beach doesn't aspire to be California, but that doesn't mean we have to adopt these harmful policies from Texas or Florida. If we follow in these states' footsteps, we're creating an environment that fosters harm to our children. Everyone in this room can agree that we are here to protect our children. This isn't an issue of whether or not we want children to be safe. It is how we execute it, and the execution of children's safety should be the most deciding factor in the school board's decision. This, um, I'm sorry, even if you don't agree with us, even if you don't think transgender people are valid, you have to acknowledge that this new model policy will hurt children in our school. My own mother did not feel safe having me come into this building tonight because of the hate from the adults in the room. If this issue is truly about safety, then you must support Ms. Owen's proposed resolution. Thank you. Our next speaker is A.J. Quartero, then Charlie Bodenstein, then Bethany Wilmoth. Welcome. Good evening. My name is A.J. Quartero. My pronouns are they, them, and I am a sophomore at Kelm High School. I used to not feel comfortable in my home. My parents have always loved me, but it was a very rocky few years before they completely accepted who I was, or rather, until they fully embraced that part of me. It seemed like every other week we were locked in a screaming match at the dinner table. And you can imagine that, especially in the era of COVID, this was not the ideal home dynamic. Mm. I locked myself in my room for most hours of the day. I felt unseen and invisible to the people that mattered most to me in my life. I thought about suicide, and I almost followed through with it. Things got better over time, though. My teachers and friends at school accepted me without a second thought. Over time, my parents came around too and made me feel comfortable in my own home again. And you might not be able to believe that the use of a preferred name and pronouns could help save a person from such a dark place, but it can, and I am living proof. Think about that. Using preferred names and pronouns is not just basic respect, it is what makes us feel seen, heard, and valued. Something as simple as changing a word in a sentence can save a trans student's life, so why do we refuse to commit such a simple action? Because of politics? Because of prejudice? Ms. Owens' resolution is going to save lives. Not only does the resolution continue to allow the use of preferred names and pronouns, it rejects discrimination that would otherwise endanger transgender students. This resolution proposes to allow our community to continue to be respected by our teachers and peers at school, even if we cannot receive that same respect from our parents. It's nothing new, it's what we have been able to do peacefully for years. I understand that some of the people here have a distinct lack of respect for me and my community and may see transgender and non-binary students like me as less than people. But all I can do is remind everyone here that we are people. I am not a Frankenstein's monster of leftist woke propaganda and gender ideology. My name is AJ. I'm 16. I'm the Kellum Drama Club historian. I want to go to college for graphic design because I'm fascinated by the world of digital art. I like to play Mario Kart with my brother and watch scary movies with my mom. I attend school board meetings every other Tuesday to stand up for what I believe in. I am a human being and I happen to be non-binary. I, like everyone else in my community, am a student with hopes and dreams and potential that can flourish in the face of Ms. Owens' resolution or wither in the face of the 2022 model policies. With all that being said, I leave you with one final truth. My future and all of our futures are in your hands. Do not throw them away. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charlie Bodenstein, then Bethany Wilf, then Bradley Fish. Welcome. Hey guys. So, uh, good evening and thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. The primary concern of the 2022 model policy is protecting parents' rights. It's a theme that's woven throughout the policy with its first guiding principle being parents have the right to make decisions with respect to their children. In almost every interview regarding these policies, Governor Glenn Youngkin emphasizes that they are motivated by a desire to keep parents deeply involved in their children's education. While the idea of protecting parents' rights is warranted and reasonable, the reality is that the model policies are deeply flawed and create an unsafe and unwelcoming environment for transgender and gender non-conforming students. 
And the resolution proposed by Ms. Owens more effectively respects parents' rights while still prioritizing the success and needs of our transgender students. The model policy cites the 14th Amendment of the Constitution and the Code of Virginia, both of which state that the parents have a fundamental right to direct the upbringing and education of their children. However, th this right is not absolute. Parents have rights and can, of course, make decisions regarding their children's upbringing, such as deciding whether to send them to private or public school, but are still expected to yield to reasonable demands made by the schools their children attend. Schools have a vested interest and responsibility in promoting the welfare of their students, and Owen's resolution upholds that responsibility, seeking to guarantee that every student can learn in an environment that is safe, welcoming, and affirming. Furthermore, the model policy is more, much more focused on guaranteeing the right to misgender and dead name transgender students than it is on guaranteeing parents' rights. The policies required that school divisions personnel refer to their student only by their legal name and pronouns associated with their assigned sex unless otherwise requested by a student's parents. However, policy also states that school division personnel shall not be compelled to refer to students in a way that violates their constitutionally protected rights. This essentially leaves a loophole where teachers can blatantly disregard a parent's wishes and continue deadnaming and misgendering a student if they so choose. Parents' rights are important and should be respected. However, the model policies don't strike the right balance between protecting parents' rights and supporting transgender students. It is not fair to just put the well-being and safety of our most vulnerable students at risk in order to vindicate parents. And calling someone by their preferred name and pronouns does not directly interfere with parental rights. Owen's resolution isn't asking to overturn or undermine parental rights and keep them uninformed. It's simply assuring students that they deserve to feel safe, supported, and valued in their schools, and we urge you to vote on it. Vote in favor of it whenever you do. And that is time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bethany Wilmoth, then Bradley Fish, then Haley Dorr. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, hello, my name is Bethany Wilmoth. I'm an LGBT freshman from Salem High School, and I'm here to speak against the 2022 model policies and for the resolution introduced by Owens. The Trevor Project reported that in a national survey done by LGBT youth in 2021, 28% of LGBT youth reported experiencing homelessness or housing instability at some point in their lives. These rates of homelessness were reported higher amongst transgender and non-binary youth. This would be 38% of trans women, 39% of trans boys, and 35% non-binary people had reported some, for, some form of housing instability compared to 23% of cisgender LGB youth. Out of the 28% who reported housing instability, 55% said that they had run away from home due to mistreatment due to sexuality and or gender identity or fear of said mistreatment. 14% of LGBTQ youth reported that they had slept away from home due to being kicked out or abandoned at some point in their lives. Those who reported housing instability were at higher risk for self-harm and mental health issues compared to those who did not report housing instability. To your ears, it may just seem like a selection of pointless numbers that I'm just now choosing to throw at you, but you need to remember that behind each number, there's several stories. Ms. Owens has introduced a resolution to this bill that will properly accommodate the needs of transgender students. In her resolution, she describes an accepting environment for all students regardless of their gender identity, expression, and sexual orientation. I am fully confident that the resolution Ms. Owens has introduced will save lives. I do not know how many students will be helped and comforted through her resolution. What I do know is that if even one child can find some sort of support in school, it's up to you as school board members to consider it, regardless of if that child is cisgender or transgender. We have stood here and repeated statistics that show just how important a gender-affirming environment is in preventing self-harm and suicide for transgender youth. I know some of you have spent these last couple of meetings staring blankly at the wall behind our faces. I know some of you are tired of hearing us speak, but these next few speeches matter most. We urge you to listen 
We urge you to look at us, and we urge you to support the resolution Owen has, Owens has introduced. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bradley Fish, then Haley Dorr, then Jay Cook. Welcome. Thank you. And hello. In Section 3D of the model policy, it is stated that, all, quote, all children in Virginia have a right to learn, free and unlawful discrimination and harassment, end quote. Pay attention to the word discrimination. We already know that the transgender community suffers from higher than average suicide rates, and we know that the model policy will contribute to making that rate even higher by rejecting the validity of their identities. Knowing these facts and the meaning of the word discrimination makes it a disgrace to not pass Ms. Owens' resolution. Her plan would reject the model policy and prevent the present issues from becoming worse. Specifically, it would allow for the privacy rights of students to be respected and prevent forced outings for all students with the aim of protecting those in abusive households from harm. Additionally, this resolution understands the facts behind LGBTQ plus rates of suicide and the general method of lowering such a statistic by making our schools more accepting and providing safe places to learn and grow. Without the rejection of the model policies, the rate of transgender suicides will increase, and if that does not count as unjust, then what can? If this is not where the line is drawn, then where will it end up? The history of transgender people is one full of misery. I am reminded of a hospital in Germany that made great strides for gender-affirming care that was burned down the same year the Nazis came to power. Is that the line? Do we let things get that bad before saying enough is enough? In section 4B3, the model policy attempts to define transgender student. It states as follows, quote, the phrase transgender student shall mean a public school student who, whose parents has requested in writing due to their child's persistent and sincere belief that his or her gender differs with his or her sex, that their child may be so identified while at school, end quote. Why only define transgender student, and why in such a false manner? I don't need my parents to sign an official document describing me as a cis male, but my transgender peers do. Why does this exist if not for the purposes of othering a minority group? By linking transgender identity to what a student's parents think, those with unsupportive parents are essentially written out of the books, and with the logical extreme of this terminology, they would be completely forgotten. With Miss Owen's resolution, this would no longer be an issue. If freedom is still considered a noble value, as America has always aspired to, then why does this policy want to see the freedom of transgender individuals restric restricted, tying them to their parents who may never accept their identities? By limiting an entire group of people, this policy makes America take a step backwards when we should be moving forward. Move forward and value freedom by embracing Ms. Owens' resolution. Thank you. Our next speaker is Haley Dorr, then Jay Cook, then Alex Elsrod. Haley Dorr, Jay Cook, Alex Elsrod, welcome. I'm here. The next meeting, you're going to have a great opportunity. You're going to have the chance to vote in favor of Ms. Owens' resolution, a resolution which would protect LGBTQ plus youth from discriminatory policies. Students of all creeds should have an equal chance to succeed in our schools, and this resolution helps turn that goal into a reality. Unfortunately, some aren't going to see it that way. Some members of the community are afraid that a protecting the rights of these students somehow diminishes the safety of other students. So let me set the record straight. Tonight, they're gonna to try and tell you that this, that this resolution is a threat to the security in our bathrooms. But that simply isn't true. Ms. Owens' resolution does not even discuss the subject. And as we've stated before, gender neutral bathrooms are a safe and widely accepted solution to this matter. Matter of fact, this is a solution that this board has already taken and it is not even a topic of debate, no matter how much the other side wants it to be. This attack is nothing more than fear-mongering, distracting from the main center of our arguments. And they're gonna say that this resolution will undermine the integrity and safety of our sports, but that isn't true either. As I'm sure all of you on this board know, all competitive sports are under the discretion of the VHSL, a statewide organization completely separate from this body. 
This is not a VPCPS issue, so quite frankly, any discussion of this issue here is useless. They're gonna say that this resolution is some sweeping radical change, but that isn't true either. Matter of fact, this is the opposite of the truth. Ms. Owens' resolution merely states that this board will not adopt any discriminatory and potentially illegal policies that would harm our students. This resolution was designed to prevent an enormous change, not create one. And finally, they're gonna say that this resolution only serves a select few students by forcing a progressive ideology upon our schools. This isn't true either. This policy only wants to create equal opportunity. It only wants to create a comfortable learning environment for all students. There is going to be all kinds of rage tossed at this policy, but that is a reflection of our times, not these policies. And the sad truth that is that even common sense reforms like the one Ms. Owens proposes are unconscionable to some because of the hatred for the communities that we defend. At the end of the day, we are not in your seats. We do not cast the votes. All we can ask is that you vote on the contents of this resolution rather than the rage it may invoke. 30 seconds. We do not fear what the other side may say. Matter of fact, we welcome their voices because we know that there is no valid justification for voting against this resolution. There is no justification for enabling hateful policies no matter how much they try to spin their arguments. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ari Serja, then Geneva Warren, then Ari Wheeler. Welcome. Welcome. Hold on, so sorry. Good afternoon, members of the school board. My name is Ari Serja, and I'm a senior in the Legal Studies Academy at First Colonial. I'm here to speak against the Virginia Department of Education's model policies concerning transgender students. I found it inspiring when former mayor of Virginia Beach, Will Sessom, once said, to continue to make this city the greatest city in the world, we must constantly nourish our roots. With these words in mind, I feel compelled, not only as a citizen within the city, but as a fellow student, to state my deep concern and disappointment with the recent model policies created by the Virginia Department of Education. These policies do nothing but invite hate and discrimination against transgender and LGBTQ youth within our state, and I urge you to take action to prevent their implementation within our school system. Allowing actions and harmful legislation like these policies to even have a chance to be implemented negatively impacts LGBTQ youth who are merely trying to pursue an education and be positive contributors to society. These policies hinder their ability to fit in daily and send a message that they are not welcome within their city and even further their own school hallways. The negative impact of these discriminatory policies on LGBTQ youth is well documented. Empirical data shows that LGBTQ youth are at a significantly higher risk for self-harm, homelessness, and disengagement from their education. Specifically, in a 2020 study by the Trevor Project, LGBTQ youth who reported experiencing discrimination based on their sexual orientation or gender identity were more than twice as likely to report a suicide attempt in the past year compared to those who did not report such discrimination. The same study found that LGBTQ youth who experienced discrimination were also more likely to experience homelessness and to report that they felt unsafe at school. Therefore, it's not a stretch to say that these policies create an environment of fear and hostility for these students, which is ant antithetical to the safe and supportive learning environment that this school board should be striving to create. But this isn't just about statistics and numbers. This is about real human beings with real emotions who deserve to be treated with nothing but dignity and respect. We have a responsibility to protect and nurture all of our children regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity. They're not just others to be dismissed or ignored. They're our sons and daughters, our neighbors and friends. They're an essential part of the fabric of our community. We must do all we can to ensure that they feel safe, accepted, and valued. We must recognize the harm that these policies can cause and take steps to ensure that our LGBTQ youth feel supported and valued within our school system. All students deserve a safe and inclusive learning environment that fosters their growth and success. We cannot seconds. allow policies that discriminate against a group of students to poison the roots of our city. To restate, I agree with former Mayor Will Sessoms that to continue being the greatest city in the world, we must constantly nourish our roots. This school board, this school board cannot achieve this goal by promoting policies that discriminate against our LGBTQ youth. We must take a stand and create policies that embrace and support all students. Thus, I believe the Virginia Beach School Board should honor the passion, initiative, and drive of school board member Jessica Owens, who has a well, who has a well-crafted resolution that ensures our city can remain great by honoring that both is the majority time. and the minority. Thank our you. next speaker is Geneva Warren, then Ari Wheeler, then Finn Sproul. Welcome. 
Good evening, members of the school board. My name is Geneva Warren, and I am a sophomore at First Colonial High School. Tonight, I would like to start with a piece of history. Rina Nintan was born on September 8, 1923, in Siegen, Germany. In 1953, Rina had a run-in with the police that would make the headlines. Police officers arrested her because she was suspected of wearing female clothing to commit criminal acts. In reality, that was not the reason for her apparel. Rina Nintan, a trans woman, would, be, would go on to become the first woman to receive a gender reassignment surgery in Israel. Her journey was not one of grace, though. Because gender reassignment surgeries were rare during her lifetime, Rina faced extreme resistance on her path and resorted to self-harm often. After many years, Rina Nintan was finally given gender-affirming surgery and an official name change. She then left for Switzerland, where she led a quiet life and passed away in 1979. The moral I need you to take away from this piece of history is that history constantly repeats itself. Rena was faced with vitriol in her battle for self-expression, vitriol that the children of Virginia Beach public schools should not have to endure. Ms. Owen's resolution would be a, set, a step in the right direction for a healthy, happy Virginia Beach school system. It would ensure that Virginia Beach would never allow discrimination against trans youth, and it would put us in line with all the legal standards already in place to protect marginalized groups. We aren't asking for anything out of line. We aren't even asking for a change. We are just asking that you support Ms. Owen's resolution, a resolution that does nothing but reaffirm the tenets of equality and empathy in our school system that it already strives for. History always repeats itself. We must not allow innocent children to become the victims of a wave of hatred around them. Stand with us and let freedom, justice, and equality prevail for the children of Virginia Beach. Please, make the right choice when considering this bill and pass Ms. Owen's resolution for the children. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ari Wheeler, then Finn Sproul, then Sam Turner. Ari Wheeler. Finn Sproul. Sam Turner. Um, Welcome. Good, ev good evening, members of the school board. My name is Finn Sproul. I'm a trans male and a sophomore at Kempsville High School. Long time no see. I haven't attended a meeting in a few weeks and in a way I almost missed it. As great as it feels to be doing something important, I wish fighting to ensure my safety, comfort, and rights wasn't what made me feel productive. Time and time again, we gather in front of you to show the vulnerable side of school. And all I ask is for you to listen to what makes me feel vulnerable. We need to add nicknames on the printed out roster for substitute teachers. My name is Finn, F-I-N-N. -N. All I ask is for four extra letters. Four letters can mean the world to someone. You have the ability to do so much for someone in four letters. Do something important, listen to us, act accordingly, and make the change. I ask you to add preferred names in Synergy in parentheses next to legal names on printed out rosters, as well as vote yes to non-discrimination non against LGBT plus youth in education by board member Owens. The world is changing and we must change with it. Do what is right and make us feel safe. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sam Turner, then Oren Davis, then Miranda White. Welcome. Hello, my name is Sam Turner and my pronouns are they, them. I am a freshman in the Visual and Performing Arts Academy at Salem. This is my first time speaking here. Before I start, I would like to note that I have Tourette syndrome, which causes me to make involuntary movements and noises. I am not being disrespectful, I cannot control it. The lives of thousands of trans students are at stake, including mine. So why don't I introduce myself to you? I may be more like you than you realize. My name is Sam. I own a gerbil, several fish, I love the color red and walking in the forest. My favorite show is NCIS. My favorite band is CCR. I even have them on vinyl. I've always enjoyed fighting for what I believe in. I've always been passionate about my beliefs and identity. 
I distinctly remember secretly going by a different name with friends and feeling like I had to tiptoe around everything when I was younger. I was scared that if I came out, I would be kicked out and hated by my family because only 57% of people said they would support a trans or non-binary family member. However, when I came out in seventh grade and was welcome, welcomed with open arms, the biggest weight was lifted off my shoulders. I felt free and I felt so much happier. And when I started dressing in a way I felt comfortable, it only increased my mental health. There are times where I have felt extremely dysphoric and uncomfortable in my body. It has made my mind go places I could never imagine. However, being called by my pronouns and my name eases some of those feelings. It is vital that my identity is respected because I have fought so hard just to be here today, just to be alive. I could not go back to being addressed by my dead name. Owen's resolution makes it impossible to adopt discriminatory policies. This resolution is valuable to the lives of trans students in BBCPS. What you don't understand is that you're forcing trans students into the most uncomfortable and horrible situations and forcing supporting teachers to go against everything they believe in. Do you understand the amount of pain you're putting on your already underpaid, horribly treated teachers? We need to recognize that these policies are not the answers. Instead, we can support Owen's resolution and open up the doors for a more accepting community in our district. We are not asking you all to get someone's names or pronouns perfectly right all the time. Heck, even I don't get all of my friends' pronouns half right half the time. We're not asking you to run around barefoot across a floor of lava. We are simply asking that you try your best to respect the identities of trans people. If I can do it, so can you. Once again, I urge you to consider Owen's resolutions and how they can positively affect our students and staff at VBCPS. Thank you. Our next speaker is Oren Davis, Miranda White, and then William Cezanne. Welcome. Good evening, board members. I am Orion Davis, a junior from Salem High School. I'm here tonight to speak in support of Owen's resolution. I have been on testosterone for one week and one day. I have known that I was a man for much longer than that. The process of getting to where I am was brutal and I developed an eating disorder as a, as a result of the lack of gender affirming hormones. In this one week and one day, I have been the happiest I've been in my entire life. My family supports me fully and I am incredibly grateful. However, not everyone is as lucky as I am. Not all of my friends get the luxury of a supportive home life. Several of my loved ones who are not even out yet are called slurs by their parents regularly. If outed as a, as a direct result of this bill, many queer kids, including my friends, will be driven to self-harm or even commit suicide because of the parental abuse that will follow. Their blood is on your hands. Children will be kicked out because of this bill. Children will be beaten because of this bill. Children will be yelled at and abused because of this bill. Children will die because of this bill. Do you really care about protecting all children or just the ones that you understand? Even suppose that it is just a one month phase in a child's life, why is there something so inherently wrong about exploring and questioning? If a cisgender child can know that they are cisgender at my age, then why can't a trans child know? No one is being rushed into medical transition and I know this from firsthand experience. Additionally, the school cannot aid in medical transition, but they can aid in accepting transgender students, therefore lowering the rate that that child will commit suicide or self-harm by 40% according to the Trevor Project's research. We deserve basic respect. We deserve to be addressed how we prefer, whether or not it is what our parents prefer. We deserve to use the bathroom without being called a slur or having a stall door kicked down. We deserve to love, we deserve to experience joy, we deserve to express ourselves freely, and we deserve to grow old. I should not have to plead for a room full of adults not to drive ch children to suicide. If outed as a direct result of this, beer, of this bill, many queer kids, including my friends, will be driven to self-harm or even commit suicide because of the parental abuse. Ms. Owen's resolution could prevent children from being kicked out of their homes. Ms. Owen's resolution could prevent children from being abused. Ms. Owen's resolution could prevent children from committing suicide. 30 why, seconds. Why would we ever say no to it? Thank you. Our next speaker is Miranda White, then William Cezanne, then Osea Kolamafe. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Miranda White, and I'm here to speak to you this evening. Sometimes in the midst of any conversation, we can lose the point. Take something like going to prom, for example. 
What is a relatively simple affair can become a nebulous discussion of the color of the dress, the flowers of the corsage, the dinner before, the, sleep the sleepover after, and a million other details. Although these policies are obviously a heavier topic than a dance, I see the same exact issue occurring. We've become wrapped up in a wide-ranging debate discussing everything from constitutional rights to studies by the Trevor Project. Today, I'd like to reduce this discussion down to its simplest form, a basic question, if you will. What is the policy that makes our schools the best place to learn? Some critics of the current policies have argued that they distract teachers from their job and force them to act as interpreters of gender. This can be farther from the truth. The 2022 model guidelines will lead to the exact dystopia that defenders think they will prevent. They will force teachers to constantly deliberate on something that should be the easiest subject of the year, a student's name. These proposed policies allow for the use of any nickname commonly associated with the name that appears in the student's official record. But this is not enough to remove the teacher's inevitable turmoil. What, is a student, what if a student wants to go by more than their gender neutral middle name to reflect their gender identity? What if a student wants to shorten or alter their name for the same reasons? What if a student has a name that is commonly associated with them but not derived from their given name? And the most important question of all, why are our teachers and administrators forced to be the referees of this poorly thought out policy? In forcing our teachers to tell some students yes and others no, these policies undermine the stature of our great educators. We force them to draw an arbitrary line between what is and isn't a suitable name alteration, all for the stated purpose of marginalizing trans students. But it doesn't have to be that way. We don't have to put our teachers in an impossible situation. We don't have to ostracize so many students. And we don't have to embrace these policies, which never considered the schools they would affect. Continue with our current policies, the policies which have not hurt students, the policies which haven't hurt teachers and made their jobs harder, the policies which work for our schools. Thank you. Our next student is William Cezanne, then Olsia Komalafe, and then Jacob Cruz. Welcome. Hi, my name is Olushawa Komalafe, and I have come here tonight in support of Ms. Owens's proposition. During my time as a student in Virginia Beach City Public Schools, I've had the opportunity to meet and connect with many transgender classmates. I've had the wonderful chance to be friends with them too. In my experiences, I've been able to see firsthand the differences that a welcoming environment at schools can have. I've seen the ways in which usage of the correct pronouns and names have brought students out of their shells. I've seen how it can motivate them and encourage them to participate socially given the chance. I've also seen firsthand their fears. Fears of being targeted for, that, for their identity, for not being cisgender, or fear of abusive households and most recently, fear that their safe ha haven at school will be taken away. While recent years have seen, has seen remarkable progress in equality in the treatment of LGBTQ plus individuals, we cannot pretend that the issues of discrimination are left in the past. We cannot pretend that outing the transgender students in our school system will not come with a harsh negative impact. Enacting policies that forcefully out trans kids is not only ignorant to that discrimination, but empowering it. It is the job of the schools to protect the kids they educate. If a student showed clear signs of suffering from parental abuse, schools will notice and intervene. Why should trans students be left behind? Why shouldn't they have the same protective measures? I do not want to see my transgender classmates be forced into a decision of hiding their identity or potentially ruining their home life. That is a, that is a decision no student should be forced to make. When faced with the abhorrent reality of the statistics on suicide and homelessness against LGBTQ plus youth, we must do what is in our power to protect them from the forces of discrimination and abuse. Schools are designed to empower students, not harm them. Ms. Owens's proposition will ensure that our schools continue to fairly treat students and protect them all equally. It does not ask for much. It does not aim to change our school system. It only asks that this board defends the right of a marginalized community and defends them from harmful legislation. So myself and many others have come time and time again for the last few months to ask you to defend the transgender students of Virginia Beach, to simply protect their right of identity rather than abandon them. 
If schools wish to ensure that all students are treated equally and given an equal opportunity, they cannot weaken the rights of their transgender seconds. students. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jacob Cruz. Welcome. Good evening, board members. When I saw that there were over 100 people on the docket to speak tonight, I'm not gonna lie to you, I was worried. It's scary to me that Ms. Owen's resolution, a resolution seeking only to support queer youth, garnered such an uproar. I had hoped that it would be seen for what it is, a reasonable and moderate measure to save queer youth from discrimination. Unfortunately, that just doesn't seem to be the case. People have been misinformed and they're misinterpreting this resolution. We live in a time where something like this resolution, a simple statement against discrimination, is a source of controversy and discord. Board members, in two weeks, when this resolution is up for vote, this should be the easiest decision you make all year. This should be easier than approving the minutes from the previous meeting. This resolution is so modest that I can't even believe it's garnered a debate. It simply prevents VBCPS from adopting illegal or discriminatory policies in regards to queer students. That's it. Nothing about sports, nothing about bathrooms. If that is the fight that you're here to fight today, it's just not happening. That's not what Ms. Owen's resolution is about. There's not a single reason to vote against this resolution, but I can give you about 25 reasons why you should. 25 students sitting behind me, 25 students that are petrified by the unending transgressions made against the queer community. Notice that we don't just show up when there's something new to be outraged about or to get our licks in on our least favorite school board members. We are here because we go to school alongside our transgender peers every day and we know with every fiber of our being that they deserve fair treatment. We love our friends and we know that more needs to be done to protect them when we see the hate that is being poured onto them. So we lobby this board tirelessly to give us a resolution and thankfully Ms. Owens has done just that. Now that this resolution has arrived and with it a wave of Hope of furious opponents potentially, I'd like to remind the board that even when a resolution was absent, we still came. Even when we didn't think a resolution was imminent, we still came because we knew our friends needed us. They needed us to see, to see us care about them without faltering and we did so because our love for our friends doesn't falter. This resolution would assure that trans students have the same fair chance to learn and grow as any other student. It would be a pillar of support for every administrator, teacher, and student that puts the extra effort into making every student feel welcome. Simply put, it would show trans students that they are loved. That's all we want to do. I ask this board, which side are you going to take? Are you going to support us, those who have come and spoken consistently at every meeting for eight seconds. months out of a love and a care for our peers? Or are you going to support those who hastily come to try and take a swing at a resolution which has been misrepresented that wants nothing more than to stop discrimination? There are gonna be a lot of speakers tonight. Over a hundred, or about 111 on the docket, I believe. That's not good for any of our sleep schedules. So I'd like to apologize in advance because I know that next week, when this is up for a vote, us students are going to raise that number even higher. There can be no half measures when it comes to our friends' lives. Thank you. And that is time. Madam Chair, that was our last student speaker. Our next speakers will be Amber Thompson, Paula Chang, and then Dan Chang. Welcome. Good evening. I'm here specifically to speak on student safety as well as Jessica Owen's unnecessary and divisive resolution. If your mission statement reads that you put students first, why do we need a special resolution for a small subset of students? We should be putting every student first, which is not the case from what I've seen lately. You all preach school safety, yet nothing is being done. I have a friend who recently pulled her daughter from Corporate Landing Middle School due to being physically assaulted and emotionally abused via text to the point she was told to just kill herself. Do you care about those suicide stats too, Ms. Owens? After bringing it to the school's attention and really no accountability from you, Dr. Spence, nor the administration, she made the difficult decision to pull her from finishing the rest of the year to protect her since everyone else had failed her. This mom still has yet to hear back from you, Dr. Spence, nor the administration. I also was behind a bus yesterday morning and had to make a 911 call due to multiple fights breaking out and the bus driver being put in an unthinkable situation. There's a serious problem going on in our schools that is happening at all levels and it's being brushed off. Instead of distracting from the real issues at play here like our children's safety and trying to fall in line with current fads and trends, I urge you to come together and actually put all of our students first. For someone that preaches inclusivity, Ms. Owens, you sure are looking for ways to divide us constantly, whether it be within our schools or dividing the very relationship between a parent and a child. You and the majority of the school board alienated our children 
and spoke despairingly of them when we begged for masks to be removed. Yet now you want to be inclusive because it's the cool thing to do. I know your resolution may not spell out some of this because it's very vague, but none of us have been living under a rock. Why do we need a special resolution to reaffirm support when you should already be supporting each of these students? You are all, excuse me, you are all also attempting to keep parents in the dark because you think it somehow protects these students. Having involved parents is so important, however. Had my friend not worked so hard to have a come to us for anything relationship with her daughter, who knows what may have happened after receiving such damning texts. Your resolution clearly attempts to eliminate that support system. I urge you all not to vote in favor of this. I promise it won't make you homophobic, a bigot, or whatever the other keywords are that you're gonna hear nowadays. If we are really looking at equality, why are we making special resolutions for specific groups? The more you divide, the less inclusive it starts to feel. Right now, your school system is failing our children because of distractions like this. I've seen it firsthand. Our attention need not be focused on one small group, but every child seconds. in this district. If you want to emphasize your commitment to anyone, it better be for all of our students. I cannot stress enough the importance of parental involvement. What kind of example are you setting trying to keep us in the dark and brainwashing these kids into thinking it's normal? Thank God for moms like Tegan's because her involvement alone saved her after the vile text of entitled bullies that you continue to enable by ignoring the bigger issues. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paula Chang, Dan Chang, then Lindsay Bowen. I'm going to announce at this point, I'm um, directing staff to remove anyone with, who is failing to abide by my request for uh, decorum, those that are clapping. So I am going to ask that to be happening as of right now. Welcome. Um, point, point of inquiry. Um, Ms. Linetti, um, <clears throat> how do we motion for um, a disagreement? Because the individuals clapping on that particular occasion were not the same as the individuals clapping um, previously. And I don't know if they had just come in after that. When a chair makes a rule on the decorum, uh, violation of the decorum bylaw, you can, as a board, make a motion to override that. She makes the determination unless you make a motion and the rest of the board votes on it to override So it. are you asking that the people that just clapped be removed? I made that announcement. We have that decorum posted and people that sign up know that, given to them. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm going to motion that, um, what do you call it, Ms. Linetti? You would make a motion to override the chair's decision, but you might have to say what it is you want done. Okay. Um, I, I motion to override for that last instance of clapping because um, a lot of people have been coming in and out, and it was not the same individuals that were clapping before. I'll second that so we can discuss it real quick. Discussion? All I would point out is I don't, I don't think anybody has been identified to be kicked out, so we don't need to do anything. Does that sound fair? Say, I say that again. Sorry. Nobody has been identified to be removed. Uh, while I take her point, uh, there's no action to overrule here as I see it. Is that correct? Ms. James. Yes, I, I think he's asking you as chair, and I will ask you to clarify, you have not instructed anybody to be removed at this point. So the people that just quietly clapped are still going to be in here the remaining of the meeting. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And they are fairly warned at this point. But I have warned everyone at this point. Um, I will remove my motion then. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, can we return to the speakers now? Please do. Thank you. I have respect for, though fundamental disagreements with the students who speak here, for their youthful, energetic compassion to stand up for their belief, as do I and all I align with, that all individuals deserve respect. We all come here to express thoughts about resolutions, bylaws, ideas that we think are new and that we now think we're more enlightened than those who were here before us. The reality is that none of these ideas are new, they have all existed throughout history. 
As members of the school board, we expect you to know that it is the family which forms the basis of a strong society, and integral to that are the principles of morality and ethics as expressed through faith systems. One may not be a believer, yet should recognize the successful societal wisdom of such things as in the Ten Commandments that one does not kill, lie, or steal, or also that we do not commit adultery and we do honor parents for their wisdom, as these two specific commandments state the importance of the family for the child. We are foolish to think that these principles are outdated at all, because now we need wisdom in the experience of age, common sense, judgment, and the sum of all learning throughout the ages. When you all ran to sit on this dais, you in essence said you have the experience and wisdom to uphold, not tear down our society. Those of you who oppose these basic societal tenets, when you vote to tear apart, you are voting to tear apart the society by believing your ideas are superior to the wisdom of morality and history. You demand families and parents bend to your faulty thought. Over the years, we have watched the board work to place schools as superior in knowledge to parents as to what is right for their children. We saw the pressure to vaccinate children. We saw the board ridicule parents and citizens who opposed masking. Yet the world is starting to recognize the wisdom of those who stood in opposition. We see books in our libraries that many parents believe is wrong for their children. Yet you bullied and humiliated those who opposed those books. And amazingly, Ms. Anderson opposed reasonable new policies for books because of the work removing these books placed on library staff, thus essentially placing the school employees' needs as superior to the parental discernment for their own child. And Mrs. Anderson, this is on tape. We now see Mrs. Owens has proposed a resolution which is an attempt to do an end run against the model policies of Governor Yunkin. Why? Because Governor Yunkin's policies appropriately strengthen the rights of parents, families, and our society. An important question then is what motivates anyone on this dais to agree with those policies? It is not your job to unwisely weaken families and society by placing schools above family or to support political agendas or use schools as a social experiment. You and your administration have one job, to educate critical thinkers. To do this, you must use the wisdom and stand up for the society principles which have always strengthened parents, families, and our society. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dan Chang, Lindsay Bohan, and then Susan Loesberg. Welcome. Thank you. I respect the dedication and youthful enthusiasm of the student speakers. I do not hate you. I disagree with you. Though I have questions of what I have heard from them, not their belief in the value of each person, but in regards to some of the statements, it is reasonable that they can be challenged in debate. Many students stated they, that in developing the model policy, Governor Youngkin did not take input from the transgender community. Where, where is the data to support this? The governor held town hall meetings. He received over 70,000 comments from the public on the model policy. Students usually quote, quote the Trevor Project as a source of support uh, for emotional for the emotional effect of transgenderism. However, while there is a survey on the Trevor Project website, I find no actual scientific data that supports any of these comments. There have not been citations of scientific peer-reviewed data that shows that long-term effects of various transgender therapies psychologically and physically upon young people. The speakers ask that schools be required without parental approval to use transgender students' preferred name, likening the preferred name to common society called nicknames. They are not nicknames. Nicknames are recognized by all who know students, including students' parents and families. If not known by or hidden from the, fa if not known by or hidden from the family, it is not a nickname. It is a false, it is false to say otherwise, and we are deceiving not only the parents, but ourselves. Sadly, students call their birth name a dead name, though likely it was given to them with love. Their value under their birth name is not dead, but it is as alive and precious and valuable as they are now. I respect and use someone's preferred name as adults or with parental knowledge. We spent this weekend at a family event with a much loved niece and nephew who are at various degrees of their LGBTQ spectrum. 
They are wonderful young adults and now both request gender neutral names. One changed his name as a teenager with parental knowledge, the other most recently. 30 seconds. To our family, these are their names, not their nicknames. They do not have a dead name as they have always been valued. Our family did not need a resolution to work this out and most families do not. This school board does not need a resolution to do that either. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lindsay Bohan, then Susan Loesberg, then Patricia Gizinski. Welcome. Thank you. First, I oppose the proposal to have student representatives on the school board. We elected you. What added benefit will this bring? It is unnecessary. Our superintendent should be focusing on um, things like behavior issues, transportation, and the incredible staffing shortage. Second, I support the bylaw change addressing, um, that addresses protecting children from being exposed to sexually explicit and graphic content. I am one of the, the parents who did not opt my children out of the books for many reasons. Number one, I have three children in elementary school. Um, I volunteer in the library, I work closely with the librarians, and I have no need to opt my kids out at this point because they have no access to these questionable books. Also, it is nearly impossible to find this opt-out form. How is this process being publicized? Furthermore, currently the burden falls on parents to find books and opt them out individually. Librarians have spoken out against this proposed bylaw change, stating that it will take years to read through every book in their libraries. No, librarians are good at their jobs. You need a book about dinosaurs or a book by a particular author or about World War II, right this way. The same is true for the books with the sexually explicit content and topics. And I am not talking about The Diary of Anne Frank or To Kill a Mockingbird. When I toured Ocean Lakes High School for their Academy Open House, Flamer, Heartstopper, and I Am Jazz were on proud display as soon as I walked into the library for one of the sessions. They know exactly which books are in their libraries. The current process is cumbersome and not effective. The proposed bylaw change corrects that. Finally, I oppose the resolution Jessica Owens uh, is presenting tonight. We have got to find some middle ground here. Our positions are not fueled by hate. Surely there should be protections for all the students, including those in the LGBTQ community, and this, proposal, uh, this proposed resolution is not it. Why not wait and see what the actual policy will be? That's when the real discussion should take place. They are still reviewing the thousands of public comments that, come in throughout, that have come in throughout the state and have not released the final policy. The bottom line is parental rights and education was a hot topic in the 2021 election and Glenn Youngkin won. He won in Virginia Beach specifically. It was also a hot topic for the 2022 school board elections. Ms. Weems, Ms. Brown, Mr. Callan, and Mr. Culpepper won their districts and that speaks volumes. Ms. Melnick, 68% of your district, District 2, did not want you to win. You won because of a split vote, but still you represent those 68% of your constituents who would not support this resolution. Thank you. Our next speaker is Susan Loesberg and then Patricia Gazitsky. Good evening, board members. Welcome. I am here today to speak about school safety and ask the Virginia Beach City Public Schools to send home secure gun storage information to parents in first week packets and by email. What our kids are experiencing is unprecedented, a daily barrage of mass shootings. My daughters are the generation of Sandy Hook, Virginia Tech, Parkland, Uvalde, UVA, too many to count. Guns are being brought into our schools too often and our kids are getting hold of guns at home, causing injury and death. In January, we had a six-year-old in Newport News shoot and severely injure his teacher. In April, two three-year-olds died in two separate Hampton Road cities. And just yesterday, an eight-year-old was injured, all three, by unintentionally shooting themselves. How and why are two, three, six, and eight-year-olds able to access loaded firearms? We also must talk about teen suicide. While my daughter was attending Princess Anne High School a few years back, a student got hold of access to his parents' firearm and he killed himself with it. School systems in uh, Hampton Roads have recently been addressing school safety remedies that will hopefully reduce guns coming into our schools. But what is missing from all these plans is the least expensive deterrent and one that is proven to prevent our kids at school and at home from getting easy access to unsecured firearms. It is to remind parents 
to properly secure their guns. Firearms are the leading cause of death for children, teens, and young adults 24 years and under. I volunteer for um, Be Smart for Kids, a campaign that supports and promotes responsible gun ownership to reduce child gun deaths. I grew up in a gun-owning family. I understand the importance of gun safety. 4.6 million children in America live in homes with guns that are both loaded and unlocked. Three out of four school shooters used a firearm they took from a parent or a close relative's home. 90% of suicide attempts with guns result in a death, a much higher fatality rate than any other means of self-harm. Organizations such as the American Academy for Pediatrics, the United States Department of Veterans Affairs, and countless police departments and city governments across the country now know that educating the public on secure gun storage saves lives. An email was sent home to parents at Bay Bayside High School after a student recently was found with a loaded gun asking parents to remind students not to bring weapons to school. What was not said and we know could substantially reduce guns from coming into school was to remind parents to securely store their firearms. We all want to keep our kids safe and alive. We know that easy access to firearms is killing and injuring our children, teachers, school staff, police, and the ripple effect also produces community trauma. Secure, secure gun storage saves lies. And I that know is this time. firsthand because it saved my 17-year-old nephew's time. Life. Our next speaker is Patricia Gazinski. Welcome. Welcome. Good evening, Superintendent Spence and members of the school board. Thank you for your hard work and service to our community. My name is Pat Gazinski. I am glad that our group is here to speak to you during Teacher Appreciation Week because I am grateful for all of the great educators who provided my three now grown kids with an excellent education here in the VB schools. I continue to believe we have the best of the best here in Virginia Beach, and one of them is my beloved daughter-in-law. Her safety here in our schools is my priority and my reason for being here tonight. I want to provide her with a sense of security and safety from firearms I, and because we can provide a program to keep our schools safe. I am not here to ask for more school resource officers, armed guards, I don't want more police. I want you to consider a program that has no cost to our school board, is a volunteer effort, and has been, been designed to save lives. It is called Be Smart for Kids. We are not here to debate about politics or laws. We are here to ask that we talk about guns and our responsibility as gun owners to prevent access to our firearms by children. Be Smart is not controversial and it has been adopted by school systems here in Virginia and across the country. It will help prevent harm to our teachers, staff and students with a message about secure storage of firearms. Be Smart for Kids was started in 2015 and is designed to prevent 350 children a year from in unintentionally shooting themselves or someone else when they find unlocked loaded guns. More than 700 children die by gun suicide each year. The number one killer of children and teens in America is gun violence. Our public health crisis of gun violence is not going to be solved by one action, but what we can do is to advocate for safety in our schools by promoting the message within our Virginia Beach school community that is, is the responsibility of adults to protect our children and teens from harm by preventing their access to firearms. Be Smart reminds us that as gun owners, we are responsible for our guns to be securely stored, locked, unloaded, and separate from ammunition. Putting your gun up on a shelf in a closet or in a drawer is not securing it. Recent tragic events are the result of children having access to unsecured firearms. Newport News is reeling after a first grader brought his mother's gun to school and acted in anger, changing his teacher's life forever. The ripple effect of that one act ha has devastating effects that are measured in mental health issues in teachers, staff, children, their families, and the community at large. Bringing our message to all families here in Virginia Beach will go a long way to reassuring families, teachers, staff, and Virginia Beach that our schools are going their very, doing their very best to keep our loved ones safe. My daughter-in-law and her colleagues deserve that. Please adopt Be Smart for Kids into your school system. Thank you. Madam Chair, want to do a time check? Yes, the, um, the time is for us to stop public comment now, and we're going to go to information. We will come back after the public information of A, B, C, and D. So our first 
item on information is summer learning update. So welcome Dr. Kip Rogers, Chief Academic Officer, and Dr. Lorena Kelly, Executive Director, Elementary Teaching and Learning. And I believe Ms. Kelly is going to be giving this presentation. Good evening, Chairwoman Riggs, Vice Chair Weems, school board members, and Dr. Spence. This evening, I'm here with my colleague, Natalie Meggs, Coordinator of Military, Connect Military Connected Academic Support Programs, and we'll provide you with an overview of our summer learning opportunities for Virginia Beach students. I'm happy to announce that we're continuing the robust summer learning opportunities that we provided last year. We have opportunities for all of our kindergarten through 12th grade students to accelerate student learning and provide a strong start for the 23-24 school year. I will begin with elementary. Like last summer, all students, kindergarten through fifth grade, will have access to the summer learning booth site, which will go live on July 1st. Any student who is currently enrolled as a pre-K through five student in Virginia Beach for the 22-23 school year will be able to access the Virginia Beach City Public School summer learning booth site, which contains weekly numeracy and literacy lessons throughout the month of July via class link. Each week, we will release, release new lessons so students can log on and click on the lesson that they'd like to do, which will reinforce, reinforce their key skills and concepts from the previous school year to ensure that they have the opportunity for additional review before entering the next grade level. The lessons are aligned, engaging, and asynchronous so that they can be viewed and completed at a time that fits into the family's schedule. In addition, parent videos are posted each week to explain the learning intentions and focus of each lesson so parents understand what the purpose of learning is and they can also extend the learning in other ways. Summer learning camps are held at select sites. All Title I schools will implement summer learning camps and 25 additional elementary schools will, element, will also implement summer learning camps for a total of 40 schools. The same four and a half hour structure will be used as last year. We're gonna to continue to focus on literacy and numeracy, and we've enhanced inquiry through some content integration. English language learners are also participating at the 40 summer learning camp sites, and we'll have English as a second language teachers there to support. Schools that are not implementing summer learning camps are provided with tutoring funds to support summer learning programs and activities that are designed to serve their student populations. And they will provide those learning opportunities between July 5th and August 4th. For secondary summer school opportunities, we will have repeat face-to-face -face course, course offerings, first-time course offering, and boosts. For middle school students who need to repeat a course for promotion, they will report to either Independence Middle School or Salem Middle School based upon a cluster model. There will be two face-to-face -face sessions, one from Wednesday, June 28th through July 17th, and a second from July 18th through August 2nd. In high school, students who need a repeat course will report to either Green Run High or Princess Anne based again on clusters. And like middle school, there will be those two face-to-face -face sessions, Wednesday, June 28th through July 17th and July 18th through August 2nd. Secondary English, English sec as a second language summer school will also be offered to our current middle and high school students of any English learners who have a proficiency level of a 1 to a 1.9. And um, English as a second language teachers may also recommend students who have a proficiency level of 2 or 2.9. These students would be registered by their ESL teachers and they will, both high school and middle school students will attend at Salem or Independence Middle Schools through June, 20, June 28th through July 20th. For the first-time virtual course offerings, students who plan to take the fir a first-time course will utilize the Virginia Beach Digital Campus, the VBDC, and the course session is Tuesday, June 21st through Monday, August 7th. It's important for me to note that these courses are a full year, and that's why there's a lengthier time frame needed in order to cover all the course content. Registration for both programs, the face-to-face -face repeat sessions and the first-time coffee uh, course offerings began on, on, the, on May 1st, and Virginia Beach Digital Campus will have their uh, registration close on June 15th, and the face-to-face -face registration will close on June 21st. 
parents will continue to, to utilize RegWorks uh, web store for the registration and the payment. Additionally, there are gonna continue to be the Summer Learning Boost courses that are offered via Canvas. This summer, we're exploring an opportunity for our rising seventh and eighth graders at Bayside Middle School. They'll have the opportunity to engage in AVID Mission Possible Science Summer Bridge Program. For Mission Possible, students will, have, be, will be able to engage in hands-on science to develop critical thinking and scientific problem solving skills and make science fun. They're gonna track a scientist around the world and on this virtual journey, they're gonna perform scientific investigations in biology, chemistry, physics, environmental science, and math, all related to the geographic areas where they will follow the scientists. Most students with disabilities receive the majority of their special education services in the general education setting. Therefore, many of them will have the opportunity to participate in the general education summer programs offered by the school division. Some students will receive extended school year or ESY services. Consideration of ESY services is part of the IEP process. These services are the individualized extensions of specific special education and related services that are provided beyond the typical school year. ESY services may be delivered through a variety of settings and methods. It is a continuum of services. The IEP team will determine the setting and method based on the needs of the students. Some students with disabilities will receive classroom-based ESY services at cluster sites. For the summer of 2023, there will be eight elementary cluster sites and one high school cluster site, and that will serve both middle and high school students. Students receiving services through CSEP will receive ESY services at one of the elementary cluster sites and Renaissance Academy. So as you can see, we're continuing to provide a variety of summer learning opportunities, and thank you for your support of these opportunities. This concludes this presentation. Any questions? Yes, Ms. Owens. This is just a quick one. Uh, I asked the same thing last year. Uh, are we, all of our elementary, all of our students taking their Chromebooks home for the summer to be able to access these programs or is there something different in the, the works for how that's going to happen? So we do have a slightly different um, situation this summer. We are, um, students will be provided access, but they're not all going to take them home. It'll be through a process of the schools, the, the Chromebooks will remain at the schools and they'll have to work with the schools to get a checkout because kids were taking them even if they were transitioning to middle schools and things like that. So we're, um, we're going to reorganize that, but students will have access. So just for my clarification, they'll be able to fill out a, an application or something and request to check it out for the summer. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. I want okay. To right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Franklin. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Um, I wanted to ask, how um, could we find out about registration uh, deadlines and all of those different things? Is it all posted on the website? Yes, it, it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Weems. Um, yes, thank you. Can, uh, will you confirm that transportation is available? Is yes. that correct? Yes. Okay. And then also, um, for cost, is, is there a cost, like, for the learning camps at the elementary? No, there's no cost for the elementary. It's different in secondary, but there's no cost for the elementary. Okay, so, so middle and high school, there may be a cost, and that's correct? Yes. Okay. I don't know what the exact costs are, but okay. I know that they do. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Any, anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Nice. B federal grant application. Again, um, Dr. Lorena Kelly, executive director, will be presenting this to us. For the, she's the elementary teaching and learning. Yes, good evening again. This evening I will provide you with the 2023-2024 federal grant application for programs under, uh, authorized under the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965 as amended by the Every Student Succeeds Act of 2015. Federal guidelines require school board approval of these grant applications, and the Virginia Department of Education has established the application deadline of July 1st for, the 20, for 2023. 
This slide provides an overview of the past, current, and projected funding amounts for each grant. The final 2023-24 award amounts for all grants will be determined at a later date. Level funding amounts based on current year awards are used for the purpose of developing the 23-24 grant budgets. The Title I Part A grant is anticipated for just under $13 million. This application was prepared and schools were selected to be Title I schools using Community Eligibility Provisions, or CEP, data reports. The Title I Part A fund provides additional financial assistance to schools with high percentages of children from low-income families to help ensure that all children meet challenging state academic content and achievement standards. The 2324 application includes Title I and pre-K support staff and resources, instructional staffing allocations beyond the division allocations. Such positions include additional literacy leaders, math coaches, instructional administrative assistants, school, school counselors, behavior intervention teachers, assistants, gifted resource teacher, an ESL teacher, and a social worker. Professional learning for instructional staff and family engagement supports and initiatives are also included in this application. Additional funding for instructional supplies and resources, tutoring, field trips, and summer programs are included in the grant application. A memo dated May 2, 2023 was sent to the board with the administration's recommendations for the schools to receive Title I funding for the 23-24 school year. The Title I Part D Neglected, Delinquent, or At-Risk Youth Grant is anticipated for just over $183,000. The purpose of the Title I Part D grant is to improve educational services for neglected and delinquent children and youth under the age of 21 in correctional facilities and for other at-risk populations to prepare them for the secondary school, for secondary school completion, training, employment, and further education. In addition, the funds are used to support students residing in delinquent facilities to support the transition of students from those facilities and the Virginia Beach Juvenile Detention Center back to Virginia Beach City Public Schools, including Renaissance Academy, and to support dropout prevention programs. The Title II Part A grant is anticipated for just over $2 million. The purpose of the Title II Part A grant is to increase academic achievement for all students through improving teacher quality. This grant will fund 19 instructional coaches as either literacy leaders or math coaches to serve as instructional coaches in elementary, middle, and high schools. Funds will also be used to support cohorts of teachers in reading and math specialist endorsement programs. Private, not-for-profit schools located within the school division's geographic boundaries are eligible to receive services in collaboration with the school division. The Title III Part A grant is anticipated at just over $230,000. This grant is utilized to fund the salary and benefits of an English learner instructional specialist. This specialist assists English as a second language teachers and classroom teachers with instructional support, as well as provides professional learning for English as a second language and classroom teachers. The grant also provides funding for educators to attend professional learning relative to English learners and best practices. The 23-24 application includes funds to support stipends for English learner family engagement liaisons and to support family engagement activities. Additionally, the grant will fund Elevation, which is a digital platform that allows teachers and administrators access to English learner student data, supports digital meetings for student accommodation planning and monitoring purposes, and provides federally mandated documents in multiple languages. Finally, funds are allocated to private schools who choose to participate in Title III and have identified English learners. The Title IV Part A grant is anticipated at $897,247. This grant in, is intended to improve students' academic achievement by increasing the division's capacity to provide all students with access to a well-rounded education, to improve school conditions for student learning, and to increase the effective use of technology. Aligned to the school division's strategic action agenda, the Title IV Part A application includes, but is not limited to, providing materials, resources, and training to support students' mental, physical, and cognitive development. The grant also prioritizes integrated systems of support through graduation labs and lab coaches, professional learning aligned with evidence-based reading instruction, and tutoring to increase academic achievement. That concludes all of the grants that we are uh, submitting applications for at this time. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Um, colleagues, if you, we, we've lost a few people, so um, um, if you have any questions, please 
Um, all right, Mr. Callan. I tried to hang with this very detailed report in reference to, let me make sure that I refer to it correctly. It's Title I, Part A. Being unfamiliar with it and trying to become familiar with it, I waded my way through the, I think it was Type II font. I'm not sure if it was even one, but it was pretty tiny font. But I got to page 29 mm -hmm. in the detailed section, and I saw that the category was entitled letter K, Reduction of Exclusionary Discipline Practices. Hmm. Goes on to say, in support of our division's strategic plan, VBCPS provides multi-tiered systems of supports for students to reduce the discipline practices that remove them from the classroom. Hmm. Staff are trained on proactive approaches to teach expected behaviors and conflict resolution. Disaggregated discipline data is reviewed by central office staff, administrators, and school leadership teams to identify trends and develop actionable responses. It goes on to say they collaborate with the school team selected by administration to implement proactive strategies to meet the needs of all learners and strategically identify areas of need and actionable steps. From an outsider, I'm not an outsider, but from a new person on the board becoming familiar with things of this nature, it struck me as a possibility, and I don't want to be accusatory, I'm really curious. It seemed as though there was a way of saying, in exchange for this grant, reduce the times you exclude kids from the classroom because of discipline problems. And the only reason I feel that that might be what seems to be somewhat implied, and it's not specifically stated, but it seems to be implied, is the fact that you talk to teachers and one of the difficult challenges that surround their daily tasks is maintaining discipline in a classroom. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious as to how you can deepen my understanding of this grant, that particular section, and this verbiage so that I can just grow more familiar with the process. Thank you for asking that question. So with the federal grants, particularly with Title I grants, they are designed to, to add, if you will, if you have cupcakes, uh, the, the Title I grant provides sprinkles to go on top of the cupcakes to, to supplement things that are already in place at different schools. So the language that you saw uh, is language that we have to include in the federal grants to measure success by. One of the things that we do with the uh, grant funds is to provide opportunities for schools to get um, better at things that they want to get better at. So for example, our schools create uh, school improvement plans, and part of those plans are designed to uh, increase student um, account student success relative to academics as well as to uh, improve, improve student behavior. One of those things that we do in the school di district to improve student behavior is we have um, a tier sy tiered systems of support um, that is designed to uh, meet students where they are. Uh, for example, all students have access to um, tier one supports. So in other words, uh, schools have um, plans in place to support student behavior. We have tier two systems of support which are designed to level up from those uh, behaviors in order to assist those students. So with federal grants, uh, particularly with Title I, those funds are designed to support, particularly with our um, staff, we have uh, school behavior uh, support staff. You want to add some yeah, to that? Some. We have school student support staff designed to help our students with behavior. So that language that you saw in that is used for um, when we ha have federal grants that are um, evaluated. Uh, the data that we collect for uh, out of school suspension, I believe, I don't remember exactly the verbiage that you just read, but that is. Um, designed to decrease the amount of out-of-school suspensions that we have uh, in our schools. It's not uh, 
create it to, um, I can't remember the, what you exactly said relative to uh, an exchange for the grant, but we have to write the grants uh, such that they are uh, measurable outcomes for the manner in which we choose to uh, spend the funds. So you want to add to sure. that? Sure. Sure. Mr. Cowan, as I hear the question, one of the things you've probably seen in several of our discipline presentations this year is we have not seen a significant decrease in discipline actions that we've taken at the school level. So I share that with you because that answers the question, is that going to affect our funding if we aren't showing that decrease in discipline? The examples I'll give you of some of the things that we use to assist schools would be the example of the 10 elementary school student support specialists that we've added this year as a response to the behavior issues we are hearing from teachers and administrators and the supports they needed. So we can use some of that funding for training, resource staff, to help address proactively some of the behavioral situations to support our teachers, not to send the message that we're looking to reduce or have data that supports getting the money. I hope that makes sense. But well, that's, that's my concern, as you might have sensed from the question that I raised. And uh, it causes me to be alarmed if that is, in fact, an indication of how the process is unfolding. Correct. We have a strategic plan goal and an action agenda goal to try to reduce misbehavior in classrooms. Uh, we firmly don't believe that means by ignoring the behavior and saying don't document that or support teachers because we know the impact that has on learning. So that message does not go hand in hand as if we're, we will not receive this funding if we don't do something just to lower the numbers. We looked at more from a proactive range of for students to learn, they gotta be in the best possible learning environment. And to do that, we can use some of this funding to support that through a variety of ways, including teacher training or assisting with additional staff. And Title I gives us that, that opportunity. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Milnick. So my question is about Title I Part D. Um, what determines the amount of funding that we receive? Um, I see in 2020, 21, that the number was 264,000. Was it higher then because of COVID or um, have we seen, I mean, there was a $122,000 drop the next year um, we're up a little bit this time, but Mr. Larkin is going to come up and answer that question for you. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, funding is based uh, on the top, I believe it's the top 12 divisions in the state of Virginia for the number of delinquent students that they, they have residing in the city limits. And that funding is based on tax revenue that comes from the federal government and is then divided amongst the top 12 divisions in Virginia we tend to be one of the top two or three divisions in Virginia in terms of the funding that we receive. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. I mean, we'd like to see no funding then, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah. And it'd be great if you all live next door to us so we could knock on your door and ask these questions, right, Mr. Kellen? <laughs> okay, uh, anyone else? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're on information um, item C, bylaw discussion on student representative to the school board. Uh, gonna have, Chair, um, Chair yes. Riggs, um, I'm going to make a motion to go ahead and we have, uh, Ms. Linetti was nice enough to pass out the shortened uh, bylaw and we're going to ask that we send this back to PRC for their review on Thursday. Uh, again, if everybody will take a look at that reduced um, bylaw and, and so that we can just get this discussion moving. Um, I think I, I've heard all the concerns. I'm, I think Ms. Owens has heard all the concerns and I are, Ms. Owens, am I correct in that we're in agreement on that to send it back and uh, to, uh, to the PRC and to be presented there. Thank you. So, Ms. Linetti, you want to read it? You want me to explain what we did? Yes. If you, Go ahead. Okay. If you're looking at what is in this school board agenda package, the initial recommendation to have a bylaw 1-7 that would be student representative to the school board, 
After discussion and workshop, it was decided maybe the better course of action would be to have a simple bylaw and then take the other details of how we would get student representatives, how the process would work, the eligibility for those students, the duties and responsibilities for those student representatives, and put them in a policy or regulation. So what I did between workshop and presenting here is I took essentially what is the first paragraph that you are seeing in agenda package on bylaw one, which is a purpose, turned that into a by, just a bylaw that would be bylaw 1-7. I took everything else with some modifications that based on what you talked about in workshop, created a policy 5-5, also uh, would be titled student representative to the school board. So section five in your policy is students, is that where we anticipated we would eventually put a policy or regulation, split them out. There are a couple tweaks on the policy based on some of the information you presented. That would then have to go back to PRC. I did see Mr. Sutton in the hall tell him we need to get this with, to Mrs. Manning and take a look at it. So it essentially looks the same, but it would be a shortened bylaw, and then we could tweak through with PRC some of the details that you discussed on the policy. Any, qu any questions? Okay, so we're asking to uh, withdraw this and bring, uh, send it to policy. So we're going to need a motion. Yes. yes so I'm, I'm making a motion that we withdraw from information right now uh, for, so that we can take it back to policy review. I believe they're meeting on Thursday, and that way they can review this. Um, uh, what is it? Shortened by law. by law, yes. Okay. Uh, so that we can bring this to the board later. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Okay, so the motion has been made by Ms. Franklin to uh, take remove this, take it back to policy review on Thursday for them to review the shortened abridged version of this bylaw. Seconded by Mrs. Um, Owens. Is there any discussion? Ms. Manning. Yes, yeah, so as I'm reading this, we just got this, um, and it basically tells the superintendent to create all the language for the policy and regulation. And it doesn't address anything that I said in the workshop, any of my concerns. And we already have an agenda for our PRC tomorrow, um, or Thursday. Thursday, I'm sorry. Um, so, I mean, we, while we can add it to the PRC, you know, I, I, I can't guarantee that we're gonna be able to consider everything that was said in the workshop on this meeting. Um, I. I firmly believe that we need to establish the rules and qualifications and what's going to happen in the bylaw because that's what governs what we do on this board. We don't create policies to govern what we do on the board and our actions. We create bylaws. So I feel like I, I, I feel like this is just handing it off to the superintendent to do it, and I just don't support that. But I'm happy for, to take it back to PRC to have a discussion. Ms. Brown. Um, so I do also, um, you know, I still share the same concerns that we talked about over the phone and um, in the workshop. Um, however, <clears throat> as a member of the policy review committee, I will most certainly um, take into account um, the language that is desired and um, we can move it forward to um, a vote. But um, I would like a little more direction um, from Jessica and Jennifer about which changes you would be okay with and then we can clean it up um, and we, we can talk. Um, I'll call you guys or something. Absolutely, and, and I apologize. I mean, uh, Miss Lenetti was nice enough to put something together just so we had uh, something to review, but certainly we will be in touch, and I believe Ms. Owens and I can definitely uh, speak with the PRC as well about uh, adjusting, because we, we've made plenty of notes, and we will certainly make those notes and uh, make sure that we have a, um, a bylaw that is going to be um, representative of the discussion that we've had. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Culpepper. I'm sorry, Ms. Weems and then Mr. Culpepper. Um, yes, I, I would just ask the PRC and, and remind my colleagues that this was brought up 
by a school board member. It is a school board, a, a representative to the school board. The superintendent has his advisory group of students. So I feel too that, that the, this needs to be school board driven. That, and so the PRC, just um, I hope that you remember that. Thank you. Okay, and Mr. Culpepper? Yeah, I'm essentially reiterating the same point. That's how I feel. I mean, passing a, uh, a change to bylaw that is essentially a blank check for the uh, to be filled in later doesn't appeal to me. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, anybody else? Anyone else? Okay, so we have a motion to remove this tonight into further discussion. Bring it forward to the policy review committee on Thursday with a little bit more information from Mrs. Franklin and Mrs. Um, Owens. And uh, we will also incorporate looking at this as being uh, directed by the school board, okay? Everybody okay? All right, so I need to, uh, all in favor of this motion, please raise your hand. Yes, uh -huh. all in favor of this motion, please raise your hand. We have 11 ayes, the motion did pass. Okay, thank you. So we're going to, uh, we're now on D, the resolution from a school board member. And before uh, I ask Ms. Owens to speak, I have a statement to make, please. Do we need it? Do we need it? As many of you know, there's a re resolution on the information agenda tonight and it has come to my attention that incorrect information has been disseminated to the public about this information item leading to misunderstandings and potential harm. The social media post re read as follows, Virginia Beach School Board proposing to allow boys to compete in girls sports and to reject Governor Youngkin's policies on transgender students. I want to apologize for any confusion this may have caused. The fact is that the topic of VHSL participation rules is not on the agenda. The fact is that decisions made regarding student athletes and participation requirements are made by the Virginia High School League, the VHSL, not the school board. The VHSL is the principal sanctioning organization for interscholastic athletic competition among public high schools in the Commonwealth of Virginia. The school board follows the rules of the Virginia High School League or similar organizations for participation in competitive sports and activities governed by those organizations. For other activities, the school board follows regulation 5-7.1C for participation in school activities and events. Thank you. Ms. Owens. Thank you. So, since September, we've heard from students and parents, teachers, community members, really, they've said everything that I could say and more They've advocated more eloquently than, than I can. And as one of our student speakers today, Hope, mentioned, it's nerve-wracking when you have that level of responsibility. And so I, I appreciate their advocacy despite the nerves. And they inspire me to advocate despite the nerves. They've made it very clear with research that we all have access to, that having a safe place in schools where students can feel valued and equal improves educational outcomes. And as a school board, that part seems like a no-brainer. That's our goal. It decreases suicide. That's important to a board, particularly a board that recently took our mental health task force that I appreciate uh, allowing to, to move forward, but taking it to a standing committee because of our district's commitment to mental health. It decreases substance abuse. That's important, I assume, to a board who's discussing creating a, a whole new school program of a recovery school in regards to substance abuse. And so if we're able to take those steps by affirming 
our commitment to what we are already doing, that seems like not that difficult a decision to make. In addition to the parents, teachers, and community members who've come and speak, spoken at the meetings and reached out uh, to me individually and probably to many of you, uh, teachers have reached out and, and they have questions. They wanna know if they're gonna be given additional responsibilities and tasks of tracking down parents every time a child wants to use a nickname, anytime they suspect a relationship has changed, anytime they suspect uh, an identity uh, exploration. Teachers have a difficult time making contact with parents. They do it for the educational things that they're required to do. Putting something else on their plate and not knowing how that's going to be received by the parents, whether they're going to get a hostile response, how that's going to impact the relationship of the parent with the teacher or the teacher's relationship with the student is a consideration. Like uh, the chair mentioned, I'm, I'm aware that there's misinformation circulating on social media, and I hope that we're gonna be able to clarify that at today's meeting. Um, this resolution really is simply a statement emphasizing the division's commitment to valuing diversity and affirming the commitment to abide by state and federal laws regarding discrimination. This resolution is not a policy. It does not propose that any rules in the district change. Uh, I'm aware that some in the community are under the impression that the goal is to change the sports participation and as has been explained, that's not the case. The district participates in VHSL sports. We're bound by those rules and regulations set forth by VHSL. VHSL already has processes in place and outlined for participation by transgender athletes and local school districts also don't have the authority to alter that. Our district already is in the process of making single use stalls available uh, in, in schools and we currently abide by court precedents for bathroom use. I, I'm anticipating that the superintendent and the school board attorney will be able to kind of reiterate that this resolution doesn't change anything that the district is currently doing. This resolution was brought forth based on the concerns of students and the community members feeling uncertain about the district's position toward LGBTQIA plus youth in education. This board routinely passes resolutions for items like Hispanic heritage, women's history, military children, nurse appreciation, all resolutions that are emphasizing what we already do and what we already value as a district, not putting out new policies or asking for change in those resolutions. Those resolutions emphasize our ideals and typically we're recognizing groups that have been either previously marginalized or need some additional support and those resolutions pass with little to no discussion. The fact that having a resolution presented that states that the division is gonna follow state and federal laws is bringing out record numbers of public comment certainly, to me, validates why this resolution and affirmation is needed. And so I, I will go ahead and just read the resolution um, and then I'd like to ask uh, for Dr. Spence to weigh in on how this might impact the district. Whereas VBCPS believes that every student is entitled to an education that is responsive to one's unique needs to reach their full potential and that all individuals have the right to a safe physical, emotional, and social environment where responsibility and respect are demonstrated daily and where students are engaged in learning and are active participants in the school community because they feel accepted and valued. And whereas VBCPS, in accordance with its strategic plan, will continue to foster and build positive relationships between staff, parents, and students. And whereas VBCPS encourages staff, parents, and students to respect differences, value the diversity of our school community, and express themselves in a manner that is reflective of our core values and beliefs, 
and promotes equitable education for all students of varying needs. And whereas VBCPS is committed to eliminating all forms of unlawful discrimination in the educational environment, accordingly, no student shall be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any VBCPS education program or activity based on sex, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, gender expression, or any other characteristic protected by state or federal law. And whereas existing state and federal law, federal statutory and case law, affirms the rights of both parents and guardians and students on issues of privacy, and the right to freedom from discrimination under Title IX, Title VII, and the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, and whereas, according to the Trevor Project, suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people. Uh, as stated by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention 2020, with LGBTQ plus youth being four times more likely to, cons to seriously consider suicide to make a plan for suicide and to attempt suicide than their peers. And whereas LGBTQ plus youth who found their school to be LGBTQ plus affirming reported lower rates of attempting suicide. And whereas LGBTQ plus youth who live in a community that is accepting of LGBTQ plus people reported significantly lower rates of attempting suicide than those who do not. And whereas existing policies in VBCPS create welcoming learning environments and align with division core values and beliefs and state and federal statutory and case law, and whereas VBCPS is committed to engendering respect for the abilities and accomplishments of all people and to provide governance free from any practices or policies which, if enacted, would violate state and federal law and go against the school division's core values, now therefore be it resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach affirms, supports, and values each of our students and will continue to further our efforts to create a welcoming, safe, and inclusive learning environment providing protections for all students, regardless of sex, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, gender expression, or on any other characteristic protected by state or federal law. And be it further resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach will adopt no policies in violation of state or federal law that would impede our ability to provide these guaranteed protections to our students and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of the board. And so, I guess at this point, well, I don't see the controversial nature in following federal and state laws. I am certainly open to dialogue and I'm looking forward to hearing from the rest of our speakers. But I wanna have realistic conversation about what this means. So I, I'll we'll yield, thank you. Okay, did you ask for a response from Dr. Spence right before you started reading it? Yes, please. Okay, Dr. Spence. Well, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not sure what response um, I'm, I'm being asked about other than was it, were there, were there, would there be impacts on the division with this policy? I think the policy particularly states that existing policies are already aligned with state and federal statutory and case law and would, would simply provide direction that the division won't um, work with policies that are in violation of those things. Um, I, if the specific question is just around athletics, because I know that's come up, I can speak briefly to that. So the, uh, the division's um, competitive sports are governed by the Virginia High School League and uh, their policies and regulations. That we, there's a process, as was noted, that's already in place for um, transgender students who express a desire to play on a team of their preferred uh, gender. That's a waiver process that goes through a district committee and then ultimately has to be approved by the VHSL. 
Um, and so, and there's uh, forms and a number of attestations that come along with that. Those forms are all available. Anybody in the public can see them there on the VHSL website. You can go there and look them up so you can see the various requirements for somebody who may be seeking such a waiver um, to include um, information from the family, from physicians and others who are caring, uh, participating in care for that uh, student. Uh, and so there's a, a lot of information that you can find on the VHSL website about that, but this does not address that um, as far as I can tell at all. There's nothing in here about athletics. And I think if anybody was uh, looking at um, any of the model policies, including the 2021 model policies on which VBCPS's current policies are um, essentially modeled, or even the um, 2022 model policies, which um, as noted have been proposed but not not yet um, finalized in the wake of the 70,000 plus comments that were received that they have to resolve. Those, both of those model policies said that athletics was excluded from this conversation. So athletics are not a part of the conversation around these model policies. So probably need to set the athletics piece aside. That's kind of a settled matter at the moment relative to our work with VHSL. Um, of course, VHSL is continuing to get legal advice around their policies and uh, will follow whatever the state and federal laws require of them as well. So, Cami, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. I, I did want to comment that the Biden administration has put out um, proposed regulations similar to what you saw with the model guidelines, that the federal guidelines are out to talk about how do you handle athletics. And actually, the proposal, if you read it for these regulations on athletics, is that you could determine, a school division could determine that a gender or a specific biological sex was important to a athletic event. If you determine it was necessary for the educational or opportunity of that event that that basis are beyond the, the biological sex, you could make that determination. You also have to take into consideration whether there are other opportunities based on what your biological sex is to be able to participate. So actually the federal government level, they are, in, they are looking at recognizing that in some circumstances the school division can make those decisions. Again, they're not promulgated at this point, but it's not an automatic that the federal government is going to tell you that you have to do that. If these rules go in, you will have that opportunity to make the determination at the school division level. Obviously it's going to impact VHSL also, but you will have that opportunity to determine if it's appropriate for that activity. And there are some sports where that may be an activity. So it's not automatic that the federal government is going to tell you that the student picks which um, area that they get to participate in. So again, the federal law is changing a little bit in this area too. There are a lot of things that are coming out right now on the issues involving athletics. Wait, wait. Okay, um, anybody have a question on what Ms. Linetti just said? So, I had my hand raised. We use the word activity. I had my hand raised. This act, yeah. Was that, oh, well, I'll, I'll yield to her, but this was just in reference to what she said. What do you want me to In say? reference to Ms. what Ms. Linetti just said. Go ahead. What, what is You're using, you're using okay, you've got a couple phrases going on here. When the Virginia General Assembly passed Virginia Code 22.1, 23.3, which is the treatment of transgender students and policies, it directed the Virginia Department of Education to develop model policies covering a couple different types of areas involving transgender students. Within one of those definitions, it specifically says activities and events do not include athletics. They recognize that. So when you saw the 2021 model policies come out, they said that. And again, that's what the proposal in the 2022, but again, the 2022 are not in effect right now. So that says that it doesn't include athletics. Now, Mrs. Owen's resolution doesn't specifically address those model policies. So you don't automatically, you'd have, you have to make the connection between activities. If you're referring to the model policies or this statute, it does say that, but this statute doesn't say, acti doesn't define activities. It tell this statute, 22.1, 23.3, tells the Virginia Department of Education in your model policies don't, only address activities. Mrs. Owens is not actually addressing in her regulation the model policy. So you might have to be a little careful with your activities, clarifying where you're going with the activities. Okay, Ms. Manning. Thank you. And Madam Chair, I respectfully disagree with your opening statement. That is your interpretation and you have a right to your view. 
but I interpreted, interpreted the resolution very differently, as did many members of the community that I consulted with on this resolution. Um, we already have non-discrimination policies for all of our students, including our LGBT students, and I support those policies that state we won't discriminate against anyone, including the LGBT BT students. First, as we have even heard from students this evening, um, it seems that this resolution would be indicating that Governor Yunkin's model policies will not be adopted by this board. I do not support rejecting Governor Yunkin's policies, especially since we haven't even seen the final approved policies. Second, when I read this resolution, I interpret par paragraph five, quote, no student shall be excluded from participation in any VBCPS education program or activity based on their gender identity or gender expression. Um, and so, first of all, gender expression isn't a term that I've heard used before in policy such as this, so we may have to define that a little further. Um, but um, an activity to me does include sports. And VHSL does not govern our middle school sports. So that is a factor here. And I have the VHSL 2022-23 handbook right here that talks about how to, um, how to appeal the decision to allow a biological male to compete in um, biological female sports. And it specifically says that a principal would submit the appeal. So that is something that could be governed by the school board if we felt that that wasn't appropriate. So I do firmly believe that athletics are a very big part of the discussion of this resolution. And um, you know, I'm disappointed that um, I've been vilified in having a viewpoint of an, an interpretation of this resolution that I believe is valid. Um, third, um, there's no reference in this resolution that protects the parental, the, the parental rights, the parental rights, the rights of parents. As school board members, we take an oath to uphold the U.S. Constitution and the Constitution of the Commonwealth. That's what we say when we, when we take that oath. That's exactly what we say. Um, parents have the constitutional rights to not have secrets kept from them about their children at schools. Um, and these constitutional rights have been reaffirmed by the Supreme Court, and I'll read some information from the Supreme Court on this. The Supreme Court of the United States has characterized a parent's right to raise his or her child as, quote, perhaps the oldest of the fundamental liberty interests recognized by the court, end quote. In Troxel versus Granville, the Supreme Court further ruled that any statute that seeks to interfere with a parent's fundamental rights does not survive constitutional scrutiny unless it is narrowly ta tailored to serve a compelling state interest specifically to protect, protect a child from harm. So I strongly support that no student should be discriminated against. And I also strongly support parental rights as afforded under the US Constitution. Thank you. Ms. Melnick. So, a couple of things. When this resolution was presented on Thursday, my hope was that if we had questions that we could reach out to the author of that resolution. And if we felt the need to express our opinion about that resolution, that it would, have, it would have been done in a way that we would say to the public, I have some questions about this resolution, and these are the questions I intend to ask. I do believe this, the public was misled, and I talked to plenty of people in the community who had questions. I took note, and I'm going to ask them. Like, can this go back, and can we look at the ambiguous part for, that, that, was present, that was presented in this, the ambiguous part to some people in this community? I heard from a few, and that is the language program or activity. Can we look at that? Can we take that back? 
and redefine that so it's a little, there's some clarification for people. I mean, the truth is we have students who participate in athletics who ride the activity bus. That's what a citizen said to me. I thought it was reasonable, and it's a question I'm asking the author. Can we discuss that? Even though we have a legal definition from our attorney, it's sitting a little heavy with some people. That would be nice. Um, but one of my questions for our attorney is, it's been nearly a year since Governor Youngkin brought forth his model policies. And I think that this division has been incredibly respectful of the governor. We have not reacted to model policies. Um, some school divisions have said, nope, not going to do it. We're rejecting those model policies. But I think we've been very respectful, and we've been waiting nearly a year. And as one member of the community stated, with over 70,000 um, comments from citizens across the Commonwealth, um, why have we not seen some forward momentum with the model policies? I'm not sure I know exactly why. I will say there were bills in the General Assembly that were not successful, so I think they were hoping to get through some of these issues in the General Assembly. They still had roughly about 9,000 comments. There are some serious legal questions. There were also serious legal questions with Governor Northam's uh, model policy. So there are things that they need to look at. They need to answer that. The regulatory process involving these type of guidance requires when there are legal questions that the agency has to go back and address those legal questions. So again, it looked to me as though they were attempting to go through the General Assembly to resolve some of those bills. It did not appear that they were able to do that, so they've gone back and looked at some questions. I was anticipating that we would see it around this time period, roughly, that we would see new model guidelines come out. I'm hearing now that it's August, so that'll be time. To, and again, if it's August, they would have to give us a certain amount of time period again to look at them and then implement, determine when we would have to implement them. So we'll have some work to do on that. What you have in place now are policies and regulations that are compliant with the 2020 model policies that came out from the Northam administration. So you did see Regulation 57.1, which is specifically on transgender students. The 544 policies and regulations deal with sexual harassment and issues in that. We added 544.2, which is use of facilities. We've had a couple other tweaks in some of our other areas that we've dealt with. So I think your current policies and regulations appear to provide adequate protections. I'll also note for you that this board in 2016 amended policy 5-7, your non-discrimination, uh, non-harassment policies for um, students. Also, uh, there's a 544 that applies to employees. You added sexual orientation and gender identity in mm -hmm. 2016, four years before the General Assembly authorized you to do that. So you went ahead and made that decision. There were some cases that came out of the Supreme Court and the Virginia courts. You went ahead and did that before the General Assembly did that. So you did those protections have been placed in, since 2016. And we do look at these issues. We do the discrimination reports. So we are implementing those policies right now. Those are currently in place. We have not proposed to change any of those at this time. There's not a proposal to change any of those, remove any of those. We'll have to take a look at what comes out from the um, Virginia Department of Education and decide what you're going to do with them. But right now, I could only guess based on what we saw in the fall, and we know that there were serious questions with that. So I cannot tell you at this time what you'd be expected to do. Okay. So again, this Ms. Owens, Thank you for answering our students. It's been difficult to sit here as a school board member, for, I mean, for all of us, when we listen to speakers and, and we can't respond. We just have to look. Um, occasionally, we might nod our head or raise an eyebrow, but we can't respond. And so for our students who have now attended 16 school board meetings, they wanted some affirmation. Um, most, a lot of them are leaving, they're going on to their next step, and um, that, that's all that Ms. Owens was trying to do, was to affirm a policy that's been in place, and very specifically since um, the 2016 policy. And so, um, I think sometimes we, um, 
lose sight of pragmatism. And um, I think that this was, I, I like when the process or processes are a little more pragmatic. And so that is why I bring forth my question, is there a way or can, can it be tweaked and brought back um, and perhaps just to, that's my sentence in particular, because that's the sentence in question that was presented to the public that followed an AKA, boys playing girls sports, because a school board member interpreted it that way and presented that. Is it wrong? Nope, that was, that was her interpretation of it. But I, I believe that we need to, um, I mean, technically, yes, it was wrong. We're not, this is not about sports, but can we work on that language a little? Madam Chair, am I able to respond? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I would certainly be open to having that line uh, come in alignment with uh, what Ms. Linetti was already saying about how the activities to not include sports, because obviously they're under VHSL. I would be uh, amenable to adding that we will continue to follow the VHSL guidelines in terms of sports. Thank you. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Anderson. So, <clears throat> I was actually going to speak a little bit to that particular issue as well. Um, because that is the one thing that um, was brought to my attention with several of the emails that we received. Uh, parents interpreted that paragraph where it says, accordingly, no student shall be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any VBCPS education program or activity based on sex, uh, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, gender expression, or any other characteristic protected by state or federal law. So that is what they interpreted, is that we were trying to sneak in uh, boys being on girls' teams, and, th and that's not what that's about at all. And so, um, Ms. Owens, if you would agree, we could work on that language when we bring it back um, for next time, and or maybe even tonight we might be able to tweak it and you could let us know how, how that would fit in there. Uh, what your suggestion was that we put in there that it would we would continue to um, abide by the rules of VHSL. So, um, but basically though, I mean, it already is taken care of because Ms. Linetti explained that state code 22.1-23.3 in number seven of that state code, it says activities and events do not include athletics. So it's really taken care of. You just have to read read the code, um, even though some people may have interpreted it to be to be in you know for sports. I'm, I'm sorry, what? Miss Linetti. The clarification: twenty-two point one, twenty-three point three directs the Virginia Department of Education to develop model policies and it's specifically exempt activities. So if you're following the model policies, they should not be addressing sports. Mrs. Owens doesn't specifically refer to these policies. So is, it's not, I'm not saying it's automatic, but there is a potential that you might need to clarify that activities, if you do not intend them to be sports, because she's not referring to the model policies here in her, regulate, her, her resolution then it, I could see where it possibly could be interpreted on there because she's not stating the policies. 22.1, 23.3 is what is directed to the Virginia Department of Education to do on their policy. So okay. there's a little room for clarification there. So um, hopefully you're working on that, Ms. Owens. Um, and so, but I'll, I just also wanna, wanna address uh, another part here uh, where it says, um, even at the end, of this resolution where it says the last further resolved. It says further resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach will adopt no policies in violation 
of state or federal law that would impede our ability to provide these guaranteed protections of our, uh, to our students. So even there, we're still abiding by state law and federal law. We're not trying to you know, supersede the governor's uh, rules or policies, even when they come down. We're not trying to supersede that. We're just trying to state that what we're already doing, and oh, by the way, we do have a policy, 5-7.1, that is, is titled Treatment of Transgender Student. It basically guarantees the same things in this policy. So um, this, just, this um, resolution basically just affirms what we already are doing and what we know is right to do and how we treat our all students. Um, maybe we should have just labeled it that all students, but I know we wanted to address the fact that these students have been coming to us since September um, and we wanted to specifically address what they've been asking for. This does address it, but it also addresses all students. So that, that's what I had to say. Ms. Owens, if you have your um, amended version of paragraph four, I yield to you. I don't have the specific uh, language for, for paragraph four at this point, other than um, finding language that uh, complies with VHSL and that excludes sports activities. So I, I will play with that sentence. It may be by the end of the meeting, it may be after we would have it clearly prior to uh, bring it, bringing it forth for a vote. Then could you send it to the board? Oh, absolutely. Okay, um, Ms. Martin. Um, so first of all, I wanna acknowledge the students that have come to speak over the last several months. We hear you and we see you. Um, I do agree, Madam Chair, Ms. Owens, that this resolution affirms our commitment to inclusivity, inclusivity and, and that's important, but it also affirms our commitment to follow state and federal law for students and parents. And I wanna point out in the second and the fifth paragraph, it affirms the rights of parents and students under state and federal law. Parents are mentioned in here. In fact, the first five paragraphs are focused on all students, staff, their parents, and their families. LGBTQ plus individuals are only mentioned in paragraphs six, seven, and eight, less than 25% of the total paragraphs in this resolution. Now, I would like to see some edits uh, in the resolution to make sure we are meeting VHSL requirements, Title IX requirements, because we do need to get this exactly right. So the public understands what local, federal, and state policies um, we're implementing against the backdrop of inclusivity. Um, I would really like to see this voted on um, in June as part of Pride Month to provide a more appropriate backdrop for a resolution like this because the majority of our resolutions are against the backdrop of a larger nationwide Women's History Month, Black History Month. Um, and so I'd like to see this voted on in June for that reason with maybe some language about the history of the pride movement as part of this resolution. And you know, at first I was concerned that this was governing through resolution, um, but it's not governance, this is affirmation. And after reading through so many comments in my inbox, some sadly full of vitriol that are now part of the public record, I see why we need this affirmation of inclusivity for our students, our parents, our staff, and our families. It affirms our commitment to creating a safe and inclusive school environment. The message in our inboxes and the comments tonight prove that we need to acknowledge this issue. Our students and our staff and our families really deserve a safe and inclusive environment and one that follows all the applicable state and federal laws. Thank you. Ms. Weems. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I, I just wanna say to reiterate that whether you're a student or a parent, an adult, when you come, you, it does seem like you're just talking to you know, a blank wall because yeah. we can't respond. So I, I understand the frustration, but because before I got on the school board, I did the same thing. I went to the school board and, and spoke. 
Um, but it doesn't mean we're not listening. It doesn't mean we're hearing. And if we disagree, it doesn't mean we hate you or don't like you. Um, so that, that's unfortunate that that perception is out there. Um, I think this policy is extremely vague. And, and I'm trying to figure out, it does affirm, but it also says even what we shall do. So it calls for action and it does affirm. And I know in recent history, two of us, Ms. Franklin and I, kind of did a, did a resolution to affirm that we're not gonna have divisive rhetoric in the schools and da da da. And we were told we can't support that because we don't govern by, by resolution. So I, I hate that we sometimes govern by resolution if we like the topic, but other times if we don't agree with the topic, we don't govern by resolution. So that's a little disappointing. But um, you know, we, we have non-discrimination all throughout our policies, bylaws, regulations, everything. So, um, I'm not sure that we need to add this or, or we need to change it because it is so very vague. I mean, if it's a LGBTQ plus resolution, but yet we're saying it's not mentioned in the first par six paragraphs or whatever, I'm just, I just think there's a lot of stuff in here that is just so vague that we, um, so I would like that tightened up. Um, in the, in the whereas, when we say activity or program, when I read that, I completely thought it included sports. I mean, 100%, because you're not referencing any code. You're not saying, according to the code, according to Yunkins, whatever, according to Northam's, whatever. I mean, this is, this is gonna be our resolution, and there's no reference to it. And when I, as a parent and, and an athletic mom and grandmom, I completely, interpret activity as being sports. So I'm not sure why it wasn't um, something like accordingly, no student shall be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subject to discrimination under any VBCPS education program, comma, or program or activity, comma, with exclusion of all sports. You know, that would have made it very clear, because VHSL does, is not the sanctioning governing body for middle school, I don't believe. So to me, that would clarify it a little bit if you put comma, excluding athletic events, sport, ath athletic events and sports competitions, or, you know, however, to make it very clear, because it was not clear to me at all, not clear. Um, so I, I would like that to, to be very clear. Um, and another thing that, that's kind of confusing, and I think even students thought it was confusing, because at one point I'm hearing this has nothing to do with not following or bashing Governor Yunkin, but then I hear speakers come forward and say, basically this is good because it dismisses Governor Yunkin's model policies. So I'm not sure if it does or if it doesn't dismiss the model policies. Um, so that's confusing to me. Another thing that I don't see, and I hope that you can point me to it, is since September, we have heard the subject from students about the names. Whether you call it a nickname, your new name, we have heard dead naming, and that's been like a huge issue. In fact, to the point of some students saying, we're not here to talk about sports or bathrooms, we just really want the name to be resolved. We wanna be able to call our name. I, I don't see where that is in here. Um, and I've even met with, with some students, and, and I agree, I don't think one particular group of students needs to go through hoops and loops to have a nickname when nobody else does. I mean, I've got a son that's William Thomas, and he's been Beamer his whole life. Beamer doesn't even go to with William Thomas. We just made it up one day. Um, and I have no problem writing out a form or putting his preferred name as Beamer, but. If you have to do it as a transgender student, I have to do it. So, you know, I, I totally agree with that. Um, but I don't see anything, in, where is it about the names? Because that has been taught to us every single meeting, time and time again. So, Ms. Owens, like where, what whereas is it that, that addresses that, the actual name issue? Madam Chair, can I respond? Yeah. Yeah, or is that okay, or do you want it, or just email me? What, what is your point? No, let her, let her respond. Okay, 
Because this is a discussion, and I feel like okay. we're asking because a specific Because to me, thing. that's like a huge, huge thing with the students, with the names. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Currently, our, our district doesn't have a, uh, I'm, I'm not going to address the specific things that are already in policy. It's saying we're going to continue to follow the policies we have, the state level, the federal policies, and not allow for discrimination. So if this week the discriminating factor is only certain people have to have their nicknames approved and other students don't, putting no discrimination stops if next week it's a different thing. We're not gonna go back and each time say, this specific discrimination and this specific discrimination and this specific discrimination, discrimination has a definition and it's when one group is being asked to do things that another group is not doing. And so one group having to have name checks where another group doesn't falls under that definition of discrimination. So it's not, I'm not changing a policy. I'm not saying everybody in the school gets to have this nickname. We don't want people to be discriminated against. So if one group has to do something, everybody does it. It's not specifically addressing how the district handles names. As long as you do it in a non-discriminatory way. If the district wants every student to have to have their, their nickname approved, then that wouldn't be discriminatory. Okay. I, I, okay, I just, I mean, it, it, it's just so vague. Okay. Okay, gender expression. Um, Gender identity, gender expression. I don't think I don't even know if gender it, is gender expression one of the protected classes legal. Ms. Canetti, Ms. Linetti. Virginia Human Rights Act uses the term sexual orientation, gender identity. The guidance from the U.S. Department of Education, Title IX, uses those same terms too. If I had to say to you, I believe the U.S. Department of Education would probably interpret gender identity as and gender expression as being similar on there, but the actual terms are sexual orientation, gender identity. I'm guessing the federal government would say they were the same thing if we were to get a complaint, but technically the terms of sexual orientation, gender identity. Okay, I don't know if that answered my question, but that's okay. So, so just gender expression, that, that, I, I circle that. Um, what happens, Ms. Linetti, if the model policies, if, if they, whoever they are, because it's either the governor or the DOE, um, if we pass something like this and then three months after we pass something, the model policies come back as, as law, so what happens then? You're going to have to decide what you want to do. And that's the, you currently have a regulation 5.7.1, 5, 5 which talks about pronouns. I think that's a major issue. You are going to have to decide whether you want to do it. What I'd ha I can't answer for you now is what is the penalty to you if you do not comply with the model policies? It did not look when the North administration put out the 2021 model policy that there was actually any penalty for it. If it turns out there is a penalty, we're going to have to consider what is the possible penalty, and you'll have to make a decision on that, and you'll just have to decide whether you're going to comply or not. Okay, and one more question to the to the author. Um, so, so I heard from a couple students, and I think one said dismiss the dismissal of Governor Yunkin's model policies, and one said reject. Do you find that this? Um, does your resolution dismiss at all the Governor Yunkin's model policy? Does it dismiss, does it reject, does it weaken? This resolution doesn't reference right. a Governor Yunkin's model policies at all. I understand that the students' uh, questions may have come about because of things that they've heard, but I can't reject something that we don't have a final draft for, and I don't know if we will get that. There are questions, and I want to affirm where our division stands based on our current policies, our current laws, and so that's where this is. This isn't in the face of, this is currently where we are and where we want to continue to let students okay. know. 
Okay, well, and, and that goes to my point, again, of it being so vague, because you have students saying, yay, thank, thank you so much that this rejects, and, you know, and you're just saying that that's the wrong interpretation, and then you have others saying, now boys are playing girls' sports. So it, it needs to be totally tightened up, and I wish that it just wasn't so vague. Again, I, I don't think, I'm not convinced we need it, um, but if it was tightened up, maybe I could, but, but this right here, to me, um, I wouldn't be able to support it as it is right here. Ms. Owens, re response sure. to yeah, that? I just wanted to um, respond that I certainly am hearing some of the uh, feedback if gender expression is a term that causes confusion, I would be fine with losing that and keeping the other terms. Uh, I wouldn't be, feel comfortable with referencing the Yunkin model policies because they don't exist at this point. I can't say that this, you know, is not, you know, whatever, dismissing those policies that don't exist. What I'm doing is affirming our division stance of where we are. So the clarification of uh, excluding competitive sports when we're talking about activities because clearly our district has a number of activities that we do awards for uh, each time. Um, eliminating the phrase gender expression, uh, but I can't reference a policy that- Yeah, I don't, yeah, I didn't really call for that, but thank you for looking and, and if you could just um, get it to us really early because we got this really late and so the, the, the sooner the, that you can get to, get the changes to us, the better, thank you. Okay, Mr. Culpepper. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, I hate to restate a lot of that stuff, but some of it's worth saying again. Um, but I will start off by, by mostly saying thank you to all our speakers. You know, and yeah, it's a long time sitting through, what is it, 16 weeks now, uh, of the same folks coming here to talk, but it's good. And most importantly, I'd point out how, how, how bright and articulate uh, all those students are, and I appreciate, uh, obviously, the work they put in to come here and say something worth hearing. Everybody here would be happy to affirm and reiterate Virginia Beach's, Virginia Beach School Board's policy on, uh, on non-discrimination, policy 5-7, which I'm looking at, but I won't read. Everybody would be happy to, to say we, we believe in all of that in terms of non-discrimination as it relates to sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, and it lists a whole bunch of other stuff here. There's a whole lot more in here that, I mean, I agree, causes confusion. And uh, I don't think it's fair to say the public was misled because the resolution says what it says. Uh, Ms. Linda, they pointed out, you know, it says program or activity in here, and I read that as an intent to cover everything that goes on. It doesn't reference state law, which specifically excludes sports nor does it say it intends to specifically exclude sports. Glad to hear in conversation we don't intend for it to cover that, but I don't blame the public or myself for reading that as what it's for what it actually says. By the same token, that last paragraph, when it talks about we will adopt no policies in violation of state or federal law, everybody here when they spoke about it said we will abide by state and federal law. So it's a little curious to me that it's written the other way around, and I think that's why people read it as an intent to subvert ahead of time the model policies that are coming out. Because what if federal law and state law aren't saying the same thing? What are we gonna do? Well, we'll adopt no policy in violation of federal law. Well, first and foremost, I live in Virginia, and I'm responsible to Virginia law. And if Virginia, Virginia law and federal law are in conflict, I would rely on the Attorney General to short that out. So mostly I think we're way out over our skis. And the, what we need to do is wait until we have something specific to discuss in terms of those model policies and how or if we would implement, that, implement them in Virginia Beach. Thank you. Um, Ms. Brown. Um, I appreciate the clarification on um, Athletics, you know, be, as a coach of athletics, predominantly to um, young girls, I, um, 
that part is very important to me. And I also interpret this to say that. And the reason is, is because no specific policy that we have in our division is listed on this resolution. Um, so, you know, like everybody has said, middle school sports are not under VHSL, and I just want to reiterate everyone else's thoughts um, on that. And, you know, that's a particularly difficult, difficult time to be um, a female athlete. Um, you're hitting puberty. Um, your body is changing. You're experiencing regression, um, regression as your male counterparts are becoming stronger. So I'm very concerned about that, and that's very, very important to me. So I'm glad that you're willing to um, change that. Um, there is a spot in the fourth paragraph that reads a little bit confusing to me. Um, and you can respond all at once because I have more than one thing to say. Um, <clears throat> so first off, it says case law. I don't know exactly what case law is being referenced in your resolution. Um, I do not know if these stats from the Trevor Project here are from peer-reviewed sources. Um, I think that would be important to include. Um, and on number nine, it says, whereas existing policies in VBCPS create a welcoming learning environment and align with division core values and beliefs, um, and so on, um, the spirit behind this document right here, the spirit of it, the resolution, is to say, we're going to reject the model policies when they're released or if they're released. That's what the spirit is, because that's what everybody's been coming here to ask. Otherwise, all we're saying is we're not going to discriminate. Um, so um, point of inquiry, um, Ms. Linetti, do, do we, um, as a division, have practices in place that are discriminatory? Um, or do we have you know, policies and regulations that have protected that? I would say you have policies and regulations that affirm non-discrimination. I think you have a lot of efforts and programs. Do we occasionally have situations where particularly students are reporting other students discriminating? Of course, that always happens, and we just we do a lot of investigation, a lot of investigations. And you certainly, for all of you sit on student discipline committees, you see this too. We do take action for that. So I do think the school division is trying very hard to implement the non-discrimination we don't always have control over when students act on other students. We certainly enforce that with our staff. But are there instances? Certainly. And do we investigate? Yes. Do we have state and federal investigations all the time? And we work through all of those. So I do think your policies are in place to protect individuals. Um, and we are currently in compliance with what I believe are the 2021 model policies on air. So I don't think we're out of compliance with that. And I can't say that the school division as a whole is acting in a discriminatory manner. Okay. Um, and you had um, mentioned that you have some legal questions regarding the Northam policies. Um, what legal questions or concerns would, as our... Um, there were concerns about reporting um, requirements that you would have to report a family to Child Protective Services. We were careful when we drafted our regulations that it would be a fact-by-fact -fact situation. The fact that a family may have disagreed with the student's position on gender identity or sexual orientation, we were not automatically going to treat that as child protective services. We were going to do what we always do, which is look at the individual circumstances. Uh, we recognize with name issues, there are some legal questions that have to be answered. I, I cannot legally change a student's name on the paperwork. That, that is their legal name without a court order. So we were careful about that. We had some flexibility with um, discussing preferred names, and we worked through some of those issues. So those have not been litigated so far. Uh, and those are questions I have. Similar as I would have the same questions with the model proposed guidelines of 2022, which was saying that you had to use 
nicknames that were derivatives of the given name, the legal name, that also is hard to implement. Neither of those have been litigated at this point, but those would be problem areas that we saw. Okay. Um, you know, and I, I want to go back to um, the public comment, the emails that we got. Um, you know, I have a great deal of compassion for everybody that's shown up to speak. Um, I hear everybody. I value everybody in the district. I value everybody in this community. Um, but even the pilot did an article, Virginia Beach School Board to discuss not adopting state's transgender student policies. Now, the pilot and I, we didn't correspond about this. So this is what the spirit of this is. And um, I feel like we're putting the cart before the horse here because we do not have anything except for a draft of the um, model policies. And you know, there is some language in here I would, I would have trouble um, saying I agree with. I, I agree with the resolve. That's, I, I don't mind that. Um, but I think that um, I'm, I want to make a motion that we defer this until the 2022 model policies have been released by the state superintendent. Second. All right, there's a motion that has been made by Ms. Um, Brown. So the motion that I made is that we defer this until the state superintendent has released the 2022 model policies since we do not know it's in them. Thank you. Okay, and it was seconded by Mr. Culpepper. Do we have any discussion on this? Okay, so um, Ms. Anderson's first. Then we have Ms. Owens and Ms. Ms. Martin was there too. Yeah, she was after, yeah. Okay, Ms. Anderson first. I just want to remind now we're, everybody. Wait a minute, we're talking on this I know. motion, okay? I know. Okay. I don't want to defer it because this is not a policy. This is a resolution affirming what we already are doing with our policy, okay? So I don't see the need to defer this because you're indicating, well, it has been said that really that the spirit of this was to really um, not enact the policy, um, Governor Yunkin's policies. So, but but that's not what this is about. That was not the spirit of this. That's your opinion that this is the spirit of this. But that was not the spirit of this. That's not why it was written. This is literally just a resolution affirming what we, do, what we believe and how we need to treat every student in our school system, especially the, um, the transgender youth who've been coming here, many of them who've been coming here and their friends who've been coming here since September. So um, I don't think we should, I think that's wrong to say that we're going to, because we don't even know if those, those policies of 2022 are even gonna come out. By the time they come out, it might be 2023, it might even be 2024, because they're, as this has been pointed out tonight, you know, they're reading over the 9,000, um, 9,000, comments that have been put given out to the governor uh, into the, you know, and so we don't even know if there's a, if that's actually going to be something that we're disagreeing on. So we don't know if we're actually going to even get it. The governor may decide to forego half of the things that are on that policy. We don't know that for sure. So no, I don't think we should disband this and, and put this is a simple little resolution affirming what we actually believe and how people should be treated. Um, Madam Chair, can I respond? Go ahead. So this resolution was created in response to the request to reject the model policies and 
from a transparency standpoint, um, I'm not suggesting that anyone's doing anything wrong, but I just think that it would be a, a bad idea, personally, to vote on this when we don't have finalized model policies from the state superintendent. And as everyone has said, no action is required for everything in this to continue. Um, I think that part of the purpose of this was so that we could have this discussion because, um, you know, it is very difficult when you get up here to not get a response. I know that as a parent that, you know, wanted answers about my kid getting back to school, but we didn't create a resolution to give me those answers. Um, I, didn't, I didn't get that. And so I think that the responsible thing to do with such a controversial issue, instead of being a lightning rod and attracting controversy over something that says that we're gonna do what we're doing already, um, I think that it's a reasonable approach to take to wait to see what the model policies will be if they are released. And that's all I'm gonna say on that. Okay, Ms. Martin. Um, so you, um, Madam Chair, Ms. Brown mentioned that um, this is in response to a request to reject the 2022 model policies. Whose request? None of us have made that request. Those policies do not exist yet to be requested to be rejected. The, the other piece of this is I don't think it's responsible to continue to discuss this issue. I think it's irresponsible for us not to. These students deserve this affirmation. It's been six months. The model policies have been out for 18 months. They may never be released. The governor may just want those to quietly go away because of the legal challenges that would be on the horizon with those. Um, so no, I, I don't support this motion at all to defer this for any reason at all. I would like to see it voted on in June as part of Pride Month. Thank you. Ms. Owens. Thank you. Uh, I'm also in disagreement with Ms. Brown's motion uh, to defer this until an unknown time that may or may not ever come. Since this resolution has made it onto the agenda for non-discrimination, it seems like there's been multiple motions made to discriminate to treat it different than what we would treat everything else on the agenda. There's a motion made to switch up the order of our agenda, which we don't do for any other resolution. We don't do for other topics. We have policy, we have bylaw on how we uh, conduct our meetings. Now there's a, a, a motion to defer it. If, if you don't agree with it, and if others don't agree with it, after we've made the edits, vote it down. The public has a right to know where people stand. That's why I brought it forward, for us to have the conversation and for us to make a determination on where we stand on it. I've heard the uh, conversation, I've made notes. I will bring it back with edits that uh, provide clarity on excluding competitive sports and removing the gender expression. We have already policy on the BB Middle School League. I will make the references in here to the policies that already exist. But this deserves to have a vote just like everything else we put forward. And so I would ask that this non-discrimination resolution not be discriminated on in getting to the regular protocol of this board. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Melnick. So I too cannot support that motion mainly because you use the words non-discrimination and controversial together. Non-discrimination is not controversial. And again, we don't create resolutions explaining what we don't do or won't do. We have an existing policy. We write resolutions about existing policies all the time. That's already been stated. This is an existing policy with an affirmation to our students. I 
You, do, you don't have to agree with the sitting governor, but we've been waiting patiently. This is not voting down the governor's model policies because right now they're sitting up here. We don't have them in front of us. And affirming a non-discrimination resolution after it's tweaked is not controversial. And so I, I too cannot support your motion and um, I ask that this just go back, let the author tweak it, let her present it again, and we go from there. Ms. Franklin. Thank you. Um, well, I've been listening to all the dialogue, which I very much appreciate. You know, I'm all about hearing all sides. Um, and I, I, and first of all, I just want you to know that I, I understand the author's um, interest in, in wanting to present this. I mean, we, we have listened to the students. I, I have spoken to many of the students. I respect so much your commitment and your passion to this cause. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and the, the presentation that you provide at every single meeting. I absolutely do. I want you to know that. And um, I do feel like, though, Ms. Owens, I would like for us I, I agree, you have absolutely the right to bring this resolution forward. Every school member does. Um, I think that that is a right to sit on this board to be able to bring a resolution. Um, I want to just ask you though, because if we're truly doing it in the spirit of non-discrimination, I want to ensure that if we're going to vote on this, if I'm going to vote on this as a commitment to non-discrimination that we are very clear about what that entails. It does concern me about doing a resolution that we might have to repeal in case something does happen. I think it's almost worse to put something in place committing ourselves as a board to doing this, to making sure this doesn't happen, and then we have to, it, it, it feels bad when you have to bring something back. Um, and that is my concern. Not that I, I disagree with a large chunk of this. I, I do agree with Ms. Martin that I would like to see some edits and many of, of the other board members have said that. Um, but my concern with doing a resolution that brings our commitment to something we're already doing is that what happens when we're in a position where we have to now look at the potential new policy and I, it would break my heart to commit something and then to have to say, well, you know, we were basing it off of this and now, gosh, I gotta, I gotta rethink this. I, it may, I don't know. To me, that, that concerns me. I feel like it makes us look like we're wishy-washy. I would rather have it be a situation where if we're gonna do a resolution, like Ms. Martin said, we talk about, like we do in many of the other resolutions. I wish we had one. And in fact, we, I don't even know if we have one. Um, where's my agenda? Nurses, okay, so like school nurse appreciation. So if we craft it in a way that we celebrate the over, how the challenges and how they've overcome and, um, and we have it more of a celebration and less of a situation where, and I'm not sure if this is still going to provide the same affirmation to students, I hope it does, um, but I just, again, don't want to put ourselves in a position where we we say we're, we're committed to this, but then all of a sudden we have to change our perspective based on something that comes out again. And I, I think that that is confusing and um, disheartening in a way that you you know there's a commitment and then there's a then then there's a reconsideration of that commitment. So. I appreciate your, your thoughtfulness in terms of putting it together and also your thoughtfulness in terms of considering the feedback and, and, and revisiting some of the ver verbiage, but I, I would like to possibly request that we craft the language in a way that is more what we do with other resolutions that say that we're celebrating these the, the challenges, how we've, you know, they've overcome things, um, and, um, and put less verbiage about things that we um, are committing to that might have, that might be revisited. So I don't, I don't know if I'm, I'm stating my case very well, but, uh, but 
but, um, but I thank you. I, I, I understand and I want the students to know that we do hear you, um, but I just, I feel like there, this has been too open to interpretation um, and I would rather have it be a celebration as we do with other resolutions um, than, than some of the verbiage that, we've, that we find in here. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Owens. I was just uh, wanting to seek clarification if Ms. Franklin's uh, comments were in regards to the motion on the floor for deferment or... I'm sorry, so no, I, I, I agree with your ability to pr provide this resolution. I think that if you're willing to, um, so I, I'm not going to support to deferring the resolution, but I am gonna ask that you, you do take it back and maybe recraft it. So I don't know if that's an alternate motion, but. I don't know if that's an alternate motion. I, I was trying to figure out where, where we are with these comments in terms of Ms. Brown's motion. We're, st we're still on Ms. Brown's motion, so we I need to vote that on that. Ms. I took that to mean from Ms. Franklin that she's not going to support the deferred deferment, but she obviously, if we get back to the next stage, she'd like to see some tweaking in the language. That's how I interpret that, unless she's, I did not hear an no, That That is absolutely correct. I would like to ask that we take this back and, and revisit the, the uh, and recraft maybe the verbiage in the, in the resolution. <clears throat> Mr. Callan. Uh, it seems as though there's an agreement in part for a tightening up of the document. Maybe that's the right words that were used or the previous words that were used. And since what was drafted and made available to the public caused such a response that concerned people, what I think might be helpful, at least from my point of view, is if you could speak not the words that I want you to speak, but from your perspective, the verbiage that you want to use relative to three things to clarify. What is your position on sports and transgender participation in sports? What is your position on parents' rights? And what is your position on the Yunkin policies if and when they're ever released? Just what would your position be? Because it seems as though those were the three things that lent itself to confusion on my part. I wasn't certain where you stood in that respect. So those are just my thoughts, and I defer back to you, Chair. Okay, so Ms. Franklin, you did not make an alternate motion, so we're just gonna go ahead and vote on the motion that's on the floor now, right? and then we'll vote on this motion, and then we'll go back to that if, if it doesn't pass. How about that, okay? Are we good? Okay. But, so, I'm sorry, clarification. So if this doesn't pass, there's not a motion on there yet. Well, then we'll let her make her motion then. How about that? You'll just go back to the discussion. Okay. Right, okay. right. And if she wants to make a motion. Okay, so. <laughs> Ms. Brown, please restate your motion. My motion is that we defer this resolution until after the model policies are released um, by the state superintendent. Okay, and it was seconded by Mr. Culpepper. All that are in favor of this motion that Ms. Brown has uh, presented, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have four ayes. Okay, all that are against this motion, please raise your hand. We have six nays. All that are abstentions. And we have one abstention, so the motion on the floor did fail. I'm not sure, does he have to state his reason for his abstention? Yes. I didn't think so. A reason for the abstention? No, no. Okay, thank you.
Okay, so it failed. Am I correct? You can continue on with discussion. So we're going to continue on with the discussion. Okay, does anybody, okay. Um, Madam Chair, I would like to put in a substitute motion. Okay. To ask Ms. Owens to, oh, I'm sorry, regular, I'm sorry, put in a motion to request that Ms. Owens uh, take the feedback that she received tonight and um, revisit the verbiage and bring it back to the board. Okay, do I have a second? Ms. Weems. Okay, so the motion has been made by Ms. Uh, Franklin and seconded by my, Ms. Weems to ask the author of this resolution, Ms. Owens, to take it back with the suggestions and rewrite it and bring it back to us. Is there any discussion on this motion? Ms. Owens. Not necessarily disagreement, just more, I guess, a procedural question. Is that something that we typically do on information? Isn't that what we have information for, to get information and then make adjustments and bring back? So <laughs> yes. I'm not understanding why we need the vote, but yes, I guess we can vote that we'll do what we always do. You know, I, 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 I withdraw. Yeah. <laughs> I withdraw. Then, then just a suggestion. How about that? <laughs> Okay, so you're withdrawing your, your, okay. No, withdraw. no, she's right. It's, it's information, so correct. Okay. Any more discussion? Okay, Ms. Owens. Just wanted to um, close by saying that I've heard the feedback and I will make adjustments and edits based on the conversation that we've had and we are on uh, Tuesday, I will have the, the draft edits back to the board uh, no later than Monday. I will shoot for Friday, but I know that we're going to be here till whatever time tonight, and I have meetings for the school board up through 7.30 tomorrow night. So um, there is a, a time frame on when it will get back, um, and then it can also be shared with the public at that time. Thank you for your, your thoughts and feedback. Okay, and you'll have it ready for the May 23rd meeting. Okay. But you will have it posted by no later than Monday. Correct. Ready to be posted. Okay. Correct. Miss Linetti. You have a second on the floor, so you are going to have to vote on that. If, since you, you had a second. She's, she withdrew it. I agree. And, and Miss Williams agreed to withdraw it. Okay. All right. So we're finished with our information of part of our agenda and we are back to public comments. Miss, um, our clerk, would you please announce our next people that are on the agenda to speak? Thank you, Madam Chair. Our next speakers will be Elizabeth Kiriku, Carlos Taylor, and Jessica Miley. Welcome. Hi, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Kiriakou, a Virginia Beach resident, and I'd like to thank the school board for having us today, and especially for bringing in the students to speak first, who've been so brave and inspiring. Um, I was born and raised in Lafayette, Louisiana, in a gun-owning household. Think deer heads on the walls. Um, in 2015, you all may recall that Lafayette was unfortunately affected by a mass shooting at a local movie theater, one regularly frequented by my family. As a young adult, I moved to the D.C. area where I met my husband, Constantine or Dino Kiriakou, who served in the National Guard for 12 years and who was, at the time, and remains a gun owner. In 2017, we went to Las Vegas to celebrate his 30th birthday with my parents. On our last night, left my parents at the slot machines at Mandalay Bay, and as you can imagine, as we headed for the airport, they shockingly had to run miles to evacuate and left us scared on the airplane how to leave them there. These experiences left us frustrated by the frequency of gun violence, and in 2018, we marched in the March for Our Lives demonstration in D.C. We moved to Virginia Beach to be closer to my husband's family. He was born and raised here, went to Callum High School, and we continue to be agonized by ongoing gun violence, especially now that we have two children to worry about. Most recently, we've been appalled by Nashville and closer to home with the Newport News incidents, the weapons scares at Little Creek and Bayside. So on March 8th, 2023, I attended my first Moms Demand Action meeting. Our team leads walked us through some of the group's initiatives, including Be Smart for Kids for secure gun storage. It was then that I started feeling my face blush, 
adrenaline rushed through my veins and a small surge of panic running through me. I thought to myself, where is our gun right now? Is it even locked up? How could we not have thought about this? We have a curious three-year-old rummaging through the house all day, every day. We did not have our gun locked. The same couple who grew up around locked guns, whose communities in Lafayette, D.C., and Virginia Beach have all been affected by gun violence, who had loved ones fleeing from Mandalay Bay, and who marched against gun violence and are volunteering to prevent it. That night, we came up with a plan to lock our gun. But here's the thing. I know we are not alone. There are other individuals and parents like out like us out there who are avidly against gun violence, but who just didn't think about their own firearms. We've learned too often that on the shelf or under the bed is not enough. So let's remind parents like me and my veteran seconds. husband to securely store our guns. What does that look like? Each year at school orientation, let's email parents on how to lock their guns. As each school breaks for Christmas, spring, and summer, let's remind parents to keep their guns stored. Let's pass a resolution that commits us all to secure storage. A shocking 4.6 million children live in a household with at least one loaded, unlocked gun. I'm thankful to share that today, one, my home is no longer one of those. The way we will save lives is by spreading awareness. And that is time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carlos Taylor, Jessica Miley, and then Rabbi Israel Zoberman. Welcome. Woo! This is my first school board meeting. And uh, I gotta tell you, this was something. This, this, this was amazing. Those kids spoke so well, so sharp. I mean, I'm sleepy because I work. I know I haven't been to the meetings, but I pay taxes and I work. So uh, uh, anyway, I don't hate anybody. Now I disagree with everything they said, but I don't hate them. And I'm like, who's telling these kids that we hate them? I mean, it's just crazy. But anyway, let me look at this clock here. Uh, uh, I'm a resident of Virginia Beach by way of New Jersey and the United States Marine Corps. Separate five. Uh, and I live in the 10th district. Um, I have read and I support policy 665, which was brought forward by Mrs. Brown and Mrs. Manning. Um, it is absolutely reasonable to remove sexually explicit content from elementary school libraries. It is absolutely reasonable to provide a way for families in middle and high schools to understand what materials meet the criteria for sexual, uh, the criteria for sexually explicit. And actually, quite frankly, the policy doesn't go far enough to remove the straight up pornography in the libraries. Uh, Carefully selecting appropriate literature is not book banning. Now, concerning uh, Mrs. Owen's resolution, you know, it just doesn't make sense that we have a resolution that says you're going to follow what you already said you were going to follow. I mean, it's, it just, it's like it's redundant. It's, un it's not necessary. You know, we're not going to, nobody discriminates. It's almost like the hate crime law. You know, why do you have to put hate in front of it? You murder somebody, you go to jail, or you get executed. Um, so that's what I have to say there. Uh, what else? Uh, uh, I think that was it, but man, what an education this has been. I'm telling you, th this has really been an eye-opening event for me. I mean, it's just amazing. These, the, the kids were so sharp. You know, I mean, but I, I plan on being at more meetings. And uh, <laughs> uh, I appreciate the time and effort. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jessica Miley, then Rabbi Israel Zoberman, and then Laura Gross. Jessica Miley, Rabbi Zoberman, Laura Gross, welcome. 
Thank you. It's gotten a little late for those of us who do work also, so I will keep it brief. Members of the school board, my name is Laura Gross. I am a local attorney and current president of the United of the Board of Directors of the United Jewish Federation of Tidewater. I am here tonight to state my opposition to the proposed policy that, if it gets adopted, will create a list of flagged and possibly eventually banned books in school libraries. It will also provide a means for parents to challenge any book as possibly containing sexually explicit content. This is an unnecessary new policy as we heard at the last meeting of the board that there is already a policy in place that gives, that gives parents the ability to prevent their own children from checking out books such parents find objectionable. Clearly, if parents have the ability to guide their own children on what books those children can read, then we don't need another policy. Moreover, the state law that addresses sexually explicit content does so for classroom instruction only, not for libraries. As such, the policy being considered by the school board is not required. In addition, the concept of sexually explicit content as written in the statute on curriculum and included in the proposed policy is both vague and overbroad, with the impact of significantly limiting the ability for students to learn about different identities, art, science, and many other topics. We should not allow a vocal minority to limit a student's exploration of the world through books, simply because it may offend those people's beliefs. As a parent of now adult children, I remember reviewing with my children the books both assigned to them and chosen by them to read. I am grateful that I had the opportunity before my children left my home to explore with them the diversity of ideas they experienced through reading. So while I welcome parent participation in their children's education, I do not welcome them to limit the education of others. Seconds. Academic freedom in the Virginia Beach Public Schools is, in, is vital to an engaged citizenry and uh, the free flow of ideas. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Brenda Pence, Becky Hay, and then Ginger Schrerick. Brenda Pence left, so I'll be going. Welcome. Good evening. I'd like to weigh in on three topics tonight. First, I would urge the board to vote against the resolution to add student representatives. Students can engage already at the school level and by writing the board and speaking before the board first, I might add. The resolution is unnecessary and gives special access to the board that parents, teachers, and community members do not have. Secondly, I ask the board to vote against Ms. Owen's resolution regarding LGBTQ youth. The division already has a non-discrimination policy. This is another unnecessary resolution that favors one specific population in our schools. The language may seem innocuous, but the intent is clear, to undermine future directives by the current governor and VDOE, to include parents in the discussion of student gender identity, to protect girls as well as their privacy in school gym locker rooms and restrooms, and to force teachers to violate their conscience. The resolution seeks to undermine religious beliefs, appropriate gender separation, and parental authority and involvement. Thirdly, I need to address the misinformation spread by several speakers at the last school board meeting about the proposed library materials policy put forth by the PRC. Number one, the policy does not ban books. Any current library books challenged or new books that contain explicit content are put on a list easily accessible to parents so they can choose whether or not to opt out their student. The policy promotes transparency, not censorship. Number two, librarians will not have to read every book in the library. Only books found in elementary schools or challenged in the middle and high school levels will go through the review process for removal or being added to the list. New library books will be reviewed for explicit content. Number three, there are many reasons why only 12 families opted out of certain books, including they didn't know they could, they didn't know how to, they don't agree with the opt-out policy because they are aware 
they don't agree with the opt-out policy only, or they are aware of what their child are reading. Parents do care and to assume anything else is foolish and arrogant. Number four, it is not difficult or impossible to define explicit content. Ms. Linetti mentioned at the last meeting there is legal precedent available. Number five, we will not need to throw out history books or health books. This is a dramatic and illogical interpretation of the policy based on the items I've already outlined. Number six, although stated several times that parents have the option to opt their children out of objectionable material, this process is only for instructional materials per Senate Bill 656. Those materials are easily found and listed on the VBCPS website. 30 seconds. Library materials are not easy for parents to become aware of and the process is not readily communicated on the site. The proposed library policy is reasonable, allows for a diversity of opinion, allows for parents who are comfortable with their children accessing explicit content to continue to do so, while allowing an easy and transparent ways for parents who do not want their kids to see such things to do that. This policy is something the entire board should fully support at the next meeting. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ginger Sherrick, then Russia Sherrick, then Matthew Cody Connor. Uh, good evening and thank you for your time. I'm freezing, but I've been assured that they didn't turn up the air conditioning and chase me away. So <laughs> I'm still Welcome. here. I'm still here. Um, I'm here as a parent and also now a grandparent, and I strongly support parental rights and the safety and well being of every child. I strongly oppose any decision, resolution, policy, or whatever you want to call it to keep information from parents. Please do not deny parents a voice in the safety and well-being of their children. And that's all I was planning on saying, but I want to say one more thing. I wish you would have been a little more respectful of the time of parents and grandparents that signed up to speak tonight. There were 69 that I see here. And so far, you can see a lot have already left. And, but I also am thankful that I was able to stay because this has been a very telling discussion on the resolution. And I want to publicly thank Ms. Manning and, and the other board mem members that want to keep parents informed. Thank you. Our next speaker is Russia Sherrick then Matthew Cody Connor, and then Colleen Clemenson. Good evening. I'm Russell Shirk, not Russia Shirk. Uh, and uh, I would like to go publicly and uh, concerning the proposed model guidelines from the governor's office, in particular parental rights. I am a parent of three children, adult now, that have gone through the school system, and now grandchildren. And until the child and the student reaches the age of majority, parents should be involved, just as they legally are, for their welfare and the requirement to go to school. And the decisions made, especially as it pertains to irreversible procedures that might be undertaken by a student in their growing emotional state as a teenager. And lastly, in regards to the resolution, I concur that the resolution needs to be re back to the drawing boards and that all of the members sitting here listening to me right now on this board should have their input on that resolution. And if it is redundant with policy that we currently have, then let's move beyond the redundancy and get to a new information that the resolution could address. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Matthew Cody Connor, Colleen Clemenson, and then David Cutchins. Welcome. Thank you. I'm a parent of students currently in Virginia Beach schools. 
Good news, though. I verified. I have full access to the entire catalog of books in my children's libraries. And as is my responsibility of a parent, when I review those books and find one that I don't think my children should read, I have the ability to fill out a form, which is easy to find if you know how to use the internet, and restrict access to my child to any book that I so desire. Parental rights 100% met. Take that policy that you sent to review, throw it in the trash where it belongs. It's a solution looking for a problem. I did hear speak about the, in support of this policy, about the coarsening of our society, and I have to challenge that statement. The sharing of who we are, our experiences, our stories, is not the coarsening of our society. It's the enriching and enlightening of it. It's how we learn respect for each other's differences, mutual respect for each other. How we learn to see the beauty of a raw natural gem and the truth that that gives us over a gym that has been reduced, that it might reflect light back in a preferred way, that it might fit nicely into our ring. As for the 2022 model school policies, that at their spirit, Mrs. Brown, is discrimination. And Ms. Franklin noticed that, or she would be so worried about walking back a policy that says we don't discriminate if a new policy comes down. Wouldn't have to worry about that if we didn't think those policies were discriminatory. But it's long past time we stood up to protect these kids. Week after week, students, parents, teachers of Virginia Beach, who you're supposed to represent, have stood in these chambers and overwhelmingly rejected these policies. We've shown you who we are. Mrs. Owens' policy gives you a chance to return that favor. And I saw Mrs. Manning's post on the website it's all about kids' sports. The waiver that was put up there to wave around in fear that's been around for a decade. And in that decade, you know how many people have filled out that waiver? Out of the millions of students that have attended Virginia schools, 28. The amount of effort put in to generate fear and outrage over a non-issue, it's pathetic. But I understand, I've heard seconds. this is about your religion your belief, your faith. Well, no, I too am a person of faith. I too believe in something greater than myself. I too have something for which I strive to become better, for which I sacrifice all. I too have a promise of redemption and immortality. My children, my children are my gods, and I will not let them be sacrificed to yours. Our next speaker is Colleen Clementson, then David Cutchins, then William Prettyman. Good evening, board. Welcome. I am David Cutchins. I want to preface my comments with the context that I prepared them, anticipating, presuming that this resolution was um, speaking, was, was saying that you're embracing the current northern policies and rejecting the Yunkin policies. I've heard you verbally deny that tonight, so I'll take that at face value, but I think there's some, still some material here that you should take into consideration as you consider the resolution and in the future consider the Yunkin policies. We appreciate the desire stated in the resolution's purpose that the proposal at this time is intended to create the opportunity for the school board to have a public dialogue regarding its commitment to protecting the rights of students and families. We've needed to have this dialogue. I think we all agree. It's been long too much time passed. The wording of the resolution sings the song of a commitment to building and protecting positive feelings and relationships in our schools. It speaks of freedom from discrimination and guaranteed protections all goals that we strongly agree with, whether in public schools or in our communities. But if this resolution is intended to embrace the current Northern policies, which I still suspect, and I, I'm interested that Mrs. Owens did not address Mr. Cowan's questions directly. What is, what is her intent? What is her stand on these, on these facts? What is the real intent of this resolution? We hear tonight is non-discrimination. We all agree with that. Why is that necessary now? But if, in fact, it is embracing, intended to embrace the Northern policies, you are, in fact, making yourselves the bully in the room. These policies marginalize, intimidate, and threaten many of your students, your teachers, your parents, and those in your community. 
This is specifically true for anyone who is committed to biblical principles, but extends to threatening the privacy of girls in restrooms and locker rooms and to denying girls their right for fair competition in athletics. I hear that that is not the intent, I hope not. One of the seven biblical principles of liberty is the principle that conscience is the most sacred property. The policies embraced, the northern policies embraced in tonight's resolution invade this most sacred property of conscience of the individual, instead trying to enforce consent to someone else's beliefs. But with these policies, you're also inserting yourselves as a government authority into the family and our homes, between the parents and their children. As Americans, we do not cede that right to the government. You are a government agent. 30 seconds. Biblical principles aside, this qualifies as communism. Some, are, some in our community may well desire this, but many of us do not. We urge you to open your eyes to the broader community and to the discrimination against many that you're fostering with the intent expressed by this resolution, if it is intended to embrace the Northern policies. We all care about these children. Hearing them at the board meetings grieves our hearts. They don't know how many prayers have gone out to them and the darkness. And that is time. Our next speaker is William Prettyman, then Sandra Frazier, then Douglas Kuyper. William Prettyman, Sandra Ann Frazier, Douglas Kuyper. Uh, number 22 had to cancel. Um, next person would be Jonathan Fox. Mark Foreman. Carolyn Kaywood. Welcome. <laughs> um, my name is Carolyn Kaywood. I live in Voting District 8, and tonight I am speaking for PFLAG Hampton Roads. We applaud the students who have advocated so eloquently and bravely at every Virginia Beach school board meeting for LGBTQ students within the district. Inspired by these civically engaged students, we support Ms. Owen's resolution. We understand that the district has every intention of providing a supportive environment for all students. However, in our support meeting for parents, we hear about continual microaggressions that occur every school day and that impact learning. These cumulative slights, biases, and misunderstandings affect student mental health and academic performance. Echoing what we hear from parents, the National School Climate Survey reports that LGBTQ students have lower self-esteem, lower GPAs, and are less likely to go to college. LGBTQ students report high rates of feeling unsafe in school and experiencing disrespectful language, verbal, and physical harassment. Our current polarized political climate is among the stressors that LGBTQ students endure daily. Students are well aware that states are passing laws to forcibly out them without their consent, to require language that disrespects them, to deny them health care, and to even harass and arrest their supportive parents. When this polarization manifests within the Virginia Beach School Board, it elevates the climate of fear and uncertainty for LGBTQ students. The Board of PFLAG Hampton Roads supports the 2017 National PFLAG Statement on Schools. PFLAG strongly advises public and private school administrators to implement comprehensive, inclusive policies and practices 30 seconds. to end bullying, harassment, and discrimination and create a healthy, safe, and welcoming learning environment for all students. 
It is for these reasons that the Board of PFLAG Hampton Roads has voted its unanimous support for Ms. Owen's resolution. Thank you. Our next speaker is Philip Egan, then Danella Seffert, then Homer Stinson, Jr. Welcome. Good evening. I'll be brief. Uh, we've all seemed to be in agreement on uh, some issues. Um, I can't help but think, though, the spirit of uh, Ms. Owen's resolution is simply to um, be a shot across the bow against Governor Youngkin's uh, policies, which are proposed, which are clear, uh, which make common sense, and which are formed a part of a referendum last year. So um, I feel like this is a more effort to resist it, to be deceptive, uh, to continue um, some form of CRT, but certainly not calling it that. And I strongly urge you to turn away from that. That is poison and that it, that it is still, these ideas are being promoted, is not an accurate rendering of history but it's poisoning our kids and setting them up for failure, both the oppressors and the oppressed. I fully endorse parental rights and whatever policies uh, uh, need to be enacted to allow parents to know what's happening with their kids need to be enacted. Thank you. Our next speaker is Danella Seffert, then Homer Stinson Jr. Number 29 wanted to go to online, and then it would be Virginia Bellamy. Danella Seffert, Homer Stinson Jr. Good evening. I live in District 4, and like many people, I listened to the students speak tonight, and I was very impressed. In fact, I can remember when I was serving in the uh, Navy, people saying, hey, you know, the kids today are so much smarter than we were when we were their age. Perhaps, but they are not more experienced than we are at our age. Not a one of those children, those young men, those young women, however you want to address them, has raised a child to adulthood. Not a one of them has paid property taxes into the school system. I have raised children. I have had a daughter, a lesbian daughter, here in Virginia Beach schools. I've had a bisexual daughter here in Virginia Beach schools between the years 1998 and 2004. I now have a granddaughter in the schools. So if you haven't noticed the trend here, there's that female component that I am very concerned about. And I don't think people fully understand or appreciate what is happening there. Yes, I'm glad to see that these individuals are active. I'm glad to see that they want to get out there and, and put forth their ideas. And I'm glad that they've been here for six months. But in my mind, you can tell me two plus two equals five for a year, and I still will not consent. I will not believe. To me, silence is compliance, and I will not comply. Now. One of the things that I've often found about the transgender argument is that nobody wants to look at it from the parent side. Let me tell you this. If my lesbian daughter had come to me and said, I am a man, I would have a problem with that. Why? Because I was there for the birth of a daughter. I raised a daughter. And now you're telling me, in fact, the transgender community uses the word dead name. And that is correct. My daughter is dead. And now I have an imposter who is telling me, I'm your son. I wasn't there for the birth of a son. I didn't raise a son. Now, you may not agree with that emotion, but understand that emotion exists. It is very real. And until you acknowledge it, until you're willing to accept it and understand that that is part of the equation, you will never, ever reach a solution that will satisfy the majority of individuals. I agree with your resolution. It sounds very nice, and I think it would be better off as a, hey, celebrate uh, you know, Pride we, uh, Month. That's great. But here's the thing. When you use the word shall, that's directive. 
That is a directive resolution. And so I hope that you'll go back and readjust that. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Virginia Bellamy, then Gary Richards, then Brian Kerwin. Virginia Bellamy, Gary Richards, Good evening. Welcome. I'm Gary Richards. I changed forms at midnight, and this is as good as it gets. Uh, in February of this year, the state of Arizona attempted to address uh, by legislation a lot of the things that we're talking about here. Uh, they had a, their legislation was SB 1700. Y'all may know about it. I don't know if it's passed, it's been marked up a couple of times. But in public comments, a special education teacher uh, made the following comments. She said, I have a master's degree. We all have advanced degrees. What do the parents have? Are we vetting the parents? I'll attempt to answer her question and I hope you'll accept my opinion. Parents have what I call the three R's. They have rights, they have responsibilities, and they have remedies. Uh, I'll read this off my card, my cheat sheet, because you may recognize the language. Under rights, they have the fundamental right to make decisions regarding the upbringing, education, and care of their children. That's the parents' rights. What I see the elected board, an administrative board, trying to do is perform a judicial function by eliminating the rights of parents. I want to remind you we have remedies for that. You're opening yourself up to lawsuits as soon as someone gets standing, both personally and as a board. On to the responsibilities, which I don't think you appreciate the weight of the responsibilities on the parents. By law, we're, we're required to help y'all in the deportment and the attendance but you're not required to help us with the care and feeding. 30 seconds. Other things of that nature. And you disregard us in these um, committee meetings here. Uh, this second time I've been before you, and like I say, I make a joke about changing form at midnight. But I had about 40 students go in front of us. I think you need to put the P back in the PTA. I think you need to emphasize parent, parents. And that is time. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Brian Kerwin, then Melissa Lukeson, then Beth Labar. Welcome. Thanks, neighbor. So, uh, Seems like from this discussion tonight about the resolution, you're gonna to have to pass the resolution before we all know what's in it, or at least what it means. If anybody's complaining about misinformation or the public doesn't understand, it's because literally, I've seen resolutions for over 30 years in politics. This is the worst written resolution I've seen in my life. At the very least, this policy, this resolution should be sent to a committee um, more than one person trying to write this, and the school board attorney should get involved so at least it could be written correctly. A few ideas. In a normal resolution, actionable items aren't in the whereas clauses. They're in the resolved section, but there are action items all over these whereas. Whereas clauses should be statements of fact, or background information, when you cram in action items for the board or for the school system, you're opening yourselves up 
through badly worded resolutions that people will read and have different interpretations of. You cannot, and I'll quote from the resolution, you cannot encourage, you cannot foster, you cannot build, you cannot value, you cannot express. You cannot direct that no one is excluded or discriminated or denied in a whereas clause. You want to do any of that? Put it in a resolved clause. That's what it's there for. Resolved is where you put your actions. As far as what's actually in this really tiny resolved section at the bottom, it says you'll do three things. You'll do what you're already doing, you won't break the law, and you'll put it in the minutes. Did someone actually work on this? I mean, are you really voting to tell the public that you'll do what you already do and you won't be criminals? Did you waste a whole sheet of paper on this or did you have multiple drafts? As written, this resolution has about as much actual meaning as resolved. We will continue to breathe oxygen and be it further resolved that we will exhale carbon dioxide. Someone actually knew how to write a resolution, actually wanted to enact the ideas that are hidden throughout this whereas section, you would have to define the, the terms like core values, and, and, and others have, have commented all the vagueness that is replete in this resolution. Um, 30 seconds. Don't play semantic games saying that the clauses about discrimination don't involve sports, because your wording clearly implies that if the VHSL suddenly decides to contradict your core values, you'll separate from them. And don't get me started on how you have a sentence about suicidal children right after you proclaim your authority to hide information from parents. Take this novice resolution to a committee, have more people and more eyeballs and more erasers work time. on it, and bring a real resolution. And our next speaker is Melissa Lukeson, Beth Labar, and then Don Labar. Good evening. Welcome. Ms. Manning. You bring dishonor to this body and incessantly waste the community's time with your performative politics. As the grand wizard of the Q Imams, you intentionally withheld the truth. This resolution has zero impact on school sports, which VHSL regulates. You know this, you could have addressed this uh, concerns with your constituents, but you would rather mislead people to whip up outrage, making them look like stooges in front of hundreds of people. This resolution only affirms that VBCPS will not enforce policies that discriminate against our most vulnerable students. If you are opposed to this resolution, you are anti-diversity and pro-discrimination. The mental gymnastics some of you performed tonight to justify your opposition would earn you a gold medal if it were the low information Olympics. The school board has received many hate-filled emails about this resolution. I sent a FOIA request this morning to identify the people who were dumb enough to put their bigotry into the public record for the world to see, incl including but not limited to their employers. As a business owner employer, I would certainly like to know if I had homophobic and transphobic employees working um, and interacting with my clients. I took some time to watch a recent sermon from Redeemer Presbyterian Church in Virginia Beach. Does that sound familiar, Ms. Weems, Ms. Manning? Uh, based on the camera angle, I didn't see you in attendance, but I hope you were present. The timeliness of his message was interesting. He said, quote, the kid at your school who is transgender, you should befriend them and accept them as they are, not demanding that they change, end quote. Your pastor also spoke of the erroneous belief that we are a Christian nation and the longing for the imagined nostalgia of Christianity coming back into vogue. He said, quote, for some of us, America is an idol. It is a golden calf, and I'm doing everything I can to get it back to where it was, the golden age of morality in our country. And then he went on to say, there is no golden age in a country that enslaved people and constantly used color to deny human dignity, and that's a quote. Platforming discrimination, hate, bigotry, to dominate the political process in this city, state, or country will put you on the wrong side of history. For any of you considering running for re-election next year, if you vote against this resolution that protects all of our students from discrimination or discriminatory policies like the governor's model policy, I promise to spend all 45 days of early voting handing out your voting records and talking to as many voters as possible. I will ensure all 108 precincts in this city are stocked with your voting records. 30 seconds. So you cannot lie to your constituents and pretend that you work for all people, not just those that make campaign donations and align with your antiquated belief system. And Ms. Brown, it's a cello, not a cello. 
Our next speaker is Beth Labar, then Don Labar, then Jerry Ann Dawson. Welcome. Hi there. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, I, I have to admit I'm an hour past my bedtime, so we're going to do the best we can. And I'll read what's written here. Uh, so I'm Beth Labar. Uh, I have two daughters in Virginia Beach City Public Schools and one daughter who's graduated a couple years ago. I'm also a school social worker for Virginia Beach City Public Schools. And while I was considering what I would say to you this evening, I thought about some of the negative statements I've heard at school board meetings over the past several months regarding transgender youth and, and as well as other, other things. Then I looked at the list of speakers for tonight and thought about how some statements made tonight may affect young people that are listening. This made me apprehensive and terribly sad, but I can't control what others say or do. I only can control my own actions. So I'm determined to highlight some positive observations that I've had throughout this process. My first observation is that we have tons of Virginia Beach City Public School staff and parents that care very, very deeply for our students. This is evident with the number of staff and parents who have spoken passionately about their views in this forum. What I truly find incredible, though, is the students who have attended each school board meeting over the past seven to eight months. They've organized students from high schools across the city to advocate for themselves and their peers at these meetings since the school year started. They are brimming with positive attributes. They have shown maturity far beyond their years. They have treated each other as well as people who have opposing viewpoints with dignity and respect. I see their compassion for others and it gives me hope. Whether we like it or whether we don't, these students are our future. By and large, the young, peop young people believe in equitable treatment for all and they have bought into the whole idea of celebrating diversity. Now the adults in their lives have a choice to make. We can praise them and support them, or we can try to slow their progress. For better or worse, this world is not what it was when we were children. I think that these wonderful kids who have spoken tonight will lead us into a better world where everyone is treated with dignity and respect. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me tonight. And thank you for the burden that you accepted when you chose to be on the school board. Thank you. Our next speaker is Don Labar, then Jerry Ann Dawson, then Sarah Clark. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Don Labar. I'm a Virginia Beach resident. I have, I have two kids in Virginia Beach City Public Schools right now, and I have one that graduated. Uh, I appreciate everything that you guys do for being on the board. I know that everybody has the best interests of children in mind. Um, I don't have a speech prepared, so I'm going off script. Uh, so I hear people say, we don't need a resolution to say that we're, that we're not, not against this. Of course, of, of, of course we're, we're, we're for this. Why do we have resolutions for Black History Month? Why do we have resolutions for Pride Month? is to tell people, to remind them, yes, we still think this way. And it makes no sense to me hearing people say that they don't, they don't agree with this policy. I do agree with clarification, and I think that Ms. Owens will make those clarifications. And I think that after she does that, I really don't see why anybody would vote against it, knowing that it's saying we're gonna keep doing what we've been doing. We're gonna breathe in air, we're gonna exhale air. Why would you not say that? Why would you not agree to that? Another thing I thought I heard a speaker talk about is we don't, we don't hate you to the students. <clears throat> and that made me think about when I was a kid, I had this, I'll tell you a quick story. When I was a quick kid, I had a, a neighbor and I was told, oh, that guy hates black people. So I thought, okay, well that's, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. So I asked him, I got friendly with him, and I asked him, so why do you hate black people? 
And he said, I don't hate them. I just don't think they should have the same rights that I do. That's what I'm hearing here. I don't, I don't hate these kids. I just don't think they should have the same rights as others. I just don't think they should have, be allowed to be called whatever name they want. I don't think that they should be allowed to have a counselor because they're different. They're not like us. That is hate. So I'm not here to talk about the uh, model policies or books or anything like that. I mainly came to talk about Ms. Owens' seconds. resolution. I think that she should adjust the resolution and I think that you guys should vote on the resolution. And if it is, like we say, what everybody agrees with, then everybody should vote for it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jerry Ann Dawson, then Sarah Clark. Number 38 was a duplicate, and then it'll be Cindy Little. Welcome. I have changed everything because a lot of clarification was made tonight with the resolution. I was going to talk about sports. No, I don't do social media. I saw the resolution. And I grew up in the 70s, Title IX. And there's a whole lot of stuff that went on. And it was all about sports. So I went to this idea that it was going to be about sports. So I had a lot of things down, but it wasn't because of social media. It wasn't because of anything else. It was because in part, the five, the fifth uh, paragraph, it says Title IX. And I went there. So um, I think there needs to be a lot of clarification done to the resolution. You can't just think that people jump to conclusions that everything is bad, but when you see something and you associate it with your own personal history, then it means something to you. So I think that there has to be something done about that, as well as, um, let me just see here, because I had all this written down and then I didn't have to need all of it, right? <laughs> Also, when it talked about the activities, it says the programs and activities. Well, the activities, from what I remember, I raised four children and came through the system here, and I now have grandchildren. But programs, activity, the program coordinator, or the activity coordinator, covered all the sports as well. So when you see the word activity, you think, everything in that category. And so I was also a sub thinking that that was gonna be in there also, that it all came to sports. And there's so much to say when it comes to that. Um, I just wanted, there was nothing that came out with the resolution. It was just like it just came out. It wasn't, there wasn't an opinion. I wanted to know why it came about why the proposal of the resolution was needed. I didn't understand 30 seconds. That. Sitting here hearing the ladies and gentlemen talking about, I understand what they meant. But there needs to be a preference before your resolution is just thrown out there. We need to have some clarification of where it's coming from so that we can understand better and be prepared for what we're gonna read. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Clark, then Cindy Little, then Annie Palumbo. Welcome. Good evening. I'm here to voice my support for Jessica Owens' uh, non-discrimination resolution. Acknowledging that the principles of respect and acceptance should guide our actions, it's important to affirm our support of LGBTQ rights and work towards creating an, an inclusive education educational environment for all of our students. Every student has the fundamental right to a safe and nurturing learning environment, regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity. It is our duty as responsible citizens and guardians of education to ensure that every student feels accepted, valued, and respected. As members of the school board, it is your duty to accept and protect LGBTQ students as they are 
not demand that they change. It's your duty to protect their right to a safe and nurturing learning environment. And it is not conditional upon you believing the same things that they do. It is not your duty to act as the morality police of the school division. As a member of this board, you are called upon to uphold justice. Even if you disagree, you have a responsibility to ensure that no students are being discriminated against. And if you only support justice for those who you agree with, is that really justice at all? I hope that you truly listen to all the voices that have come before you tonight to ask for your support. And I ask that you listen to hear and not listen to speak. And you might hear a lot of pain and worry from the people in your school division. You might hear the worry a 10-year-old child feels when they come home saying they don't know what to do when it's time to go to the bathroom because they have structured times they go and it's split by gender. You might hear the pain of a 10-year-old child when they come home and say they were called disgusting for joining the girls' team during PE. And you might hear the pain of a mother telling you that she had to tell her child that God does not hate them like the boy on the bus told them they do. And when you speak about seconds. whether you support this resolution, I hope that you ask yourself whether you're speaking because you feel like your way of life is threatened. And if the answer is yes, I ask you to stop talking and listen some more. If you are using your voice to protect the fundamental right for all children to feel a sense of belonging in a safe and supportive environment, then I thank you for advocating for the core values of putting students first and, and valuing differences. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cindy Little, then Annie Palumbo, then Lucinda Bedage. Cindy Little, Annie Palumbo, Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Annie Palumbo. I'm here representing Turning Point USA. A lot has happened since you banned me a year ago. I took a job with Turning Point USA to identify and train students to raise them up to promote freedom. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pop off so many chapters in Virginia, Maryland, DC, and Delaware, that it's going to make your head spin. I can't wait. Anyway, I wanted to read you the First Amendment. It protects freedom of speech, the press, assembly, and the right to petition the government for redress of grievances. You know, this school board violated my First Amendment rights. I could really sue this school board, but I haven't because I'm just a single mom. I don't have the money to sue you but you violated my First Amendment rights. And for those of you who don't know what happened, I know there's people on this school board that weren't here, and I'm thankful you're here, some of you, most of you, except for one. I was a mom who held up the pornography that was in our libraries. It was a picture of two men giving each other oral sex. I put it on poster board, and I yelled, why is this in our libraries? I broke no laws. I yelled and raised my voice. I was blamed for a lot of things and I proved it to be wrong. I FOIA'd, I did a FOIA request of all the videos in the hallways to prove that you guys were lying about me and we proved it. I got investigated, me, a mom, fighting for my kid and 65,000 other children. I got investigated with the city attorney and Mr. Jack Freeman. I was videotaped, I was made to be a criminal. I disputed every charge they had on me with video proof, texting proof, every kind of proof. I had people planted in the audience videoing. I was still banned. When I came to watch my friends that were, um, that were elected, thank God, I was, I was allowed to stay here for 45 minutes to watch this. Then I was called in the back and said, you must leave. And if you come back, you will have criminal charges. Criminal charges on me, a mom. 
fighting for kids because I yelled. What parent shouldn't yell? There's pornography in our libraries. Unbelievable. I'm being investigated, but the people who are distributing this pornography seconds. are not investigated. Let that sink in. Let that sink in. For 14 months, I have not spoken at this podium. Yes, I may get mad sometimes, but what parent shouldn't be? There is hardcore porn in our libraries. Hardcore porn. I'm not a book banner, but I'm going to fight to remove this. Stop trying to, to groom our children. They're children. They're little. This is porn. Stop it. And that is time. Our next speaker is Lucinda Bajan, then Amy Morris, then Connor Epley. Lucinda? Amy Morris? Connor Epley? Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Connor Epley, and I'm a former Virginia Beach City Public School student. Um, I support the resolution put forward by school board member Jessica Owens that solidifies protections for LGBTQ plus youth. There's a lot of uncertainty regarding the new set of model policies that may be sent down from the Department of Education, which would repeal many of the protections previously established for LGBTQ plus youth. Students, parents, staff members and other stakeholders have shown up consistently to these meetings asking for reassurance from the school board that Virginia Beach City Public Schools will continue to protect LGBTQ plus students from discrimination and that students can continue to learn in an environment that is affirming of their gender identity. It is important for us to remember that LGBTQ plus youth are at a significantly higher risk of self-harming behaviors and suicide particularly transgender and non-binary youth. One of the proven ways to reduce that risk is by creating a learning environment that is gender affirming and where students feel safe and accepted. I think this resolution will go a long way in making sure that LGBTQ plus youth feel valued and supported in our schools. It is also worth pointing out that any model policies that discriminate against LGBTQ plus youth or take away protections would be illegal under Virginia state law. The Virginia Human Rights Act, Act says that it is the policy of the Commonwealth to safeguard all individuals within the Commonwealth from unlawful discrimination because of, among other things, sexual orientation and gender identity in places of public accommodation, including educational institutions. This resolution would signal that the school system intends to remain compliant with this law, something I would hope all elected officials can get behind. Ms. Owens, thank you for drafting this resolution. I, I wish that a school board member had the courage, thoughtfulness, and compassion to sponsor a resolution like this when I was a student in the school system. Every single student who walks through our doors deserves to be protected and supported, LGBTQ plus students included. I hope that this resolution is adopted at the next meeting. As you have seen over the past several months, students from across the school division are watching the decisions you make as board members and as future voters will cast their ballot accordingly in school board elections. Um, I also just wanted to say something in response to a point that Ms. Franklin made. Um, I appreciate 30 that seconds. we wouldn't want to adopt a resolution just to have to retract it. However, I think the only way that would happen is if you all adopt discriminatory illegal policies that would go against the resolution. So that would be the only situation I would see you would have to retract that resolution. Thank you, have a good evening. Our next speaker is William Devins, then Erica Scarf, then Heidi Dragneff. William Devins, Erica Scarf, Welcome. I'm Erica Scaife, and I'm the parent of two current Virginia Beach students. I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight to speak to you, school board members, Dr. Spence, and most importantly, to speak to all the student speakers 
who have tirelessly attended every board meeting this year. These students have been incredibly brave and courageous in sharing their stories and experiences about themselves and their classmates. Their advocacy and activism have played a crucial role in bringing this issue to the forefront of our community's attention, and it's your responsibility as elected officials to listen to them. Now, I'm not gonna spend my time tonight explaining how important it is to protect these students. You've heard all the statistics and you've heard their stories so many times now that if you don't get the importance of this resolution to protect their rights, at this point, you're being willfully ignorant or your heart is genuinely just full of hate. I wanna make it clear though, if you do not support a resolution committing to non-discrimination against a group of students, you are saying very loudly that you are in favor of discrimination against students in Virginia Beach schools. And if you do in fact vote against Ms. Owen's resolution at the next meeting, your vote supporting discrimination won't be forgotten. During your re-election, we advocates will make sure that not a single voter will be unaware of your stance on discrimination against this vulnerable group of students. It will harm your reputation within the community and hurt your chances at any future office you may have your sights set on. Now some of you continue to bring negative publicity and media attention to VPCPS, and it's damaging to both the board members and the school district as a whole. You guys need to knock it off. Um, I'm gonna cut a little bit of this here because there's a couple things I wanted to address. <laughs> One thing was the gentleman earlier who told us about how if his daughter had come to him and told him that they were transgender, that that child would be dead to him. Those were his words. 30 seconds. Those are exactly the kind of parents that these kids need help with. These are why we need uh, policies that protect transgender children, plain and simple. He explained it to you as the guy who's going to disown their child for being transgender. So I, want, I really hope you guys heard that and saw that and think about that in, you know, as the perspective of that man's child and know that there's hundreds of children. And that is time. Who have the same kind of people. Our next speaker is Heidi Dragneff, then Alexis Gerdes, then Richard Pickens. Good evening. Welcome. Um, it's ridiculous that we have to do this. Uh, I have three daughters in schools here, one in elementary, one in middle, and one in high school. Two of them are part of the LGBTQ community. And I know that because my kids aren't afraid to talk to me and tell me and be open with me. It's not the school's responsibility to police our children, their gender, their sexuality, their genitals. Come on. It's absolutely baffles me that we're here to talk about the very basic protection for kids just because they are part of the LGBTQ community and you don't understand what that means or are accepting of it. And just because some parents want the right to discriminate against them, it's absurd, especially when we have real issues that we should be talking about and dealing with. Why would anyone be opposed to a resolution that would prohibit discrimination. All the people that come here to speak out against it are sending a message to their own kids. Those kids are then taking that message back to school with them and putting it back on those kids that we are trying to protect, becoming bullies because their parents are here being bullies. And what they say here is probably the best of what they're gonna say. So you can imagine when they're at home and how they speak freely when there isn't cameras and people watching and a microphone in front of them. Whether or not my kid is transgender, wants to go by a different name, wants to dress differently, isn't anybody else's business but mine. It's not the school's business, it's not the school's right 
It's not some other parent's right. I am so sick of hearing parents' rights because my rights matter too. My kids' rights matter too. They are human beings. They are growing into little adults. They're not staying kids forever. And our job as parents is to teach them how to go out into this world and be successful and thrive. I'd much rather be here to discuss what we could be doing seconds. for teachers. The teachers need our support. They don't need our hate. They don't need 1,200 parents telling them what they can and can't do in their classroom. They need supplies. They need help. They need better pay raises. We need to hire more teachers so that our classrooms are smaller, so they can handle the discipline that somebody so candidly pointed out earlier. And that is time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alex Gerties, then Richard Pickens, then Joshua Nicholson. Alex Gerties, Richard Pickens, Richard Pickens. Welcome. Hello, I'm Pastor Rich Pickens. I'm representing city elders of Hampton Roads and Virginia, which is a coalition of business leaders, pastors, and citizens engaging in uh, biblical governance. And I'm here to speak to Mrs. Owen's resolution and asking you to vote no due to the vagueness of the resolution, amongst other things. Paragraph one, you say, uh, we need to have a safe physical environment. So my question is, what isn't safe about the physical environment currently? Is there a loose brick in a stairway someplace? Are uh, beer cans being thrown at the cheerleaders by the football team from under the bleachers? I'm being a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but I'm realizing when I read through this, I thought, I have no idea what you mean by uh, a safe environment. What's not safe about the physical, and why don't you fix it now? And then there's... Uh, Paragraph three, calling for equitable education. My question, what isn't equitable about education now? Are there Christians being uh, graded down because they won't mark yes on evolution because they believe in biblical creation? And again, I really don't know because maybe you know, but we don't know. And so our question is, because we don't know, we're asking you to vote no on this resolution. Um, paragraph four, you say we need to eliminate unlawful dis dis discrimination. So my question is, what laws are being broken? How is discrimination presenting itself? There's no definition. There's no uh, understanding of what you mean by this. What's going on in the schools now that is unlawful discrimination? And again, we don't know. Maybe you know, but we don't know. And so because we don't know, we're asking you to vote no on this resolution. And you say there are issues of privacy. And I'm asking, whose privacy is at issue? That's a serious thing. If someone's privacy is being violated, is it the schools, the students, or the um, parents? And then I thought, it's probably what I've heard about. We're going to withhold information from parents about their kids. Well, that would be a serious thing. And to really challenge this group of people that that is a real strong bond between sons and daughters and parents that should not be violated. But I really don't know because it's not spelled out, so maybe you know, but we don't know. So I'm asking that you vote no on this resolution because of a lack of information. And then in chapters or in paragraph four, seven and eight, you say there's a 400% increase in people that are involved in um, 30 seconds. LGBTQ plus uh, behavior, and that's a very serious thing. And anyone who's been involved with, the, with suicide and dealt with that, that's very serious. But my question is, why is that happening? And what are the solutions for that? It's vague in this resolution. There's no understanding of what you're talking about. And so therefore, because we don't know, we're asking you to vote no on this resolution. I do believe in paragraph 10, respect for all people. If someone writes something beautiful, I will say it. And that is time. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Joshua Nicholson, then Camden Dunkerley, then Daphne Stack.
Well, I would say good evening, but now it's night, so good night. Welcome. Um, coming up on two years ago, I founded the first Colonial Gender Sexuality Alliance, and I'm grateful to see what Emily has done to fit this year. I founded the GSA with the goal primarily of education. Uh, after reading Eric Marcus, a prominent gay oral historian, book, Making Gay History. His own grandmother, after reading the book, came to him and told him, now I understand. Gay people just want to love and be loved like everybody else. And fundamentally, that is what this discussion is about. For LGBTQ students of all identities, both transgender, gay, lesbian, asexual, to exist not as a special privilege against some who have opposed the resolution, but simply as is their most basic right by nature as human beings. And that is why I urge this board to pass Owen's resolution. Because yes, there is an imperative to protect our children. The gay child who has a terror-inducing crush on his best friend and doesn't know what to do. The trans child who looks in a mirror and thinks, why am I not looking like I know that I am supposed to be? The asexual child who hears of their friend's crushes and doesn't know why they don't feel the same way. For the 45% of LGBTQ youth who seriously consider suicide, and the 18% who have crossed that line. This resolution is imperative to protecting those youth. And while yes, I understand some parents who have raised concerns about their own rights, because yes, it is difficult for a parent to understand that their child doesn't want to discuss certain things with them. It is also important to the child to protect their own identity until they are ready to come forward. I do not believe that any parent who has not themselves been in that situation can understand their child sitting with this idea that they are gay, transgender, and not knowing whether they can tell their parents. It is a long and arduous process and an arduous journey that the parents must understand. These are not children behind me. Children do not have to care about local politics. They do not have to come to meetings for eight months in a row every other Tuesday. They do not have to watch as their friends go home, suffer abuse from unsupportive parents, seconds. as their friends self-harm and take their own lives. The students behind me are not children, they are upcoming young leaders. And their voices matter. The school board can consider parents, but at the end of the day, this resolution mainly deals with these students behind me. It mainly deals with LGBTQ students. Their our experiences are what matters. They know more than anyone in this debate what the situation is in our public schools. And that is time. Our next speaker is Cam Camden Dunkerley, then Daphne Stagg, then Gail Flax. Welcome. Thank you. So last week, I sat at my desk writing yet another speech, but that really doesn't matter. After all, half of my speech really isn't applicable any, anymore. As Ms. Owens published her resolution, our group collectively let out a sigh of relief, and I'd like to begin by thanking you, Ms. Owens. I do, however, think the second part of my speech is still poignant enough to share. Not too long ago, I was on TikTok. A man who appeared to be in his late 40s, early 50s popped up on my screen. He sported a black baseball cap, a, an orange t-shirt, and sported a thick salt and pepper beard. The comment he was responding to said something to the effect of, wow, I've never seen a trans person with gray hair. This statement honestly threw me for a bit of a loop. I'd suddenly realized neither had I. I've seen adult trans people, even older trans people, but I've never seen a trans person with graying hair. We all know what graying hair means, and the vast majority of us fear the day it comes in. My speech continued on, stating that trans people aren't afforded that opportunity. The thing that the vast majority will cringe at, going gray, it's something trans people look forward to. All we want is the opportunity to grow, to grow up, to age. Ms. Owens, as someone who has seriously contemplated suicide due to similar policies in private schools before, before I was awarded the opportunity to attend First Colonial, thank you. I've poured over the words time and time again, attempting to show you how grateful I am, how grateful we all are, that you've made it safe for students to be students. Thank you. As I said in my first ever speech here, I wouldn't be standing here with you today had it not been for the gracious care and understanding I received during my time in VBCPS. 
I wouldn't have seen my 16th birthday, let alone high school gradu graduation, and I wouldn't be graduating college next summer. The VBCPS policies allowed me to do this. This may seem trite, but it's the God's honest truth. These policies allowed me to live. So thank you, Ms. Owens, not only for me and our group, but the generations of students that will follow. Thank you. Our next speaker is Daphne Stagg, then Gail Flax, then William Powell. Welcome. Good evening. Um, well, that was interesting. Um, he saved his life a few years ago when, when did all these policies start? I'm pretty sure he's been out of school since then. No? When did they start? Okay. Well, I'm just going to get through real quick what I support and what I don't. I support Kathleen Brown's policy. I do not support Jessica Owens' resolution that usurps parental rights. I do not support schools hiding information from parents. I do not support boys' and girls' bathrooms. I do not support pornography in the schools. I do support the protection of all students, but I do not support violating parental rights violating the 14th Amendment and ignoring Yunkin's model policies under the guise of student privacy. Um, people, a lot of people here that it's their first time here speaking, um, they don't understand how the policies and the resolutions work. And um, us who have been here for years speaking understand what uh, your words mean, Ms. Owens. Um, so after watching the, the school board meetings for the past several months with the VBEA lobbyist organization, which only has 7% of the entire Virginia Beach School um, belongs to, not 7% of the teachers, but 7% of the employees of Virginia Beach schools, and the drama students who um, you're, are used as political pawns, and um, you know, students uh, regarding the LGBTQ and transgender and decide the <coughs> medical services that they may require, is that something that the, the school board decides? I don't think the schools should be deciding what kind of mental health children are getting. These are children, they are minors, and. 30 seconds. Oh, crap. Okay, well, I want to bring, sorry. I want to bring something to your attention. Um, this is, uh, Jessica's resolution, and right on the front page, it says, in the light of proposed model policy changes by the Virginia Department of Education, which tonight Jessica Owens stated that her resolution does not reference the Yunkin model policies. It does. And this policy, 6-46, you might want to check time. it out. Our next speaker is Gail Flax, then William Powell, then Nancy McNamara Shepherd. Gail Flax. William Powell. Nancy McNamara Shepherd. Shauna Gugel. Hi, I'm Shauna Google. Welcome. And I am the mother of two female athletes. I know we've already addressed the athletic portion of this, but I just want to make sure we keep Pandora's box closed. I am here tonight speaking to save women's sports. I stand with Riley Gaines, a 12-time All-American swimmer from the University of Kentucky who swam against Leah Thompson, a biological male, in the 2022 NCAA Women's Championship, having to share a locker room with him at that event. I stand with Peyton McNabb, a high school senior in North Carolina, 
who sustained a severe concussion and neck injury in September when a biological male in a volleyball game hit her in the head. There's a great video on YouTube showing it. She continues to have effects from that injury to this day, include impaired vision, partial paralysis on her right side of her body, and unremitting headaches. As a result of the incident, she has urged state legislature in North Carolina to pass a bill banning biological male athletes from playing on female teams. A recent study showed that the average speed of a volleyball spike for a high school male is 40 to 50 miles per hour. A NCAA, a NCAA athlete, 50 to 60 miles per hour, and a male Olympian, 70 to 80 miles per hour. Compare that to the speed of a professional female volleyball player with an average speed of 50 to 65 miles per hour. There's a clear difference between the two. A 2022 study by the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health found that even years of hormone replacement cannot undo all the physiological advantages transgender women have over biological females. During puberty, the testosterone levels increase 20-fold in males, resulting in circulating testosterone concentration at least 15 times higher in males than females. This results in a much higher body muscle mass index, both the upper and lower body, and a higher cardiovascular output, longer bones, and a lower fat percentage. In 2021, recognizing these disadvantages, the House of Representatives passed the Protection of Women and Girls in Sports Act, a bill that would allow only biological females to compete in women's sports that receive funding under Title IX. I could continue to go on where in numerous sporting events, females are losing not only competitions, but records. 30 seconds. Recognitions and athletic scholarships to biological males that are now competing as females. We are not only physically putting our daughters at risk as seen with Peyton above, but emotionally also as girls will be sharing locker rooms with biological men. These years of middle and high school are hard enough on young ladies with body image and especially with hormonal changes they are going through starting their menstrual cycle. We as a medical community see enough anxiety and depression in this age group. Sports are a girl's way of coping with these situations. How many girls- And that is time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andy Bond, then Judith Ann Dungley, then Barbara Road. Hi, y'all. Welcome. Thank you. I think the best way to avoid the problem of uh, athletics not being part of this resolution is for the resolution to say athletics isn't a part of this resolution. And similarly, the best way to say that parents are not excluded as a result of this resolution is, because, is by saying parents are not excluded in this resolution. Because this resolution could be used by you to express discontent over all the other rules, high school league rules, federal rules, because it's not a change in policy. So I have, I have a number of concerns related to the involvement of parents. Um, at the beginning, we talk about a safe place in the middle in number seven youth who found their school to be LGBTQ plus affirming, what does that mean? And then welcoming and protection. All those words are undefined. And according to the Trevor Project in their model rules, parents who disagree with their children should be excluded in schools. Ah, the Trevor Project. It talks about suicide, and that's really why we're here. I think, or at least we should be. Their research is flawed and should not be used as a reference. I want to protect those kids that might commit suicide. And doing it their way is no guarantee that that's not gonna happen. Because using their own methodology, 
Respondents were recruited via targeted ads on social media. So it relies on trans supportive respondents for its research. So it's unlikely to include people who resolve their issues on their own. In other words, the other side is not represented. And in a blind medical test, you want the, all, the other, all the possible sides. 30 seconds. Or it won't include people who resolve them without medical intervention or who transitioned and now regret it. None of those people are gonna show up in a Trevor Project research. It's trash. It is, somebody will say, Fox News, oh, that's just reaffirming what people believe. Well, the Trevor Project does exactly that. It just restates what they, people who wanted and to that say. is time. So don't use it, please. And our next speaker is Judith Ann Dunkley then Barbara Road, then Thomas Conant. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Spence and members of the school board. My name is Dr. Judith Dunkerley. I'm here to speak as a parent, a teacher educator, and as a constituent. I am compelled to say that the opinions I'm expressing are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of my institution. However, on this evening, I certainly hope my university shares in my appreciation of Ms. Owen's resolution and, its, uh, and in its upholding of the constitutionally mandated separation of church and state. While we are free in this country to follow our chosen faith, we are not at liberty to weaponize it against others' freedoms and pursuit of happiness. For most of your students, the draconian trans erasure aspects of Governor Yunkin's Model 22 plan may have little personal effect. Yet, you can choose to protect the human rights of those for whom it will be absolutely devastating, including my son Camden, who, to correct Ms. Stagg, uh, graduated from First Colonial last year. In rejecting the implicit but deafening message of the proposed legislation that if a group is small enough, they do not deserve equal rights, the Model 22 plan implies that they can be ignored, erased, and their cries for justice can be silenced. I asked Ms. Franklin specifically if Model 22 demands that we adopt discriminatory practices, will you still support it? How do we teach students to be fair and just? We do it by standing up for what is inclusive and equitable as this resolution has done. The lesson learned by your students will be crystal clear. They will be taught the importance of rejecting discrimination while respecting the human rights of everyone, even those they may not understand, agree with, or even like. As a former elementary school teacher, an associate professor, and director of one of the largest teacher preparation programs in the Commonwealth of Virginia, I am professionally grateful for the efforts that went forward in the, went towards this resolution. I'm also very happy to provide the board with any research peer reviewed that backs up the Trevor Project's data, as well as any other research, including a book that I wrote with colleagues demonstrating the importance of having supportive teachers, counselors, and administration in schools in preventing uh, transgender suicide and self-harm. 30 seconds. Speaking as a mother, this life is affirming resolution upholds the promise of our children's future. Last Thursday, I watched Camden being inducted into the Phi Theta Kappa Honor Society. I'm sure that pride is understandable to every parent in the room. The tears I held back, though, were because without the support of Virginia Beach City Public Schools, the Legal Studies Academy, and First Colonial High School, I very well might have been mourning a child lost to state-sanctioned bigotry instead of celebrating this. And that is time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Barbara Rode, Thomas Conant, and then Michael Zydat. Barbara Rode. Thomas Conant. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm here to voice my opposition to Ms. Owen's res resolution. Let me begin by saying that as a Christian, those who struggle with gender identity challenges are not my enemies. And as much as I disagree with them that God somehow had a mistake in their creation, I will always care about them as those who bear God's image and are the object of his redemptive love. As I understand it, this resolution seeks to state the 
Virginia Beach City Public Schools' commitment to pro provide a safe, discrimination-free environment welcomes all students, and that's commendable. I had a lot of other things I was going to say tonight, but I've heard everybody else say what I wanted to say. Uh, I was going to speak about girls' sports, but that seems to be, uh, if it's true, that's not an issue. However, I still feel the document opens the door to that. Uh, nobody mentioned the uh, fact that it talks about activities, and uh, does activities include physical education, uh, where girls might be, uh, ha have to share locker rooms with uh, biological males? I, for one, don't want my granddaughter, who is a student in the Virginia Beach public school system, in a locker room where a biological male might be walking around unclothed. Uh, I don't know if any of you ladies on the board would like to see that in a locker room. I, I don't think I would like to see that. Uh, I, I, I also think that this resolution is redundant. It's been spoken tonight, s several times tonight, that we already do this. We already do not discrimination. We already have policies in place that prevent discrimination and have been doing a pretty good job of it. Why do we need to uh, have another resolution, especially one that uh, seems so vague, and, and that seems to be the consensus of many of you up there, that everything in there is vague, uh, it needs to be rewritten, needs to be redone. Why even have the? Why even have it? We've already got policies in place, so uh, that's about all I have to say. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Zidat, then Robin Tewitt, then Chris Chirico. Michael Zidat. Robin Tewitt, Chris Chirico, welcome. Good evening. This is my first school board meeting. Um, being in the military and moving around a lot, I haven't really got to call a place home, but I retired. Spent a half million dollars on a house because the school system looked amazing. Um, and then I saw this resolution and it's been nitpicked tonight and uh, I was trying to figure out <laughs> where I wanted to begin here. Um, I know it, this resolution had the best of intentions but had major flaws due to its vagueness and its all-encompassing words. Um, I do believe that parents need to be involved, involved in all decisions concerning their children. Uh, parents are the ones that raise their children. And um, it, just how vague this was, it brought up a lot of questions. Um, I like that uh, the parents have access to all the grades online. We can verify children's grades. We could verify that they've completed their assignments. Um, the school does have to ask for permission for sexual education classes, but this resolution, it's very vague, and will it allow children to keep these secrets from parents on, on affirming that it's okay to keep secrets from parents? Um, unlike the sexual education, I don't know if this also suggests that teachers can now talk to students about gender identity um, without approval of parents. I don't know what age the school and the teachers will start talking to students about um, gender identity. I mean, for a kid that's 10, 12 years old, the opposite sex already still has cooties. I don't think it's the right place, but it's something that has to be talked about. It's, this is all new. Um, the resolution speaks of the school being safe, a physical, emotional, and social environment for all that want, but they focus on the LGBTQ instead of combating the bullying. And of all the schools my children have lived in, this is by far the worst bullying school district my kids have lived in. I've never had one of my daughters come seconds. Home and say she was hit by a boy. And then I can't know what happened to that boy because the discipline isn't my responsibility. Um, I was going to touch on sports, but uh, all I 
just want to affirm is at 17 years old as an average male, I would still hold the women's world record in a couple events in track. Um, I was nothing special. So we and that is both. time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stephen Mannix, then Diana Howard, then Laura Hessler. Stephen Mannix. Diana Howard. Welcome. Hi, y'all. I'm tired. <laughs> anyway, um, I have some questions. Um, it seems to me like you're indulging these kids because I seem to remember that if you signed up to speak here, you had to speak on a Pacific policy, and if you weren't speaking on a Pacific policy that wasn't on an agenda, you were stopped from speaking and you were kicked out. So maybe that's why they've been here for eight months because that policy is no longer in effect. Okay. The other question is, what is in the um, actual um, discrimination, non-discrimination policy that you have now that is not in the agenda? Why is it that the children think that they need a resolution if the policy already saved this other child that's already in place. So why are they over here complaining that they're being discriminated against? Naturally, some people are not going to accept that they are not what they were born as. I mean, let's you know just be truthful. You were either born a boy or you're born a girl. You may not like it. You may think you are something else that you're not, but to try and force other people to use the pronoun of your choice, he, she, them, whatever, right? Is this policy supposed to make people use those pronouns just so that they feel better about it? I mean, I don't care if they want to be something that they're not, but to force it on everybody else or to take somebody to court or um, report them or punish them or whatever for not justifying something that's really not true. And in your policy, six point or six TAC 46, under extra, extracurricular activity, it says athletic teams. That is sports. So I can see why people in reading that little phrase there all got upset thinking, you're going to have boys saying that they're girls in the girls' locker room doing sports. So that's where that comes from. So can't say I'm for that. Seconds. And I don't think that the superintendent should be sitting up there. He should be on the end just like Mr. Linetti. And you shouldn't have students on the school board either. They shouldn't have more rights than the, than the parents. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker is Laura Heisler, then Alan Wakefield, then Dr. William Duke. Laura Heisler. Alan Wakefield. Dr. William Duke. Alan. Alan Wakefield. Hi, my name is Alan Wakefield. You're lucky I'm not uh, riding my Segway tonight. With my arm, I had rotator cuff surgery, so my wife's happy. Um, I was watching the school board meeting, uh, the last one, and somebody was talking about uh, banning books and whatever they were saying, but I was, it, it just got me to thinking about um, the Diary of Anne Frank. It was a major book to me that really influenced my life. And I always taught my kids, my kids came through Virginia Beach, and now they're in their 40s and, and away from home. Um, I always used to ask them questions whenever they read something, and it was very important to me. And I'd like to just ask you some questions, just as something to think about whenever you're reading a book. Do you ever get lost in time when reading a book? Do you ever travel to different places on the earth? 
Do you ever experience emotions when reading a book? Do you find new information when you're reading a book? Do you meet new people when you're reading a book? Do you go backward or forward in time when you're reading a book? Do you sense another person as being there with you when you're reading a book? Do you live another person's life when you're reading a book? Do you think about your morals and the other person's morals that that you're reading in the book? Do you compare your life to others when you're reading a book? And last but not least is, has your life changed because of reading this or any other book? And I, I don't see how any book could be banned because they all change your life. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. William Duke, then Jackie Savage. Welcome. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you for hanging in there, uh, hanging tough with us. It's pretty late, I know. Um, and thank you for uh, identifying me as uh, an educated person with a PhD. Um, uh, I uh, want to speak a little bit about science, just a little bit. I mean, science uh, is, uh, I, I had a, a wonderful career as a geologist and a university professor, and some of you may know that. I, I doubt any of you really <laughs> will remember it, though. But anyway, so uh, it, was a great, it was a great career, and I, I'm very grateful for all I was able to do with it. Um, at, the, at the heart of science and engineering and everything else is a notion we just accept it's axiomatic. Uh, and it's nothing more than that. It's a belief structure. And it is that we have uh, uh, the ability to perceive uh, through our senses and our extended senses we are to see the world as it is around us. And that what we see is really there and uh, can't be argued with. And, uh, you know, um, it also is the basis, this is, this is a, kind of a summary of objectivism, uh, 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 one of the major philosophical developments of the 20th century was the idea that uh, you could objectively uh, um, uh, perceive and argue positions, etc. cetera. Um, anyway, so, some things, we want to believe so badly that we fool ourselves, right? And uh, I don't, um, you know, men are not women and women are not men. They're different and you can't really change a man into a woman or vice versa. Uh, certainly a, a slight, slightly built young person, can't man, can't uh, put on a dress and some makeup and and uh, call himself a woman and expect people to take that seriously. That's why you get so much resentment from the people who've come and spoke, who are older and grayer. And maybe the old, the people who are old and gray seconds. because there's so few, uh... anyway, I'll, it doesn't matter. The, the point is, I think at, at a higher level than any of these discussions, we have to worry about the fact that teachers are allowing our, our students, their students, to live in a dreamland. 40% uh, of New York third graders want to uh, change their sex. That's what I heard. Uh, doesn't that strike you as odd? And that is time. What are the teachers teaching? And that is time. Our next speaker is Jackie Savage. Okay, um, we had a speaker move from online to in person, Anastasia Wells. Welcome. Hello. The resolution proposed by board member Owens is a sheep in wolf's clothing. The guise of supporting mental health for vulnerable student populations is actually establishing a very dangerous precedent for all of our students by opening and exposing these children to increased risks of abuse and trauma. The, per the parenting role is sacred and I for one am not surrendering or delegating that to this board or anyone else. 
Ms. Anderson, you started off and claimed that we are misinformed and misled, but I assure you that was a grave miscalculation. The resolution repeatedly calls for inclusion, but is actually describing and laying the precedence for acceptance. To be clear, inclusion and acceptance are two separate items. Inclusion is defined as the act of including someone or something as part of a group. Acceptance is the action of consenting. This differentiation is critical to understand because continuing to include LGBTQ children in the school system is vastly different than consenting to students accessing bathrooms, activities, and programs that are set apart based on biological gender. In love and truth, I clearly state that gender is binary, gender is biological, gender cannot be changed. I believe all students should be included with equal rights and access within the school system, but I do not consent to transgender or gender expressive students gaining entrance to activities and spaces designed in respect of biological differences between boys and girls. I believe all of our children are fearfully and wonderfully made with unique design and purpose set forth by our heavenly creator. They all deserve to be kept safe. Secondly, this resolution cites mental health concerns without acknowledging the fact that gender dysphoria and gender confusion are actually psychological disorders. Dr. Fleischer, an adolescent and child psychiatrist at the Boston Child Study Center, clearly states, teenagers and young adults have had rising rates of suicide compared to 10 or 15 years ago. Developmentally, their judgment and decision-making abilities are still coming online. The prefrontal cortex, the brain's executive control center, does not fully develop until the mid-20s. So you see, we agree that based on the de developmental stage and age, children are vulnerable to suicidal thoughts and actions. The National Health Institute identifies mental health disorders as a key risk factor factor for suicide and self-harm. So statistically, it is devastating, but not surprising, that LGBTQ students are at an even higher risk. We do have a mental health crisis on our hands, but this resolution does not, in fact, provide any resolution. 30 seconds. We know mental health crises are real, our children are suffering, but we also know a crisis can be episodic, short-lived, and even prevented. That's right. This means we have the ability and obligation to model, teach, and empower our children of all ages how to persevere, utilize healthy coping mechanisms, and develop resiliency. If the true priority here is the mental health of all of our children, then let's work together to improve protective factors for reducing the risk of suicidal behavior. These protective factors, according and to the Child time. Mind Institute, include developing and that is time. abilities. Thank you. Madam Chair, that was our last in-person speaker. We're going to move on to our online speakers. Our first online speaker is Susan Saltesiak. Please unmute. Welcome. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Thank you. Um, hello, my name's Suzanne, and I'm coming to speak to you today to share my desire with the over 100 speakers that signed up tonight that we all want to see where everyone stands. Your voters have shown up. They want to know where you stand. And Mr. Callan, about your questions earlier, I'd, I'd really like to know your answers to those questions as well. I, I've heard a few concerns from people in your district that had you knock on the doors about saying why you were running for school board. Um, so, uh, you know, if we're going to open up a new can of worms about discussion that, you know, I'd very much like to know those. Um, I will share that I am a current parent and graduate, and like Mr. Connor, I've unlocked my parental rights and have easily accessed library materials and been emailed the forms, and I actually know how to email my principal too. But what I really wanted to get to was hearing the discussions tonight about the spirit of the resolution. Let's actually shift to the spirit of that law, the Virginia state law that brought us all here, 22.1-23.3, Treatment of Transgender Students Policies. The Department of Education shall develop and make available to each school board model policies concerning the treatment of transgender students in schools that address common issues in accordance with evidence-based practices and include inform information guidance, procedures, and standards relating to non-discrimination laws, maintenance of a safe, there's that word, and supportive learning environment free from discrimination and harassment for all students, prevention of and response of, to bullying and had, harassment. It goes on, enforcement of uh, student privacy, confidentiality of sensitive information, participation in sex specific school activities. There's another word that's come up tonight and events of use and events and use of school facilities. Activities and events do not include athletics. It's in there. 
Each school board shall adopt policies that are consistent with, but maybe more comprehensive than the model policies developed by the Department of Education. So let's put aside whether any proposed model policies that Youngkin's VDOE will honor the spirit of this law that was passed by the state of Virginia, because it's not out, we don't know what it will say and if it will reflect the spirit of that law. But the resolutions tonight certainly reflects the spirit of that law, just like it supports the spirit of the 14th Amendment and the other seconds. federal laws already put out there. Um, the confusion about the resolution means some of its terms start with this. It might be helpful to look at also the policies that are already in there rather than coming and asking about them. They're online, you can go look at them. If So maybe before you say you don't understand the resolution, you can look it up with it. Just because you don't agree with the policy doesn't mean it's unclear. And finally, about resolutions, we do several resolutions every month. And that is time. Why is there no outcry? Thank our, you. Our next speaker is Jerome Bell. Please unmute. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. First of all, um, I'm reading from the Women's Sports Foundation. Okay, and it says athletic programs are considered educational programs and activities. This is described in Title IX. And I looked at that first sentence and I said, oh, wow, where did I see that at before? It's right in, um, in you know, her resolution. Okay, because, you know, she, let's just be honest, okay, she, she tried, she tried. But, but she failed, okay? It was a rather poor attempt, but it was kind of sneaky to try to put that in. And I just want to know, I'm kind of insulted that individuals on the board and some of the parents and the one lady that actually threatened everybody's jobs who disagreed with her and, and, and you know, whatnot, they stated in some way that I and others, and I just speak for myself, have, have been misled by uh, Victoria, Vicki Manny, insinuating that pretty much that I can't read on my own I can't comprehend what I read, you know, that it had to be something that Vicky did to coerce us, uh, us to do this, you know, but and I'm pretty well educated and I can read on my own. But now if Miss Owens didn't mean it that way, you know, the, you know, she didn't mean, you know, what she wrote, then, you know, that's pretty much her issue. And I, and I think maybe next time while she's rewriting it, since she's going to rewrite it and take out or whatever that she uh, sends it past Miss Linetti, I believe that's the attorney's name first, because there's a lot of things in there that could really get her in trouble um, as far as lawsuits wise. You know, and, and I don't really understand why you have to have a resolution if you already have a policy specifically protecting and uh, the treatment of LGBTQ and trans students that you, you all admit it that you already follow. Okay, so why have this resolution at all? Okay, and so, you know, um, in her resolution also, and this is one thing I want to touch on as well, because you know, I I I'm not, I don't know who our are uh, who who our is in her. So I think this is number three. It says Virginia Beach Public Schools encourages staff, parents, and students to respect differences, value the diversity of our school community, and express themselves in a manner that is reflective to our core values and beliefs. Now, when I read core values and beliefs, that's you know what I believe in. That's probably religion. You know what I believe in religion, um, and it says that promotes equitable education for all students. So, yeah, I would like to know what is what is our core beliefs? Is it your core beliefs? Thirty seconds. Or is it my core beliefs? Because my core beliefs don't believe in the LGBTQ. You know, as far as you know, uh, you know, like my household or whatever. Or whatever. So, now I would like to know. Uh, really, you need to clear that up a little bit. And also, um, uh, as far as being being legal, okay, you want to you know, really split up a uh, child and their parents, you can't even uh, change their name on legal documents in the school. On their diploma, you have to put their real name. So why should people have and to that call is them time? or be man mandatory? And that is time. Our next speaker is Amy Solares. Please unmute. Welcome. Amy Solares, please unmute. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, speaker number four is not online. Speaker number five is Dr. Brad Nadelstein. Please unmute. Welcome. Thank you very much. I appreciate you guys all staying up so late to, uh, to hear all that we have to say. 
Uh, I have no doubt that the students who spoke on behalf of the trans kids, both those kids that are trans and non-trans, have the best interest of their LGBTQ friends at heart. However, the constant division and singling out of identity groups, as we've been doing not just in this issue, but in all issues over the past few years, only serves to foster more division in the children and adults. So all students are already equal and already equally protected. So students, if you have to change, we all have to change how we disagree on these things. If the students are listening, please don't do it like most adults do. Don't vilify those who disagree with you. They don't hate you. They don't want to take away your rights. None of these people want to do that. They may not agree with you, but they're not out to hurt you. Many of the school board members were, were wrong about so many things, masks, vaccinations for kids, COVID policy in general, yet not one school board member who was advocating for the masks and fighting so passionately to keep our kids out of school and in masks, never once did they admit they were wrong. They predicted severe health consequences to the children and the, 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 the adults, and they were all completely wrong. If, so they, within you know, in-person classes and masks, mandates were dropped, no one got sick, they were completely wrong. So why should we think that the same school board members who ha have made all those mistakes have any more wisdom than the parents and the families? We need to leave these choices to the parents and the families and actually concentrate. We've spent hours tonight, hours on this resolution. We need, we have so many bigger problems in this, in the, the school, in the uh, Virginia Beach school system. We need to be concentrating on that. Yes, we're all reaffirmed. We're all uh, equal. Everyone knows that. No one's saying that you're not. So I think it would be the adult thing to do for the other school board members who are, who are pushing this resolution to reassure the students that even the school board members that don't agree with them don't hate you. They don't think that you're a bad person. They don't think you're going to burn. That None of these things. And they also don't want to take away your rights. So all those school board members who are pushing this resolution and believe that, if you really want to model good behavior for these children, tell them that the other school board members and the public don't hate them or wish them ill and don't feel any animosity towards them. They just disagree. We all have to learn how to disagree. 30 seconds. Soon. And that's all I have to say. Thank you again for staying as late as you did, school board members. Our next speaker is Vic Nichols. Please unmute. Welcome. Welcome. One, survey indicated 75% of managers believe Gen Z is harder to work with than other generations. 65% need to fire Gen Zers more commonly than other generations. An eighth have fired a Gen Z member within a week of a start date. 34% who find Gen Z tough to work with prefer to hire millennials. Kids have no business advising the school board. Two, who sees and hears the girls raped, beaten, and injured? Why the blatant hatred and bullying on them? There is no constitutional right to access opposite sex bodies due to mental health issues. Plainview, Texas South Elementary school kids didn't go to school yesterday due to threats to the school admin. Teachers and district officials were covering up a first grade girl sexually assaulted by multiple boys in her classroom with a teacher in the room filled on a school iPad. The iPad was seized, recording viewed, child services investigated, the incident swept under the rug. Wasn't until she refused to go to school because she was forced to sit next to her abusers, her parents found out and protested. Megan Simpkins denounced the Riverside Unified School District Board for allowing a trans student to use the girls' locker room and bathrooms. Her remarks were due to a viral video showing him pushing and punching two smaller girls at the school. Parents and students said he had a history of showing his genitals in the bathroom and locker rooms. In Peru, in Peru a police arrested a 42-year-old man dressed in a schoolgirl's uniform, hiding in a restroom at a girl's school. A Nana Emo BC mother was threatened with arrest after confronting a trans-convicted pedophile watching girls undressing in the swimming pool locker room who claimed it was his human right to watch them. Sun Prairie Area School District had an 18-year-old trans person expose himself in the female shower to, the, to four 14-year-old girls. They were shot, closed their eyes, and tried to leave the showers as quickly as possible. As of 4.30.23 in England, trans pupils are barred from competing against and using changing rooms and toilets of the opposite sex. Nearly 20% of teen girls experienced sexual violence in 2021, according to the CDC. It's one factor that is exacerbating the crisis in teen girl suicide. Return to the facts. It is time to protect girls. Thank you.
Okay, speakers seven through 12 are not online. So our next online speaker is Janine Baker. Please unmute. Welcome. Ms. Baker, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Judy Baker. At the beginning of the meeting, school board member, I'm sorry, I've got two things on. Beverly Anderson said many have been misled on social media regarding the transgender proposal. I was not misled. I read the proposed resolution, the previous state law and the new state law soon to be enacted. Also offensively was school board reading, chair reading the similar statement. The Owens resolution is flawed because it says, we'll adopt no policies in violation of state or federal law. It will. I hope all of you will vote against Owens resolution. I ask school board member of district two to vote a, how her constituents would want, which would be against the resolution. 63% of district two voted for candidates who would be voting against this. So please respect that. Only 36 voted for. It's quite disturbing for school personnel to think that they have the right to decide what is best for someone else's child. They wouldn't want someone to do that to them. So I'm not sure why they would think it's okay to do it to others. Owen's proposal oversteps parental authority, students first, parents always. Another comment, the young people who spoke referred to the Trevor project over and over, no other references. It concerns me that they may have been led to think a certain way. And just a couple other notes I have. Um, the superintendent should be sitting on the edge as not to disrespect the elected officials that are there. Um, everyone was divided into groups. Division 101 is damaging. Why is one group being placed over another? It just, let's see. These are just notes I made while people were talking. 30 seconds. Um, this proposal disrupts the band between children and parents. And that's probably it. Thank you. And thank you all for being up so late tonight, starting early and ending late. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sandra Scheinebarger. Please unmute. Sandra, please unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Let's continue. Okay, good evening. I'd like to remind everyone of the reasons for the library policy 6 65. Quite a lot of trust was lost regarding the vetting process of adding new titles to our school libraries. Several sexually graphic items somehow just slipped through the cracks. One item with specific instructions for a sex act was in our library that another item couldn't even be read to adults at a public meeting because of its sexually graphic content. I appreciate the insight shared by a few librarians at the last school board meeting. At least two or three librarians mentioned that four to 500 book titles are added every year. Why are so many titles added? Why, why not a more manageable amount? for our librarians. Fewer title additions will, would help with the vetting processes. Why are some school board members refusing an opportunity to make a common goal of restoring public and parent trust in our school libraries? Why are some school members working to decrease trust by creating histrionic political fodder? If there are future issues, everyone knows the policies can be modified in the future, so the political fear-mongering can stop. As the parent with two children, 
in Virginia Beach schools, I support policy 6-65 as currently written. Um, it's a functional compromise that favors minimal action. It favors much less action than many would prefer. We're talking about generating a list that helps inform parents and helps build relationships with parents. It's a tool to begin restoring parents' trust in our school libraries. To reject 665 strongly implies a lack of concern for parents' and voters' trust. Now, switching gears separately for the 12D item, um, I, the author of the resolution did not answer Mr. Callan's direct question. That, to me, that doesn't seem trustworthy. Um, no, item number four, it's been already discussed, but, um, but it did appear to me um, to arrange to hurt our young women on our middle school sports teams. Um, number nine, whereas number nine, um, provide governance free from, that sounds like a loophole to avoid notifying parents of their own child's issues that may hurt families more than it helps. Earlier, three transgen transgender students shared that seconds. they now have support from their parents. Withholding information from parents would likely have prolonged any dysfunction and thwarted their successful reconciliation. I also have found that it's been uh, very easy for all of my children's teachers to contact me. I would wanna know if one of my kids was um, claiming to be transgender and I would wanna support my child as, as I support the rest of the transgender community. Um, also, please consider restoring- And that is time. Our next online speaker is David Karen. Please unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Yes, hi. Well, I, um, <clears throat> I'm the last speaker, I guess, so uh, I'll try to make it as brief as I can. Uh, I wanted to speak tonight about the resolution that was brought forth by Mrs. Ellens. Um, well, looks like she had two of the four information items, which you know, we have um, as many school board members as we do, and for one school board member to be bringing, you know, two two different things, you know, it seems like she's definitely hijacking the agenda here to an extent. And so, uh, to me, it seems like a lot of political grandstanding going on. You know, we've got all the the news organizations reporting on it. Uh, might even go national. You know, who knows? You know, bring in all kinds of attention here to Virginia Beach. Um, you know, I don't like that sort of thing happening, you know, over, over this situation. It uh, just seems like she's, she's really trying to, to bring the attention, you know, to her. I don't know if she has like future goals politically or whatever she's trying to do, but uh, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. You know, she's saying, I heard a lot of word salad about what the, you know, what the resolution uh, does or doesn't do the transgender resolution. And so um, at the end of the day, you know, it seems pretty pointless. You know, she can go back and go back to the drawing board and restructure it, redraw it, whatever, you know, she wants to do, but it uh, seems seems pretty pointless at the end of the day. And I'm hoping that eventually uh, it'll, it'll just fade away and uh, that'll be that, so. And uh, with that, I wish y'all a good night. Okay, Madam Chair, we do have um, three extra speakers. Um, our next speaker is Dottie Holtz. Please unmute. Welcome. Good evening. Am I being heard? Yes. Yes. Hello. We can hear you. Oh, well, good. Good morning, school <laughs> board chair, Ms. Briggs, school board members, and Dr. Spence. My name is Dottie Holtz. I'm a retired teacher and a former member of the Virginia Beach School Board. All 11 of you have come here tonight with your minds already made up. We know that, you know that. You've already decided how you plan to vote and it would take a lightning strike for some of you to change your vote. Even though in these last weeks, we have been heard, you've heard over a hundred students and parents and educators pleading with you, pleading with you that their civil rights be recognized. This is a civil rights issue. An attack on parents, transgender youth is an attack on civil rights. That is why I am here to support the Honorable Jessica Owen resolution. As a member of the civil and human rights community, 
I call for the full inclusion of all students, targeting and excluding transgender students from participation in school programming is harmful to all of our students and it undermines the learning environment for everybody. If schools treat some students effectively as outcasts, they foster an environment where no student is included and safe. I reject the bigoted, ignorant, mean-spirited, and discriminatory policies that I have heard here from this board in the past, some of you. That's exactly who you are if you vote against this resolution. I repeat, bigoted, ignorant, and mean-spirited. You cannot seek to exclude transgender people and make these members of our community invisible. They are here and they are not going away. I'm calling on you tonight to commit yourself to meaningful policies that support equal opportunity and to reassure all students in Virginia Beach's classrooms that they will have the chance to learn, grow, and thrive. There is one person on this board who is driving this opposition, and several of you are being herded like sheep for her political agenda. Make no mistake, she is no shepherd. She is the wolf in sheep's clothing that your parents warned you about. Please have the courage to break out of the pack and think for yourselves. Whether you vote tonight or sometime in the future, you will be recorded. Your vote will be preserved on video, and the community and I will hold you accountable. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Bohan. Please unmute. Welcome. Hey, school board. It is definitely a late one. Um, I am coming to you tonight to oppose the resolution by Ms. Owens. Uh, I think it is kind of redundant, a little pointless. Even Ms. Anderson stated that it just reiterates policies that are already in place and really doesn't enact any new policy. So initially, I was just going to say that it's pretty much just virtue signaling and pandering to the students that have been coming for months. You know, why is it now coming around um, when they've been coming for months? Um, they were wanting some recognition. This is, I guess, that recognition. But, you know, why now? Um, but, you know, initially I was going to say it's all of that, but it seems more likely to be set in place to frustrate any future passing of any model policy coming from the young administration. You look at the background summary for the proposal itself. It says the school board has received many public comments and communications concerning its intent to protect the rights of students and families in light of proposed model policy changes by the Virginia Department of Education. That's why this is coming out. It is not because of them. I think Ms. Owens is trying to frustrate future policies that will come into play, future model policies. So, and it just seems like when you kind of open up this can of worms, you're going to open up a lot of other cans. Like, are there any protections for the district against claims from students or former students who received unsound, unethical, or inappropriate direction or encouragement from staff regarding mental or physical health? You know, what about lawsuits from parents or withholding information? Are you really prepared to become the next Loudoun County with scandals about this? Um, I just think it's, it does need to be, you know, redrafted. It just needs to go away because it, it is redundant. Um, also, I don't think that students should be on the school board. You know, we elect our representatives. They are already given preferential treatment to speak first. I mean, you had 27 of them today. So they are they are well heard. Um, and that's all I got for tonight. Okay, our last online speaker is Amy Solares. Please unmute. Welcome. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. No, now you now you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, sorry guys. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, I know being one of the last speakers, you've already done some business and covered some of my topics, but I'm gonna go ahead and speak anyway. We shouldn't have any 
even have to go here, but I'm going to start by sharing Virginia Code 18.2-374, which states it unlawful for anyone to have in their possession or ready to prepare to publish, sell, or lend a seed material. And 18.2-383 lists exceptions to this rule, which only apply to higher education. Nothing about grade school exists in any of the exemptions. For certain members of this board, Ms. Owens, to use scare tactics and lies about a bylaw which supports the state law, saying it will ban books, including those that contain the state flag, and it will make librarians have to read every book, is reckless and irresponsible. Support the library media bylaw as it is. Jessica Owens' transgender resolution is way too broad and dangerous for our students. Without boundaries, other students' privacy rights, both male and female, are in jeopardy. I support all students, I support parental rights to their own children, and I support biological girls competing against biological girls. You should not pass a resolution that is so broad because it can and will be interpreted in many more ways that will most definitely damage our children even more. I oppose the student rep on the school board bylaw created by Jennifer Franklin and Jessica Owens. We are seeing the repercussions of what is happening when our children are listened to more than the parents and community members and teachers. Teachers are frustrated and leaving. Bad behavior from the students is off the charts. The lowering of our standards of, the of our education and parents pulling their children out of the public school system. Students are already allowed to speak up at the school board. In fact, they are on an equal level as the adults, even allowed to speak before the adults, which I'm, I don't necessarily agree with. I would never agree with this one particular speaker from earlier this evening, but I will say on one point, I totally agree with her in that it is absolutely ridiculous that we are having to discuss these kinds of issues when school board members should be focusing on the standards of our education, the teachers getting resources into the classroom and students bad behavior, which is keeping our teachers from being able to teach. But here we are. So I'm asking you to support the library and me library media bylaw policy 6.65 as it is written. Do not support the transgender resolution created by Jessica Owens and oppose the student rep on the school board. Thank you. And that, Madam Chair, was our last speaker for this evening. Okay, so that brings us to our consent agenda 14. The following items are on the consent agenda this evening. A. Resolutions, the School Nurse Appreciation Day, Ms. Anderson will read that. B, Policy Review Committee, the PRC recommendations. One, Policy 2-3, uh, Consultants. Two, Policy 3-68, Employee Lactation Support. Three, Policy 4-29, Employee Lactation Support. Four, Policy 4-29. 4-34, Personnel Protection from Assault, Other Acts. 5, Policy 5-19, Pregnant and Parenting Students and Lactation Support. C, General Fee Schedule for uh, Fiscal Year 2023-2024. Are there any objections to the school board voting on the consent agenda items? If so, Please identify any item that should be moved to the action agenda. Hearing no call to move an item from the consent agenda, I call for a motion to approve all of the items on the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Was that Ms. Ms. Belnick? And seconded by Ms. Franklin. Okay. Um, Yeah, now I need you to read the resolution, Ms. Anderson, on School Nurse Appreciation. Resolution for School Nurse Appreciation Day. Whereas school nurses are individuals in the forefront who work with families, teachers, and administrators to ensure students of Virginia Beach City Public Schools have the safest and healthiest possible environment in which to learn. And whereas a good health is essential to the learning process and student achievement. And whereas the goal of every professional school nurse is to help each student reach or maintain an optimum level of wellness, and whereas school nurses provide direct nursing care 
provide health screenings and follow-ups, provide health-related programs within the school system, provide health counseling, and act as resources to teachers on health education issues. And whereas school nurses serve the children of Virginia Beach schools with dedication, working diligently to make health a priority for children during their regular school day. Now therefore be it resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach designates May 10th, 2023 as School Nurse Appreciation Day in Virginia Beach. And be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board adopted by the school board of the city of Virginia Beach this ninth day of May, 2023. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. I call for a vote to approve the consent agenda as presented. All in favor, please raise your hands. Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes. The motion did pass. Okay, all, there's no one else to vote. Okay, so it's... Mm -hmm. Someone missing? No one stepped out. Mm. Okay, we're on the action agenda, personnel report, administrative appointments. A call for a motion to approve the May 9th, 2023 personnel report and administrative appointments. Do I have a motion? Ms. Um, Martin and I second it for Mrs. Owens. Any discussion? Okay. A call for a vote to approve the May 9th, 2023 personnel report and the administrative appointments. All in favor, please raise your hands. Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes. The motion did pass. Okay, the 11th person stepped out. So Dr. Spence, do you have any administrative appointments? We do, thank you. Um, we're pleased this evening to recognize Laura Purvis. Uh, Ms. Purvis has uh, served as a teacher at Shelton Park Elementary School, Thoroughgood Elementary School, and Independence Middle School, currently serving as a teacher at Plaza Middle School. I believe you heard her name earlier this evening as well in one of our recognitions, and we're pleased this evening that you have accepted our uh, recommendation for her to serve as the coordinator of the middle years program at Plaza Middle School. So we'll congratulate her and have an opportunity for you all to recognize her in person at your next meeting. Thank you. So uh, we're on B, the budget transfers. I call for a motion to approve the budget transfers within the fiscal year 2022-23 operating budget as presented in the agenda packet. Do I have a motion? So moved. Ms. Melnick, do I have a second? Ms. Martin, is there any discussion? Uh, yeah, I got a question here. So did this come up before and I didn't see it? Or is this the first time we're seeing this? Okay, I did miss it, I apologize. Yeah, it was on information, the last one. All right, well, let me ask one question anyway. Okay. I know I feel bad for missing that. Um, I mean, my, my number one takeaway from this is that uh, we overfunded health insurance. Excuse me, say it again. My number one takeaway from this is that we overfunded health insurance by a pretty big chunk. We overfunded health insurance? Am I reading this right, that we're taking money from health insurance to move to other accounts, and that totals $3.8 million? Okay, Ms. Pate, would you please? Yes, sir. Um, with there, and when we do budget health insurance, we budget for everyone and the positions that are in those cost centers. And so due to any vacancies or changes in in positions that may retire and come on new. Some people don't take health insurance. So part of this process that we do, um, we do mid-year review. So we start estimating out our expenditures through the end of the fiscal year. And then if we have those additional funds available, we also work with departments on requests for things that they may need that at goods or services by the end of the fiscal year. So there are times when there may be additional health insurance in this case in certain cost centers. Okay, that makes sense obviously. Um, I am curious, what's the, what's the total on that line? Uh, I, I realize here you've got health insurance. There are actually several different lines because they're for different Right. Which areas. Line? Like the very first one is um, there, it's health insurance is $313,091 coming out of teaching and learning. Is that the way? No, I'm just kind of curious, ballpark. How much oh, how much, I, how much I, we budget I, towards health insurance? Yeah, we'd have to go back and add all those pieces up. These are the ones that just have to go to board because of the dollar amounts. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Ms. Pate. Uh, I call for a vote. Please raise your hands. All in favor, please raise your hands. 
Madam Chair, we have 11 ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. Okay, so um, committee organizations or board reports. Do any school board members have anything to report? As a reminder, this is the time for short reports, and school board members may file full reports with the clerk to be distributed to other school board members. Yes, you can. Ms. Franklin. Uh, we did have a gifted CAC meeting last Monday, and <clears throat> um, I'm not going to preempt exactly what they are going to present, but they will be coming to us um, to provide their end of year thoughts, and um, I look forward to that presentation. It's always very interesting. Um, I do know that they are going to bring some concerns as well as some um, glows as well. <laughs> So, uh, so I just wanted to let you know that that is forthcoming and uh, that we had our final meeting for the year. Okay, thank you. Any other committee reports? Okay, so Dr. Spence. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Just two quick comments. First, um, just a reminder for the board and anybody who's still up watching, um, this is Teacher Appreciation Week. So if you get a chance to thank your children's teachers and or just um, drop a teacher a note about how much you appreciate them, I know that they uh, value that, and, and we also have some uh, hashtag love VB teachers on our social media channels, and so if you can follow those and or uh, drop those um, posts in there as well, we'd appreciate that. And then speaking of teacher appreciation, just wanted to mention, I know some of you are already aware that City Council did pass our budget tonight, uh, and so our budget went through as is, and that is a great uh, testament to your hard work and leadership, so we appreciate that. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're going to return to our, this, this part of the meeting is over, so I'm going to ask the Vice Chair Weems to read into closed session because we're going into closed session. I move that the school board recess into closed session in accordance with exceptions to open meetings law set forth in Code of Virginia 2.2-3711 Part A, paragraphs 1, 2, 7, and 8 as amended to deliberate on the following matters. One, discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees of any public body, and evaluation of performance of departments or schools of public institutions of higher education, where such evaluation will necessarily involve discussion of the performance of specific individuals. Two, discussion or consideration of admission or disciplinary matters or any other matters that would involve the disclosure of information contained in a scholastic record concerning any student of any public institution of higher education in the Commonwealth or any state school system. Seven, consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consultation or briefing in open meeting would adversely affect the negotiation or litigating posture of the public body. For the purposes of this subdivision, probable litigation means litigation that has been specifically threatened or on which the public body or its legal counsel has a reasonable bias to believe will be commenced by or against a known party. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is con consulted on a matter. Eight, consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. Nothing in this subdivision will be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted on a matter namely to discuss A, employee grievance number 531-12-7-22, deliberations, B, evaluation of contract matters regarding a specific admin administrator, C, status updates on employee complaints or investigations, D, consultation with legal counsel regarding participation in a procurement matter, probable litigation, and pending litigation matters. Okay, so Ms. Williams has made a motion to go into closed session. Do I have a second? second. Okay, Ms. Um, Melnick has seconded. Um, all in favor, please raise your hand. I'm going into closed session. Madam Chair, we have 11 ayes. The motion did pass. Okay, we're going to be going into closed session.
Virginia Beach has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, whereas Section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by this school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach hereby certifies that to the best of each me member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meetings requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification applies, and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered. May I catch your question? Okay. All in favor of coming out of closed? Yes. Raise your hand, please. Madam Chair, we have 11 ayes. The motion passed. Okay. So now we have to vote on this. Yep. Okay. Um, Y'all want me to read it again? All right. Whereas on March 24th, 2023, the school board's appointed hearing officer held a hearing regarding grievance. 531-12-7-22, and whereas on May 9, 2023, the school board considered the findings of fact recommendations, the exhibits and the transcripts of this, from the March 24, 2023 hearing, and now, therefore, it is resolved by the school board that, one, the school board does not accept the hearing officer's April 6, 2023 findings of fact and recommendation, and two, can y'all hear me? Yeah. And two, the school board finds that the conference summary letter presently in his files should be removed that basically states the same as the reprimand for Mr. Polk. Therefore, the school board recommends that a new sum conference summary letter be put in his file that states accusations by students were made against this employee. Due process was provided, including an appeal. Not notification of this information is documented in the principal file only and is not to be transferred to anyone else and should not be used in a punitive way or in personnel action. So, I have a second. Miss Manning, all in, anybody need to say anything about that? Okay. Just don't forget we have another one too. All in favor, please raise your hand. We have 11 ayes, the motion did pass. Okay. Okay, now for the auditor. This amendment number one to the school board internal audit contract is made this ninth day of May, 2023 by and between the school board of the city of Virginia Beach, Virginia here, here and after referred to as school board and Karen Woodson here and after referred to as school board internal auditor. Whereas the parties entered into a contract for employment as the school board internal auditor on 1-10-23 and whereas after consultation with the Department of Human Resources and the Internal Audit Committee, the school board and the internal auditor agree that certain amendments are needed to the, are needed to the contract. Now, therefore, the school board and the internal auditor for consideration here and specified agree as follows. One, section three, compensation shall be amended to read as follows. The school board internal auditor will receive the same communication allowance as other senior staff members, $1,200 annually, or will receive $100 monthly, whichever is higher. The school board internal auditor, auditor will receive the same data allowance as other senior staff members receive, or $540 annually, whichever is higher. If the school board internal auditor meets the eligibility requirements for other allowances available to comparable employees, the school board internal auditor shall receive such allowances. Section three, compensation will be amended to a new subsection E to read as follows. The school board internal auditor will receive the same travel allowance as other senior staff members. Do I need to state the, the amount? Okay. 
In testimony whereof the parties have approved this amendment number one and caused this instrument to be executed by the chair of the school board or designee, Ann Karen Woodson, school board internal auditor, as of the date listed above. So I so that date will be changed to the tenth of May. Okay. Okay. And um, within that same vote, um, it is requested that the slide the slide scale be removed from the internal auditor's um, evaluation, and that we will proceed with a one, two, three, three, four rubric method. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Okay, second by Ms. Anderson. Who uh, moved? You moved. No. Okay. Yes, you did. You read it out. Oh, I'm That's sorry. That's the move. Okay. That's the motion. You made the motion. That's okay. the motion. Okay. And it was seconded by Ms. Anderson. Okay. All in favor, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have 11 ayes. The motion did pass. Okay, we are now